Sergeants, can you start your recordings? PC recording has started. All recorded, started. Backup Thank is you. good. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council joint hearing on the committees of sanitation, jointly with the committee on parks and recreation. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video for verification? Once again, all panelists, please turn on your videos for verification. To minimize disruption, when you are unmuted, please place all electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation, chairs. We are ready to begin. You're I'm good to sorry. Go, sir. I'm sorry. Yeah, and I apologize for the the noise in the background. My son is in the living room, uh, so please bear with us. <laughs> Thank you uh, for joining our virtual hearing today before the council's committees on sanitation and solid waste management and parks and recreation. I would like to thank my fellow chair, uh, council member Peter Ku, and acknowledge my fellow city council members who are present. I will do that um, in, in short order. Uh, but uh, I wanna allow for council member Ku to read his opening statement first. Council member Ku. Oh, you wanna start? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Good morning. Let me see. Good morning. I'm Peter Ku, Chair of the Committee on Parks and Recreation. I would like to thank my fellow co chair, Councilmember Wenoso, for agreeing to hold this joint hearing. Today's hearing will examine the issues facing the city's various composting programs. It is no secret to anyone that composting programs are vital to the city's recycling and sustainability goals. The city has long supported an increase in the widespread use of community composting as one of the major steps that can be taken to lessen the harmful effects of climate change on our city. A major example of this was in 2013, when the council passed local law 77, which required the sanitation commissioner to establish a residential organic waste and school organic waste collection pilot programs. Through this effort, the sanitation department collected various types of organic waste from city residents which was turned into compost or renewable energy. For residents with low access to curbside collection services, they were encouraged to create drop-off locations within their communities. However, with the budget, with the recent budget cuts earlier this year, resulting from the economic effects of COVID-19, the residential pilot collection program was temporarily halted on May 4th, 2020, with low plans to completely resume service until 2022. Though some of these programs were recently reinstated, it seems that composting programs a lot as, 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 as secure as we would hope. The Parks Department historic, historically stepped in as well when it comes to composting. It has partnered with numerous park conservancies, other park groups, community gardens, and community organizations to allow them to conduct their own community composting programs which have successfully operated for years. Parks, due to their welcoming and recreational nature, are perfect places to site community composting programs, which is, which is why I want to make sure that the longstanding policy of supporting these programs is not at risk. 
However, the status of two composting facilities located on pop pop property may be at risk. One program, the Lower East Side Ecology Center in East River Park, has been told by parks that they can no longer operate their site in the past due to the construction that will occur in the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project. As a result, they may be forced to operate a location in Upper Manhattan with no rocks solid assurance from the parks department that they can return to operate in East River Park when ESCR is complete. This will deprive community residents on the Lower East Side from their composting program for years, if not if no suitable alternative locations can be found. Another site is operated, operated by the Big Reuse under the Queens Ball Bridge, adjacent to Queens Bridge Park. Their license to operate in that location expires at the end of this month. And Parks has previously indicated that they would not renew the agreement, forcing the Big U Big reuse to find an alternative location. Although there's, although there are indications now, their compromise is hopefully in the works. Pass has said that they intend to use the site to station maintenance vehicles and equipment instead of being stationed within the park in order to allow for improvements to be made there. It seems that this this search it seems that this, situa this situ situation is sending mixed signals regarding what the city's composting policy actually is. Do we want more com community composting or less? I think the answer is yes. Do we want improvements made to our parks? I think the answer is also yes. If we all agree, I think that we can surely find a common ground to ensure the community composting and properly resource parts coexist. We need clear explanations here from the administration. If we need move sites around or move or, or offer temporary alternatives, then the sanitation and parks department need to work together and come up with solutions so that the community groups who administer these important programs can plan their futures and the communities who rely on them are not deprived of composting resources. Thank you again. And I look forward to exploring these issues at this hearing today. I will now turn it over to our co-chair, uh, Council Member Venoso. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Ku. Uh, appreciate your co-chairmanship. Um, uh, after I make my statement, I just want to allow for two council members in which uh, in the impacted districts to be able to have quick statements as well. Uh, good morning. I'm Council Member Antonio Reynoso, Chair of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. Thank you for joining today's hearing on community composting in New York City that we are holding jointly with the Committee on Parks and Recreation chaired by uh, myself and council member Peter Koo. Uh, we are also hearing a resolution calling on New York City Department of Sanitation and Department of Parks and Recreation to continue to engage and collaborate with local communities to encourage and allow community composting to be carried out on parkland that is safe for residents. The proper disposal and processing of organic waste reduces the amount of refuse sent to landfill and cuts down on greenhouse gas emissions. The city has stated an ambitious and important goal to send, to send zero waste to landfill by 2030. This year has been incredibly difficult with the mayor making severe austerity cuts to programs that provided New Yorkers access to recycling to help reach our zero by 30 goal. Residential organics collection has been suspended at least until 2022. School organics collection has been eliminated and the majority of food scrap drop off sites have been closed. We are nearing a point where New Yorkers will have no opportunity to recycle organic waste. And in the midst of all this, the city is not supporting the community composting operations that, the, uh, that are the only ones still doing the important work of processing organic waste locally. 
The council, in partnership with environmental advocates, secured a restoration of funds specifically to support the work of these groups in this year's budget. It now appears that the mayor is taking the backdoor route to undermine this important work by literally snatching the land from under, from under them. The Lower East Side Ecology Center and the Big Reuse are community composters. They process organic waste. Both of these operations are currently on city parkland. The Lower East Side Ecology Center is being moved to an entirely different community while the area is being renovated. Parks is not renewing Big Reuse's license to so operate in the Queens Bridge Park. As far as I know, the city is still publicly committed to sending zero waste to landfill, but the city is also eliminating what I'm sorry, is also eliminating every opportunity to recycle organic waste. Why are the actions of the parks department misaligned with the stated goals of the city? Why is the city saying that recycling organic waste is essential, but then not supporting the work of community composters? So much of my work in this committee over the past seven years has been focused on holding the mayor accountable to his own commitment. It seems that every time we take a step forward, we take two steps back and I struggle to understand why the parks department, an agency that should be laser focused on environmental initiatives has seen fit to prioritize parking over composting. I'm looking forward to understanding from DSNY and the Department of Parks and Recreation about their interagency coordination and their plans to work towards the city's goal of zero waste. I wanna learn about the long-term plan to support community composting and allow these operations to continue processing organic waste. I wanna hear why Big Reuse is being told to leave their site. I, will, um, I would like to just acknowledge that we've been joined by council members Borelli, council member Brannon, council member Cabrera, Cohen, Constantinides, Deutsch, Jonai, Holden, Levine, Moya, Rivera, and Van Bramer. I wanna give an opportunity for council member Van Bramer to make a quick uh, statement uh, related to this parkland on, uh, in, in his district. Thank you. Uh, can we, uh, council member, council member Van Bramer? Does, does somebody need to unmute Council Member Van Bremer? And I also want to acknowledge we've been joined yes. by Council Member Powers. Oh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> they Thank did you. need to unmute me. Uh, uh, and they did. Uh, it was so me. I was uh, behind the curtain just holding you back. <laughs> uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, uh, Chair Reynoso uh, and his adorable uh, son uh, for uh, joining us on the Zoom uh, today, and also uh, Chair Koo. Uh, my name is Jimmy Van Bramer and I am very proud to represent Big Reuse and I am a, an enormous fan of uh, Justin Green and his entire team. Uh, community composting is everything that's right about uh, this city right now and uh, a sustainable future. And it is incomprehensible that Big Reuse would be evicted uh, and particularly uh, reprehensible if in fact that site, which now is a site of community composting and a source of education, uh, would be turned into a parking lot for vehicles. Um, I know that Parks is going to speak in a few moments. Uh, we spoke this morning uh, and they may have a, a temporary uh, potential uh, deal for big reuse. Uh, but I wanna say a few things about that. One, uh, we're only here because of Chair Reynoso, Chair Ku, and the movement. All of the people who are on this call, who have fought, who have organized, who have submitted testimony, have rallied, have had press conferences to get parks uh, and the city of New York to the place where they're going to offer a, a temporary solution here today. But I also wanna say, I spoke to Justin and Big Reuse this morning as well. And what we need from the administration is a promise not to evict big reuse until they have a new site, um, a simple extension with a promise to potentially find them a new home is not good enough. Uh, there isn't the time they would still probably uh, wind up getting evicted. So uh, we are here uh, because people fought and have pushed and supported. Uh, and, and that is a good thing. Uh, uh, people power is real, but we have to keep pushing for a permanent home and a permanent solution for big reuse. And obviously my colleague, 
uh, Rivera will be talking about uh, the location uh, in her district, but uh, I wanna talk about big reuse and the imperative that it be saved and that a permanent uh, location be found, a, a, an extension uh, without uh, the guarantee that they will remain uh, is not the solution that we're looking for. Uh, it's a step in the right direction, but it is not everything we want and need. And I also wanna say that the restoration of uh, Baby Park for the Queensbridge community is absolutely uh, imperative as well. Long, long fought for and sought for. And, and we're thrilled uh, that $11 million is going to be uh, going to restore that stretch of park for the Queensbridge houses. Uh, but we shouldn't pit the one against the other. Uh, we can uh, and must be able to restore Baby Park and also uh, maintain community composting in Western Queens and have a permanent home for big reuse. So I wanna thank uh, Chairs Reynoso and Ku for the time, but most of all, thank all of the activists for rallying around uh, Lower East Side, the College Center and big reuse and community composting. You have made uh, parks bend a little bit, but we need them to bend even more and create permanent homes for community composting and the city has to recommit to composting overall. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Now I wanna allow for uh, the Parks Department um, and Department of Sanitation for their uh, opening statements and we'll go, we'll go from there. So I believe, uh, Sam, I think you're gonna take it away. Council, uh, council Member, hi, this is Chris Sartori, Council of Parks. I believe I uh, Council Member Rivera would like to make a statement regarding uh, okay. the district. Uh, I apologize, I thought she wanted to ask questions first. Okay, no problem, Council Member Rivera. Terry, no, so Chair Cool, thank you. That is that is true. I would rather use my time for questions. Uh, I just want to thank you for having this hearing. I think we all know why we are here. Um, to put it very briefly, uh, Big Use and Elias Ecology Center jointly process more than two million pounds of food waste each year that would otherwise be trucked to landfills where they would release harmful methane gas. And I would just want to add, and again, this is for my questions. I just, it doesn't make sense that we're putting this much energy into moving these sites or as to whatever confusion there is as to their future locations. In terms of the city's 2030 climate goals, citywide composting cuts 4 billion pounds of CO2 per year. Per year. That's equal to taking 350,000 cars off of New York City streets. So thank you for having this hearing and I'm looking forward to asking questions after the testimony. Thank you, Council Member Rivera. And I believe we um, wanna swear folks in. Yes, Councilman, I'll just go over some procedural items and we can uh, begin with testimony. Yeah, after. And, and, I, and I apologize because of my situation at home. Uh, I don't have uh, the, the script in front of me. So if, uh, um, Moving forward, uh, please, uh, Council, interrupt whenever, whenever possible. Sure, we'll do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairs Reynoso and Ku. I'm Chris Sartori, Senior Counsel to the Committee on Parks and Recreation, and I'll be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you're called to testify, at which point you'll be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I'll be calling on various panelists to testify. So please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelists will be. We'll first be hearing testimony from the administration followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I'll call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. Also, please note that public uh, panelists aside from those from the administration will be limited to a two minute time limit so that we may more easily accommodate the large number of people who have come today to testify. The exception will be for a, a few panelists who have a direct connection to the site sites in question. Uh, those people will testify soon after the administration. I'll just let them know who they are. Uh, Justin Green, Christine Deitz Romero and Domingo Flo uh, Morales. 
as well as bar president Gail Brewer. They will have five minutes to make their statement. We will now call on members of the administration to testify. We'll be hearing testimony from Sam Biederman, Assistant Commissioner for Community Outreach and Partnership Development for the Department of Parks, Parks and Recreation, and Bridget Anderson, Deputy Commissioner for Recycling and Sustainability for the Department of Sanitation. Gregory Anderson, Assistant Commissioner for Policy and External Affairs for, Department of, for the Department of Sanitation, and Matt Jury, Director of Government Relations for the Parks Department, will also be question, uh, present to answer any questions that may come from council members. At this time, I'll administer the affirmation to each member of the administration. And I will call on you individually for a response. So please all raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Biederman? I do. Commissioner Bridget Anderson? I do. Commissioner Gregory Anderson? I do. Mr. Jury? I do. Thank you. And at this time, I will invite Assistant Commissioners Biederman and Anderson to present their testimony. Thank you. Great. We, we pulled straws. I'll go first. <laughs> uh, Good afternoon, Chairs Renoso and Ku, and members of the City Council Committees on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management and Parks and Recreation. I am Bridget Anderson, Deputy Commissioner for Recycling and Sustainability at the New York City's Department of Sanitation. I am joined today by Gregory Anderson, Assistant Commissioner for Policy and External Affairs, and colleagues from the Department of Parks and Recreation. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Community composting is critical for the city's push to fight climate change and to build a more resilient, uh, more, res more resilient neighborhoods. Over the last three decades, our community compost partners have trained generations of New Yorkers of all ages in sustainability, education, and composting operations. It is thanks to these passionate community composters that we were able to build the momentum that helped us launch and expand the curbside composting program over the last several years. Despite difficult budget cuts this year, we remain committed to composting as a key component of our zero waste goals and the city's push to fight climate change. Community scale composting in particular allows people to learn about the composting process hands-on. It also demonstrates the value that compost brings to our neighborhoods, improving and rebuilding the soils of our gardens, our parks and street trees. Now more than ever, we need individuals and communities to help our city be clean, healthy, safe and resilient. As the neighborhood testified in June, and as is still true through this winter, the COVID-19 pan pandemic has put immense financial strain on our city and our communities. The admin administration continues to make difficult budgetary decisions, and those cuts will deepen unless we get the support we need from the federal government. As was released in the November plan, the suspension of curbside composting program will be extended by a second year through June of 2022 as the difficult but necessary step for our city to take our due to take due to our current budget reality. I want to thank Speaker Johnson, Chair Reynoso, Chair Ku, and many others here today for your strong advocacy to restore $2.88 million in funding to continue community scale composting. Currently, our fiscal year 22 budget has 3.5 million allocated for community composting which we hope will allow us to reinstate some of the educational programming that was suspended during the pandemic. Founded in 1993 by Department of Sanitation, the New York City Compost Project works to rebuild New York City's soils by providing New Yorkers with the knowledge, skills, and opportunities they need to produce and use compost locally. It is held up as a national model for compost education, having cultivated relationships with more than 225 community compost sites and more than 800 community groups, organizations, and institutions to build public knowledge about and support for local composting in all five boroughs. The department currently funds seven affiliates at cultural institutions and nonprofit organizations to advance the project's mission, leveraging thousands of volunteers each year. Innovation, creativity, and relationships underpin our partners' work. In addition to training and technical assistance to learn about how, compost, uh, how to compost organic material locally. The Compost Project affiliates distribute finished compost for free 
to community gardens, parks, urban farms, street trees, stewards, and other greening in initiatives. These partners have developed programs familiar to many, and I'll just name a few. A nationally recognized master composter training course, a demonstration farm at Queen's Botanical Garden that educates about the links between composting and our food system, Zero Waste Island, an effort by Earth Matter to close the resource loop on Governor's Island by composting horticultural trimmings and food scraps on the island, support for garden and greening projects on NYCHA campuses, such as Big Reuse's work at Ravenswood and Queensbridge Houses, and uh, the original food scrap drop-off site at Union Square Green Market a truly visionary act by the Laurie Side Ecology Center in the 1990s. The impact of the New York City Compost Project activities over three decades have changed lives and transformed neighborhoods. This is a program we look forward to fully restoring and expanding when we are able. The most recent addition of activities to receive funding by the New York City Compost Project um, over the last decade have been local food scrap drop-off and high-performing community composting operations. But community scale food scrap composting has been a grassroots activity long before it was funded by the project. An outcome of the master composter course was a growing number of trained people who not only composted at home or in their communities, but who organized local efforts to capture food scraps for composting. DSNY through the Compost Project affiliates and Grown YC has experimented with different models to increase access to food scrap drop off opportunities at its peak Did, did we lose uh, someone? We're gonna check on that. Everyone could just, if everyone could just hold on for a second while we make Thanks. sure what, uh, what happened. Thanks. If you want, I can continue delivering the sanitation testimony um, on Bridget's behalf and, and we can try to get her back on while uh, Commissioner Biederman is testifying. Thank you, Gregory. So, yeah, let's, let's do that. I think that's, a, that's appropriate. Okay. Um, it's at one, its peak. One Anderson, yeah. one Anderson <laughs> to the next. I'm sorry. Um, yes, go ahead, please. Thank you. Oh, uh, she says uh, her apartment just lost power, so she's going to try to rejoin, but I'll, I'll finish the testimony. Um, at its peak in early spring 2020, there were 175 food scrap drop-off sites ranging from green markets, commuter hubs, um, uh, libraries, and other community hosted sites. At present, there are 99 food scrap drop-off sites made possible with this year's council funding. And our partners are actively looking for community hosts to add more. DSNY has funded operations at six high-performing mid-scale community compost sites. While DSNY funds the programming at these sites, the organizations independently hold the relationships and agreements with the owners of those sites. Community composting is, by its nature, an inherently physical activity. To do their work, these organizations require space to operate, and we are committed to working with our partners to find space for them to continue to perform their important role. Our work to advance zero waste and to fight climate change through improved waste management is far from done. And we are eager to advance programs that will maximize the recovery and beneficial use of food scraps, leaves, and woody material. As we look beyond the COVID-19 crisis, I want to reassure the members of, the, of these committees and all New Yorkers that we continue to be strong proponents of robust community compost programs and an ambitious citywide organics recovery plan. While the budget realities have caused unfortunate setbacks, they also offer us an opportunity to plan and, as we recover, to develop an even better long-term composting infrastructure. We continue to welcome the support and leadership of Council on this mutually shared environmental goal and remain committed to working to promote and incorporate sustainable green practices in all communities across the city. I'll now turn this over to our colleagues at, at the Department of Parks and Recreation, after which we're happy to answer your questions.
Thank you, Greg, and uh, thank you, Bridget, in absentia, temporarily. Um, so uh, good afternoon, Chair Ku, Chair Reynoso, and members of the Parks and Sanitation Committees. I hope you and your loved ones are doing well in these difficult times. Uh, my name is Sam Biederman. I'm Assistant Commissioner for Community Outreach and Partnership Development at NYC Parks, and I'm joined by members of our government relations team. We are very pleased to be here today to join our colleagues at the Department of Sanitation to discuss the city's support for sustainable management practices and community composting. So to provide a quick overview, New York City Parks is the steward of city parkland in accordance with the mandate established by the New York City Charter. Throughout the tenure of this administration, we have focused on addressing issues of inequity in park access, in public access to parks for their recreational and open space needs. This includes formal programs like the Community Parks Initiative and Anchor Parks, but we also are constantly identifying park spaces that can be made more accessible to the public through initiatives like Parks Without Borders. This commitment to equity also encompasses our efforts to make the city cleaner, greener, more resilient, including our support for community composting. Parks participates in the city's efforts to encourage composting as part of our everyday sustainable management practices. The agency and partners like the Central Park Conservancy and Prospect Park Alliance maintain compost yards and operational areas of several of our parks. These yards take in leaves and yard waste exclusively from the park to convert into soil for park horticultural use. This is a closed loop system that contributes to the betterment of our park system while also minimizing our impact on the global ecosystem and our overburdened landfills. Additionally, community gardens across the city serve as hyper-local sites for the processing of compost, including many of the Green Thumb community gardens that are under parks jurisdiction on city property. Generally speaking, these efforts in usually involve composting of internal garden debris and food scraps brought in by member gardeners, though some of our Green Thumb community gardens are able to accept food scraps from neighbors. Many of our gardens also host educational programs about the importance of composting to encourage more New Yorkers to do their, their part in helping keep our city green. Also, as our colleagues at DSNY noted, there are collection sites for food waste and other organic materials located around the city, including many farmers markets or other locations where community partners help to collect food scraps and other waste. The frequency of these collections varies from year round to once a week, but New Yorkers have hundreds of locations to choose from, including many at parks. So they can conveniently drop off food scrap waste, which can then be brought to regional community scale processing sites where this household waste is converted into soil. Now, this time of year, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Mulch Fest, an annual tradition where New Yorkers can bring Christmas trees to park locations around the city uh, after the holiday. Uh, these discarded trees are converted into wood chips that nourish our tree canopy and make New York City greener every year. This great program, which is in partnership with DSNY, helped us recycle over 50,000 holiday trees last year. So just as an additional note, please do help us spread the word that you can drop off your tree at any mulch fest location between December the 26th and January the 9th. Lastly, in coordination with DSNY, we have provided space within a few parks for compost processing operations. As you are likely aware, due to recent, recent operational needs and legal concerns, two of these community scale composting sites, which are regulated by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation as waste facilities, are slated to have their park site operations disrupted in the near future. The Lower East Side Ecology Center is a community-based organization dedicated to urban sustainability, whose offices are currently located in the Fireboat House in East River Park in Manhattan. In addition to offering environmental programming to the public, the center is under contract with DSNY to accept and process residential food and yard waste and provide compost education, and had a license agreement with New York City Parks for a one-acre site within the park, where household waste from across Manhattan is stored and converted into compost. Thanks to a $1.45 billion, thanks to $1.45 billion in federal and city funding, East River Park is being rebuilt and fortified as part of the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project. That's ESCR. ESCR will protect thousands of New Yorkers uh, from the effects of climate change. And uh, sorry, I lost my place here. Um, It will protect thousands of New Yorkers against storm surge, sea level rise, and the impacts of climate change. 
Due to safety concerns, the center will not be able to continue its programming or compost operations at this location during ESCR construction, which will begin in East River Park in early 2021. The agency has already prepared alternative programming space for the center at nearby Seward Park. It's free of charge, and the city is currently leading an effort to locate and prepare a new site for the center's composting use. At the center's recommendation, the city will wet proof the fire boathouse as part of ESCR, and the city has committed to good faith negotiations with the center regarding their future in East River Park after ESCR is completed. Big Reuse is an environmental nonprofit engaged in a wide variety of efforts dedicated to environmental advocacy and action, including a contract agreement with DSNY to collect residential food and yard waste. One of the sites they manage has been located at Baby Queens Bridge Park in Queens under the Ed Koch Queensboro Bridge, where significant household waste from across the city, along with park yard waste, is stored and converted into compost. Big Reuse had informally operated within this park for several years, but Big Reuse and Parks formally entered into a temporary license agreement to allow their presence at the site, taking effect May 2018 and slated to expire at the end of this year. Baby Queens Bridge Park is a long neglected five and a half acre site park located next to the largest public housing complex in North America with almost 7,000 residents. Over the years, Baby Queens Bridge had become a forgotten space full of trash and abandoned vehicles. In the context of our commitment to park equity, Parks has been hard at work making targeted improvements to Baby Queens Bridge, but this community deserves a fully reimagined and reinvigorated park. That's why we were thrilled when $11 million in capital funding, in mayoral capital funding, was provided in 2018 for the transformation of Baby Queens Bridge Park. And we look forward to beginning design on that project next month with a public input session so that the neighboring NYCHA residents can have access to the recreational and open space they need and deserve. In order to make that a reality, our agency will require the use of the portion of the park currently used for compost processing for our park system's operational needs, including support for park repairs and maintenance. So this is supply storage, office trailers, so that we can convert the open air section next to Vernon, Bo Vernon Boulevard that is currently used for operations into a proper park space. We believe that uh, these, the regional operations currently sited next to this space can be better utilized, that the regional operations currently sited on the adjacent portion next to the site can be better utilized as a recreational space for the public. Once big reuse vacates the area under the bridge, parks will move our operations into that space uh, so the rest of the park can be redesigned and rebuilt to provide recreational amenities to the community. Well-designed work is about to begin. I am pleased to report that we are able to temporarily extend big reuse's ability to stay in the park for six months so that they can continue operations while the city works with them to find a more appropriate location. Whether it's conserving or restoring natural areas, reducing our carbon footprint via our electric vehicles or green roofs, or reducing the impact of climate change through smarter, more resilient park design, we are proud to be a green agency. Just as importantly, our, city, our agency has a city charter mandate to, and I quote, maintain the beauty and utility of all parks and other recreational properties as well as a legal responsibility to preserve parkland and open space for appropriate park uses. If we have learned anything during this past year and all of the difficulties of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's that New Yorkers are more reliant than ever on our city's parks and open spaces and all of the physical, mental, and emotional benefits that they provide. Within this framework, we are dedicated to giving New Yorkers every opportunity to, to enjoy the best possible park system we can offer them. Thank you, Chairs, for the opportunity to testify today. We would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I will now turn it over to questions from Chairs Reynoso and Ku. At this point, I'd ask all administration panelists, if possible, to stay unmuted during the question and answer session. Uh, Chair Reynoso, please begin when thank you're ready. You. And thank uh, you, just Tom. a quick note, uh, Deputy Commissioner Anderson was able to dial back in, so she is available for Q&A also. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, look, I, I want to be perfectly honest. Um, I don't even know where to begin um, because it, it just doesn't make any sense uh, to, to have the Department of Sanitation and Department of Parks say how committed they are to composting and understanding the environmental significance of it 
um, and then in, in another breath, just say, hey, but we still got to kick them out. Um, just doesn't just doesn't add up. Uh, the first, I, I want to ask some basic questions. Um, because all of a sudden there's a legal concern here, how was the Department of Parks and Recreation able to go into, uh, enter into a lease in 2018 with big reuse for this site if uh, legally they were, they, were, they were obligated to go against that? Um, I just don't understand the legal, the legal uh, I guess the, the legality of allowing them to be on the site for two years and now stating that that same that, that legally they're not allowed to be on these sites unless they're doing work specifically for the Department of Parks. Can can someone clear that up for me? Yes, Council Member. With the caveat that, of course, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. My understanding of the situation is that the temporary nature of the agreement is what made it permissible. Okay, so arguably another temporary lease for two years would be permissible on New York City Parks land. Well, I also want to underscore, um, as I said in my testimony, that Parks does have a responsibility here to make sure that uh, parkland is made as accessible and open as possible as recreational space. So we have $11 million in funding to develop Baby Queens Bridge Park as a site for um, recreational use. And we have a responsibility to move forward with that project. Yeah, but uh, so... It, that's like basic uh, colonialist theory um, to pit one poor community against another or one uh, group against another. Uh, there is space underneath the Queensboro Bridge. Uh, Queensboro Bridge. I, I don't know what what else it could possibly be named. Um, is there not other space owned by Parks Department that is available underneath the bridge? Well, we have a need for all the space under the bridge, although um, certain sections of the bridge that I think you may be referring to are not appropriate for the re the operational uses that we have and the operational needs that we have under that area. What are the operational needs that you have that these other locations are not suitable for? So the operational needs are storage, uh, repair, um, uh, areas for repair, and again, different types of storage. Now there are details, um, in, within this area um, under the bridge uh, or uh, issues regarding access to, for instance, uh, manholes that have to be kept accessible. Uh, the way we need to use the space is, doesn't, uh, doesn't match up with how the space is arranged right now. It's also um, the grading, I believe, of the area is, uh, it, it doesn't work. Right, but I, I understand. So. Uh, I Back, back to it. Your, your main goal as the Parks Department, your mission statement, is to uh, provide access to these sites to the general public. The use that you're speaking to has nothing to do with uh, public access um, uh, to, to the general public, right? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, park operations is a really important, crucial, indispensable part of what it takes to keep spaces open to recreational use, right? And we currently have a space that we're occupying with our operations that is appropriate to develop into a um, open recreational space. That is why we have $11 million in capital funding to develop it. We, the, current, the current site that uh, Big Reuse is in, um, who, who did the development of, of uh, of uh, allowing for that site to become operational. Um, what, who invested the capital to make that uh, area, uh, I guess, more suitable for the work that you need to do? Um, did Parks Department initially uh, invest in that site to make it a more ideal site for like for compost work specifically? I, forgive me, I don't know the details of who invested how much to prepare the site. Right, because I guess the point that I'm trying to make here is that there was a, an investment made by someone uh, in cleaning up that space and making it operational or useful um, so that they can do the compost work. And in doing so, uh, have, have worked against themselves in making it a more appropriate site to be used for maintenance and parking by the parks department. Um, should the, in the $11 million that was given for the development of this park, is there, uh, is there no line item specifically uh, geared towards uh, building out space or having space to, 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 uh, main, to, to have a storage space or maintain or have parking space available? 
Um, or is it $11 million almost exclusively just for the development of the park? Uh, it's my understanding that the uh, $11 million is for the development of the Baby Queens Bridge Park site on which we have our operational um, operational plot now. But I, right. I, I want to fact check that, so I just want to be sure. Okay, because I just like say the Queensboro Bridge Park doesn't exist or you didn't have access to that. What what could would parks not be able to build out this site for Queensbridge? I, you forgive me, uh, council member. I'm afraid I don't quite understand the question. Could you repeat it? You you keep mentioning this uh, baby baby bridge park. I want to call it. Uh, what's yeah, the baby Queens Bridge Park? Yeah, right. Baby Queens Bridge Park. You, you're you're mentioning that as a, a reason why this needs to happen. Just yes. want to ask is if there was no access to any of the space underneath the bridge, uh, would the parks department not be able to build out this park because of the lack of operational space and storage or, or parking? Forgive my misunderstanding of the question. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, it's, it, it, I, I can't really conjecture about that because we deal, with, uh, we deal with the funding and the land that we have in the way that we have, it, right? Um, and the funding was given to develop as you know, as a council member, uh, funding is given to uh, specific areas based on those areas' needs. What I do know is that uh, the borough and the regional management of the borough does require the use of this space for operational for its operational needs. You know, operations are a huge part of running this park system and keeping it open. It's absolutely necessary that we have the space that our park workers need in order to do their jobs. I mean, look, you know, we're, we just came in off of about a foot of snow or maybe a little more. You see the amount of work that the city park workers have been um, tirelessly putting themselves out to do uh, over the past few months, and especially over the, during the snowstorm. It's, it makes their jobs possible to, um, it makes it possible to do their jobs by creating space for our operational sort of back of house, uh, back of house concerns. Uh, I wanna allow for the council members who are most affected by this issue um, in, in council member Van Bramer and, and Rivera to ask questions. So I wanna limit my questions and uh, allow for council member Peter Koo, our co-chair to, to speak. But I do wanna say, um, I know for certain that the New York City Parks Department has used park space for the parking of vehicles for other agencies like the Department of Transportation. And it's countless uh, uh, other uses for, for a lot of park space that exists in the city of New York. Um, and it seems like uh, someone woke up someday and decided that they wanted to use legalese uh, and, and, and basic legal language to figure out a way to get these folks out. You've committed to something, your stubbornness won't allow you to move, and it really is unfortunate. Um, for Parks Department to be using, uh, uh, again, a technicality, um, and again, uh, and you have space in other places uh, that we can absolutely uh, outfit to be able to handle these operations. Um, but again, to, to move out uh, the function and environmental justice function of composting and the economic uh, benefits that it has to the city, um, to, to just have to wake up one day and figure that they have to move or force them to have to move just doesn't seem to speak to like the, 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 what should be the true mission statement of the New York City Parks Department, which is environmental justice. So I wanna allow for uh, Council Member Peter Koo, our co-chair, to ask a few questions before we go to Council Member uh, Van Bremer and Rivera. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Renoso, yeah. So uh, Commissioner Biderman and, and Commissioner uh, Anderson, uh, my question is like this. Um, since back reuse is being given a six month extension on the agreement, uh, what efforts will Parks Department and DSNY engage uh, to help back reuse find new sites? Have you identified any uh, potential new sites they can explore? I can, I can start on this. Yeah. I'm happy to start this. Uh, and again, yeah. apologies for my brief technical glitch. And this is why we have two people on the line to, to follow through. Uh, we are, we're actively um, engaging with multiple agencies actually to identify alternative sites. And so our first step, Department of Sanitation, you know, we have 
the contracts with these organizations and we you know, understand uh, the needs of um, these types of compo community composting facilities in, in terms of the space and suitability of space. So we are working on an initial pass at um, sites that have been identified um, with the help of uh, DCAS and with the help of parks and sanitation. And uh, once we've identified potentially suitable sites, uh, then we will engage with Big Reuse to visit those sites and to understand, um, you know, in the detail of um, what we need to do to prep an appropriate site. Uh, Commissioner Biderman? Sam? Yes. Yeah. Um, Have you identified any sites? Or is it true that the Parks Department cannot allow them to use parkland for composting? So. I want to be clear here, as you can reiterate this, that the Parks Department composts quite a bit. We're absolutely committed to sustainable park management. We have a, roughly 30 large compost sites. You know, we work with our Green Thumb partners to compost, and we host compost drop-off uh, sites across the city. Uh, the uh, particular uh, the particular type of composting practiced by big reuse, we don't believe is an appropriate park use right now. So is, is, is it illegal to use parkland for outside composting? So again, with the, um, with the caveat here that I'm not a lawyer, there are some legal concerns about certain types of compost being practiced on parkland. Uh, that said, our um, uh, concerns with big reuse are much more immediate. They're about the use of the park space for uh, our operational needs and the development of the space next door for like proper recreation space. So um, even we identify a place for them to move. Uh, when you are moving, you, you incur a lot of expenses. Uh, is sanitation or, or other city agencies uh, able to help them with the moving expense? Commissioner and, uh, Bidham, uh, Anderson? Yeah, we are, yes, we are. So what we will do is identify potentially suitable space. We will look at that space with big reuse. Under We've done this with Lessic as well. Ident identify what are the needs to actually prepare a space to be suitable for the operations and activity educational activities that they incur and determine um, within the city, how can we uh, prepare the space for them, for their continued operation? So you are help for the expense? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so and I would add there, question, council yeah, member, um, we also, not just the expense, I think you know we're, we're very um, invested in the ongoing operation. And in fact, we have funded most of the equipment that they have on site. So, um, we would actually offer operational assistance as well. Um, one of the things that we do well at sanitation is moving things from one place to another. So we'd be happy to help out. Thank you. Yeah. So my next question is for, uh, for the past department. Uh, can uh, Commissioner uh, Biderman, right? can you provide us with more details regarding what, what your plans are Upgrade Queen's Bridge Park. See, this is the reason why the uh, reuse agreement is not being renewed. So, can you give us more details about your specific uh, plan for the park? Yes, of course. Um, so, the uh, the eleven million dollars that we have for. Uh, Queens Bridge Park for this area of Queens Bridge Park is part of a, a broader vision for the park itself. Um, so I, if I could, I'd like to walk you through some of the work we've already done and what it leads to. Uh, in 2016, parks worked with DCAS and NYCHA to remove uh, NYCHA's abandoned fleet of vehicles that were occupying a set of parkland here. Uh, and DCAS was actually able to auction off 26 of these vehicles. Um, in 2017, the Department of Transportation restriped and re-signed the bikeway on behalf of parks. And again, in addition, we have been able to initiate capital projects to improve the park. 
in May 2019 with funding, thank you, uh, Council Member Van Bramer, we started design of the handball area of the park. The project is currently in procurement uh, and the space was redesigned with community input, including a new basketball court and reconstructed handball courts. Uh, in 2018, this is where the $11 million comes from, the administration announced the Long Island City Investment Strategy. Uh, Parks worked to secure $11 million for Baby Queensbridge Park as part of that plan. Uh, we were poised to start design uh, of the park in spring of this year, but for obvious reasons, we had to delay that a little bit, uh, but we will start, I believe, next week on uh, the community scoping session. Uh, so Parks recently received OMB approval to restart design and the proper design process, I see here, I'm sorry, will um, begin in spring 2020. Okay, yeah. So can you give me like, some uh, conservancy organizations that offer community composting? Yes, some, some uh, parks partner organizations do offer different types of composting, that is correct. So give, give me some names, like Central Park or so, uh, uh, other parks. To, just to um, clear up a the conservancies. misapprehension, Central Park's composting operation is actually what we refer to as a closed loop operation. So it takes waste generated within the park, yard waste, leaves, branches, that sort of thing, processes it in the park, and then turns the soil that is, uh, turns the soil that is created back out into the park itself. So it's a closed loop that deals only with waste generated in the park. So what is your uh, uh, past department, the, the, what are the rules or guidance that you give to organizations that may conduct composting programs? Can you tell them, or uh, you can only do internal composting? Uh, or can, are they allowed to take a uh, 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 laborhood organic waste? So there so are there rules every that case you is tell them? So it depends on the operation, I, I think is the short answer. For you know, big operations like our conservancy partners, like Central Park Conservancy and Prospect Park Alliance, as I said, they use compost as part, as the Parks Department does, as part of regular, sustainable, um, everyday management. Then our green thumb gardens, some of which are on parkland and some of which aren't, um, but are all under parks jurisdiction, uh, process, you can sort of think of them as micro waste sites, right? So they take um, the guidelines under which they operate is that they take waste generated within the garden and a certain very small amount of household waste, usually just from garden members, these volunteer garden members, in a few sites from outside the gardens uh, to uh, process waste that way. Um, so that's on green thumb sites. And then uh, we do, and then we uh, do host, as I said, um, certain pickup sites across the across our network. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. You know, to save time, I will turn over to other council members for questions. Yeah. Thank, you, yeah. 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 Thank you, Coach Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair At this point, I will invite other council members to ask questions in the order that they've used the Zoom hand raise function. Council members. Thank, and I just want to, I'm sorry, can we allow for Council Member Van Bremer followed by Council Member Rivera first and then go through allowing for other council members to go on depending on when they raise their hands? Uh, yes, Council Member, that, that was the order we were about. Okay, I apologize. Thank you. No problem. It's going to go over just a quick procedural processes. Um, so, Council Members, if you'd like to ask a question, please uh, use the Zoom hand raise function and raise it now if you'd like to. Um, and we're going to ask members, if possible, to please keep their questions to five minutes. Uh, the sergeant at arms will give you the cue when, when it is your time to begin. So at this point, we were going to hear questions from council member Van Bramer followed by council member Rivera. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Uh, so I am as the council member who's represented Queensbridge and big reuse uh, for the last 11 years, um, flabbergasted by this pitting of one community against the other uh, as a premise for evicting a big reuse. I wanna say a few things. First, um, uh, Commissioner Biederman said, uh, and this is at the heart of what's happening here, that uh, community composting is not an appropriate use 
of New York City public parkland, which to me is what's at the heart of this matter, right? Which is that the parks department and the city is walking away from community composting. And that is just fundamentally wrong. Second, uh, in your testimony, you mentioned that Baby Park uh, in Queensbridge was long neglected, but that's because city agencies stole that land from the people of Queensbridge, parking their vehicles there for decades and leaving it that way and only put the money in two years ago to do some part of the park because Queensbridge residents rose up and we joined them in fighting to reclaim this land for the community. But it's the agencies themselves who parked their vehicles all over what was once a park for Queensbridge residents and children. That's disgraceful and that's the legacy of what happened here. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is if you can find additional space or other space for big reuse, surely you can find other space to park your vehicles during the planning and construction phase of this operation. You also said that there is a scoping meeting next week and planning starting next month. Our office is unaware of all of that and has not been invited to a scoping meeting next week, I don't believe. But I wanna ask uh, you this, first of all, $11 million uh, as we all know in parks projects, uh, doesn't actually get you very far. And if you're starting a scoping process in the next month or two, you're probably two or three years away from construction. So why do you need to evict big reuse? And why can't you uh, include big reuse in the reconstruction of this park? You already have a great use uh, with great benefit to the local community. And Justin Green and Big Reuse includes in their efforts, the public housing residents across the street. Uh, so I don't understand why you are now using this $11 million project as a, an excuse to throw Big Reuse out when there is so much land right now there. And if you walked right now, the grounds of Baby Park or what was Baby Park before city agencies stole that land so they could park their vehicles and put trailers there and house equipment, uh, you would see so many vehicles parked there, right? That could be moved, that should be moved. And you all should keep big reuse and then you should reimagine the park uh, with input from the Queensbridge community. but. It is absolutely outrageous that you're pitting one community against another. Um, and I'm just so outraged by what you're coming to us with. So maybe Sam, you could take a shot and I realize I have limited time, but uh, when Jimmy, is construction we'll, we'll, supposed to- Jimmy, we're gonna, we're gonna extend your time um, if need be. Uh, we're gonna allow for you and Council Member Rivera to ask um, uh, practically as many questions as possible. I really wanna get to the bottom of this and you guys are the local experts and I wanna make sure you can ask the questions, Jimmy. Thank you, Chair Reynoso, because I'm just outraged because we've been working on this for 11 years and the Queensbridge community has been working on this for decades, decades. And it's because the agencies themselves have neglected this park, stolen this parkland from the community. And Big Reuse was the first actual uh, re use of the land for members of the community. And now they are being evicted so that more operational uses for parks can be uh, uh, utilized there, which to me screams of vehicles and trailers. And look, I want Queensbridge Baby Park to be rebuilt and restored for community use, um, but that's, on you, right? You created that. And I'm not saying you, Sam, and you, Matt. And uh, personally, decades ago, that decision was made by city agencies, but you've all kept to it. Uh, and some work has been done, some vehicles have been moved, um, but there's still so much more to be done. So can you talk to me, Sam, about this scoping meeting and what is the construction time like? When are you actually supposed to begin construction on this? And, and $11 million, we built a brand new park house, as you know, in the park, which I'm really proud of, which includes office space and some storage space for parks. I realize that's not uh, enough for uh, all of your needs, 
but there has been significant investment. There are other spaces. So talk to me about the construction timeline and why you can't give big reuse, A, a longer extension, and B, why you can't incorporate them into this planning and this expansion of the park. So um, firstly, we're very grateful for um, the funding and progress that we've already made at Baby Queensbridge, of which you and um, Queensbridge community have been a part of. So thank you for that. I know it's been a long road to get to even where we are. So I, I, it's good to see progress. Secondly, I want to apologize for, I, I misstated when the scoping meeting is, it's next month. And we will absolutely commit to looping your office into that. Forgive me, I apologize for that. So this, you know, the big reuse license is a finite license. It doesn't have an option to renew, which is um, not entirely common in a parks license. That it was a license, this has been the plan for three years to develop this space under the park as operational space so we could develop the operational lot into open park, as I said. Uh, when we initially discussed this license with big reuse, there was some back and forth about whether there would be an option to renew, and there is not an option to renew. There, but you could change that, right? Well, we have a need for this space, right? We have a need for this space, and I'm very happy that we've been able to um, extend their period of tenancy under the bridge for six months beyond their license, which is really not something we always do. But, but, but by definition, means you could extend it further. Well, uh, I, you know, I can't conjecture on um, anything past the six month that we agreed to today. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to conjecture, uh, uh, Commissioner. But if if the agency is announcing today a six month extension for big reuse, it could also today announce a one year, a two year, a three year extension. That's just logical, you did it. You've just said you're extending their time there by six months. Therefore, you could extend it by any amount of time that you want it. Councilman, it's my, my hope and my expectation that in the six month period, that's, that's not something we'll have to worry about, that uh, there will be, we'll identify a more stable location. Our DSNY and our partners across the city will identify a more stable location for big reuse uh, during this period. But, you, but there's no guarantee. And that's the problem with these unenforceable promises by city agencies that we're gonna give you six months and we're gonna do our best to try and find you an alternative location. But if we don't find a suitable alternative location in six months, right, you're shit out of luck. Well, our, our agreement with Big Reuse was that during their period, the period of their licensure, they would um, seek a more stable space that was not on parkland. This could be stable space. This is stable space if you just allowed them to stay. Right, if you actually gave them a permanent home where they currently are doing amazing work. And Justin and the team at Big Reuse. Uh, forgive me. His team can talk about this. Yes, I was getting a phone call, but I obviously didn't take it. Um, so Justin and, and folks will talk more about this, but this is a space that is currently being utilized. You can, and you already have expand, ex, expanded the time that they're allowed to stay there. You can and should expand it further, right? You can and should uh, rebuild Baby Park for the community while also uh, recommitting to community composting and recommitting to big reuse. They are not mutually exclusive goals, which you have presented here today, that in order to accomplish the reconstruction of Baby Park, we must take the land and evict big reuse. That is a false narrative. You do not have to do that. That is what you're coming here saying today. And, you know, again, if we walked along that bike and pedestrian path that you talked about DOT uh, building a couple of years ago, right, we would see, and you know that because you've been there too, as I have, right, dozens of vehicles, dozens of trailers, uh, incredible amounts of space that the community once utilized that was taken from them by city agencies. You cannot tell me that we can't leave big reuse to do the good work that they're doing and better utilize the other space as you, what you should do is pull out of that and give all of that land back to the community, which had it taken from them years ago. Um, 
as you mentioned, we have done amazing work at Queensbridge Park. When I became the council member, the seawall had literally crumbled into the river, right? The city allowed that to happen. It wouldn't allow that to happen in many other communities, but the park was crumbling into the, the river. We fixed that, right? The $100 million plan. The park house had been allowed to lay vacant and dormant for decades, right? I funded it, we rebuilt it. So many good things have happened, but this is not what we want. Uh, we want Baby Park to be restored, but we want big reuse to stay. And those can both happen. If only parks didn't take the position that you just stated, which is that community composting is inconsistent, right? Uh, and inappropriate for parkland. That's at the heart of this. You're walking away from what is an incredibly valuable program. We certainly agree that um, Big Reuse is a great organization and that they do wonderful work. I, I would say that their value is not intrinsic to the space that they occupy at Baby Queensbridge. That, and I look forward to you know working with our agency partners and. Um, of course, partnering with um, uh, DSNY to identify, again, the more stable space for you. Parking for agency vehicles and uh, trailers uh, for agencies is also not providing an intrinsic value uh, to the people of Queensbridge. Um, it is absolutely inconsistent with what people want uh, to see under that bridge. Um, so I, I just wanna uh, say again, that uh, this pitting of one community against the other um, is, is absolutely outrageous. Um, and the city uh, parks and sanitation can and should recommit uh, to doing this in a way that not only brings environmental justice uh, to this community, but racial justice as well. Um, and for you all to be taking the position that you are um, is inconsistent with both, uh, in my opinion. Do you have any response to that? Um, I, I understand your concern, uh, council member, and I, I, I appreciate it. You know, we, we do share, of course, a, a principled commitment to uh, uh, taking care and uh, developing as much open space and uh, recreational space as we possibly can. That is what the Parks Department is about. So just one last question, because $11 million, right? $11 million in a New York City Parks project uh, doesn't get you very much. We all know that, right? So is this project fully funded or are you going to come back and need additional funding, which will take additional years uh, uh, in terms of the process to build out this park. Uh, the park house, as you know, was built uh, across the street uh, in, the, in the five to seven million dollar range. And $11 million isn't going to get you very far. Um, we need uh, a real number and a real commitment for Baby Park, because if you're talking about the need to do Baby Park, $11 million doesn't get you very far. $11 million is um, beyond, I think it's about double um, what we tended to spend on uh, community parks initiative sites. Uh, and this is similarly sized, uh, give or take. I, I am confident, you know, in, not, not a capital guy, but I am confident given my experience with the capital process that this funding is sufficient. For, for uh, Vernon Boulevard, all the way uh, to 21st Street, uh, in, in all of that land underneath the bridge, which now is occupied by city agencies, uh, vehicles and trailers and equipment is, are you saying this $11 million covers returning all of that land to the people of Queensbridge? Uh, it's not my, under and Matt, I may defer to you on the details here, um, but it's not my understanding that it covers the entirety of the stretch of baby Queensbridge. Do I, do I have that right? Uh, yeah, hi, this is Matt. You know, so obviously the details of this are going to be fleshed out like through the design of the pro process. But as you're aware, what you might say is that there's sort of, uh, you know, there is sort of a, a greenway, right? And there is significant oper operational space in the middle. That, that is true. 
uh, but there is additional op operational space that is required that will be relocated. So there's so right now there's the Vernon corner, which is which is operational, and then there's sort of a space in the midsection, if you will, that's operational. So the vision here is to to essentially move the operation operational space at Vernon under the bridge, so that that can be freed up and become a more traditional park-like open air amenity. So for that space to be, and then improvements also along the Greenway. And then I believe on the other end, sort of the two ends of the dumbbell, if you will, is, is sort of is, is, is the rough vision. But again, this is all going to be fleshed out after community listening, after after that informs the design. Right. So just just to to, to close uh, and, and throw it back to the chairs. Right. What you're talking about is the restoration and renovation of a small portion of baby park and the land under the bridge um, that city vehicles and city agencies will still uh, uh, commandeer a significant amount of public land that was once available to the people of Queensbridge. And that while you are moving um, some operational uh, uh, spaces, you are also increasing your use of land for operational uses at the expense of big reuse. And I will just end here by saying once again, uh, shameful that the city is walking away from community composting, uh, even more shameful that in, in the case of big reuse, uh, the long neglected by city agency land that was stolen from the people of Queensbridge, that being used as an excuse to evict big reuse is disgraceful. And uh, once again, you haven't been able to answer the question about if you can um, uh, move big reuse and find a new space, you certainly should and can and must be able to find another space for the operational needs that you need. Uh, you also haven't been able to talk about the timeline for the construction of this project, nor have you been able to talk about the fact that even though you're extending the lease, uh, and allowing them to stay for six months, uh, there's no answer about why you couldn't extend it for a year or two years, or at the bare minimum, make the commitment that you will not evict big reuse until there is a permanent substitute uh, functional place for big reuse to continue uh, their operations. At the bare minimum, you should make that commitment here today because you've already given them a six month extension you should give them the extension until a new site is located. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, thank you, Council Member Mendoza. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think we'll move on to questions from Council Member Rivera, followed by questions from Council Member Powers. Time starts now. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, thank you for mentioning the funding provided by the council to keep this programming whole, these services that I think are so critical to our city's future. I wanna thank my colleagues, of course, the chairs, especially a council member Reynoso, um, who really championed the, the composting initiative during budget negotiations. And I just wanna thank my own team who I know is watching uh, we have organized composting workshops throughout our district. We did this a lot last summer. Parks and sanitation tried to be collaborative. I, I remember you gave us the cutting boards that say don't toss your scraps. And that's all very nice. But I just want to talk big picture right now and how important this program and these sites are to our communities and our city in terms of a fight against climate change. So let's talk about the Lower East Side Ecology Center for a few minutes. I, I, I will try to be as brief as possible. We all know that the Lower East Side Ecology Center has been in the East River Park for over 30 years, and they have a close working relationship with the Parks Department and the local community, bringing in volunteers to help clean and beautify the park, as well as process compost and host educational field trips for local residents. This organization is unquestionably a vital part of the community and composting is the cornerstone of its mission. So we've heard that you don't believe composting is an appropriate parks use, but over the past 30 years, Low Reside Ecology Center has proven that parks are an ideal location for composting 
as it enhances the circular economy while creating more deep community engagement with the park. Can you explain why you think community organizations like Lower East Side Ecology Center should not be in parks? Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Council Member. Um, so I, I do want to clarify that Parks does believe that composting is an appropriate park use. We compost quite frequently, as I said, we compost uh, 30 sites. Uh, we do parks composting at 30 sites. We do it um, green thumb gardens and we have pickup sites across our system. So we are, we're a green agency. We like composting, we're committed to that. Um, so what's going on, as you know, with um, uh, the Lower East Side Ecology Center is that they currently have their offices in the East River Park and operate a regional compost operation there. Um, due to construction logistics and safety, the center cannot, as you know, um, uh, probably better than anybody in the city of New York, cannot um, uh, continue its programming or compost operations at this location during ESCR, prep work for which will begin early next year. Um, uh, as you also know, and you know, we've talked to your staff about this, we are proud, the Parks Department is very proud that we've um, prepared an alternative programming site for the center at Seward Park free of charge to the center. Uh, and the city is currently leading an effort to locate uh, an interim site for their composting use. So we're, we are at work finding an interim site where they can practice compost during uh, construction. Now, um, in addition to that, as I stated before, we've um, put $8 million into wet proofing the fire boathouse as part of the SCR. Um, now, I, your question, I don't wanna um, get ahead of myself though. So your question was about uh, Composting in general or composting with um, Lessec? In parks. In parks. In perpetuity. So, all right, in composting parks in perpetuity. Well, I mean, the short answer is that we are absolutely committed to composting in parks in perpetuity. Uh, it, the types of composting that I um, enumerated are, we are quite confident that those are parks appropriate uses. So, as for, you also mentioned the return. Uh, you mentioned Lower East Side Ecology Center and kind of wet proofing the fire boathouse. Christine Dats Romero, who was here, worked with us, all of us, during the East Side Coastal Resiliency negotiations to decide the future of the boathouse. And we went through many options and we finally came to a solution as a community. We did that so that she can return to the fire boathouse of which she was a part of that conversation so she could essentially enjoy the fruits of her labor. That was a very intense negotiation process. Will you make a temporary space available to Lower East Side Ecology Center during the renovation of East River Park and specifically the fire boathouse? Well, we, as I said, we're for the fire boat, for what's um, what is done at the fire boat house, which I understand it's um, office space and programming, right? We am pretty, I'm confident that we have um, taken care of that uh, for the programming side. I don't want to take credit for the office side. Um, uh, Lori Side Ecology Center took care of that themselves. And I believe that they have sufficient office space, but uh, we are, the we do have an interim site ready, locked and ready to go in Seward Park, the park house. It's beautiful old. I recommend coming and seeing it. I'm actually quite proud of the job the uh, Parks Department did. So our next step here is to um, get the Laurier Side Ecology Center set up there and papered, as it were, to um, properly licensed to occupy that space for the duration of construction. Once that happens, the next step, so once we get Lower Side Ecology Center set up in uh, Seward Park, and we get in paper, the next step is to, and we, we committed to this before, uh, enter into good faith negotiations with Lower East Side Ecology Center to envision uh, their future role in East River Park when construction is complete. But what about their composting? The, the programming is one thing. I mentioned the educational workshops, and that's very important. And that is what the Seward Park location is for. What about the actual composting site in that alternative location? And so, if you do not, well, I just wanted to clarify, if you do not have the site ready, which is the kind of runaround that we're getting from the mayor's office, park says it's sanitation, sanitation says it's someone else. I, I'm asking for the composting site, we're going to temporarily relocate them. 
Do you have a site in mind? Do you commit that if you don't have a site in mind, you're gonna leave Lower East Side Ecology Center in East River Park until that location is found. And essentially you hand the keys over to Christine and you say, here's your temporary composting site while we renew the fire boathouse and while we renew your space to continue providing your services going forward. Can you so, confirm that that is indeed the plan? So the plan is to, and I don't want to, again, you, you rightly pointed out that, you know, we say we'll talk to sanitation and the sanitation by counterparts of sanitation are um, leading the effort to find an interim space. So I, I will defer to them on that progress, but uh, regarding what's going to happen as we move towards construction, you know, it is my hope and expectation that we're going to get there and we're going to find an interim space. Um, and the Lower East Side Ecology Center will be able to practice compost on um, at East River Park for as long as it's feasible for construction. Well, we can ask sanitation, right? They're here. So I, what I can speak to is our efforts to find alternative space, and we. Okay. Have I been just wanted to. I just want to thank you. Thank you for being here. I want a, a special thank you uh, to you, Bridget Anderson and Debbie Shine Talk. They've worked directly with my office on this project, as well as adding drop-off locations, not just any drop-off location, public drop-off locations, so that everyone can access them in my district. And I know how difficult it's been to find locations for the alternate site during construction. But you know, even earlier this week, the mayor said he's committed to finding a solution to this situation. Has the, is there any indication on what the solution is? And, and since you're both here, have you found other agencies to be collaborative or even cooperative partners as you identify possible alternative locations? And which agencies are those agencies that you're, you're working with? Clearly Parks is here. Have they offered other locations? and with the difficulty of identifying alt alternate locations, in your opinion, is the park, um, if, you can just, if you can just answer that. Sure, I, I think a good example, just for how this works and the efforts we've had is um, over a year ago, so October of 2019, um, we had gone through a list of sites. We actually had um, worked with Christine and her team to see uh, if they had, candidate sites that they were interested or are willing to consider. We, uh, Parks Department worked with DCAS to generate a short list of city owned sites within Manhattan that potentially could be candidate sites. Um, and over the course of vetting and reviewing feasibility for these sites, um, one site in particular um, under the Triborough Bridge um, ramp uh, was identified. And so we really focused our efforts at that point to try to uh, negotiate with multiple agencies that were that are located there with the Triborough Bridge um, Authority to make sure that um, we could set them up. And so, and, and we actually worked with Lessig to design what the site would look like. So the area is at Palladino and First Avenue. Unfortunately, um, well, I'll speak a little bit. So we had Parks Department had storage there. Police Department has parking there sanitation adjacent to this area it has a salt um, lot. Uh, and so, and DOT, um, you know, obviously would be involved in any curb cuts or anything like that. So we had multiple agencies working on this and City Hall really did the brokering of, with multiple agencies, how do we adjust the space to allow for um, a community composting site that was sufficiently large, um, that was safe, sufficiently safe um, in terms of the space to, um, to set up for, for LESIC. We, we were in the process of reviewing, creating, drafting MOUs. Um, we were actually sanitation, our own contracts for fencing, electrical, water. We were working through all of the steps to prepare that site. Um, and then for better or worse, we end up in late March and COVID hit and there was a delay in our ability to actually advance the, the actual work and the actual move. Um, when we when we brought back came back to it over the summer, um, conditions had changed, and the Triborough Bridge Authority uh, determined that it was no longer a suitable site. Um, so we were kind of back to square one, and so that's where we've re renewed in earnest our conversations with DCAS about what are other city sites. How do do we look just at city sites? Should we start looking at private sites? So we've been very proactive to try to identify candidate sites. 
But the first step of that obviously is once we identify lots, are they big enough? Are they paved? What are the conditions of those sites and how suitable are they? Yeah. I know it's not, I know it's yeah. been um, challenging, right. but we, we've known that, that this has to happen. We've known this for quite some time. So yeah. what, what are, where are we at? I, you, I mean, where is Lower East Side Ecology Center going to go? And if you have no location, you're committing today on the record. And I, and I, I believe you, you owe Christine an apology. I believe, I realize this has all been challenging and stressful for all of us, but she's going to get a location. She's not going to get a location. It's, it's not fair. It's just, we just want some honesty and transparency. We were sold the, the, this, this lot kind of under the, the bridge and now it's not going to work. I, if all those agencies were contacted, if we know that we have to deal with the Tunnels and Bridges Authority, and now it's not going to work, I, I'm having a hard time understanding when are we going to get like a full update? When can we trust a full update? I, well, I just want to know where she's going to go. Do you know? Yes or no? We do not yet have a, an answer. We do not yet have a site, um, but we are very much actively trying to solve this problem. And we, from, from sanitation's perspective, we are 100% committed to these community composting organizations to continue to operate and to have stable homes. So, but the reality is we do not have an answer. We are committed to transparency in the process and to making sure that um, all parties are, are kept up to date. Okay, I know process. how much work the eight, thank you. I know how much work the agency put into building out the citywide composting program, doing outreach and promotion to encourage more people to use composting. But with the elimination of that program and the truncated funding for community composting, the city is relying more and more on organizations like Big Reuse and Lower East Side Ecology Center to process compost. So if one or both of these sites are shut down for any reason, how is the city going to make up for the need to process the compost that is being collected? And do you think composting should be done at an industrial scale, a community scale, or a combination of both? It seems like the community sites are working. I'd like to see us incorporating micro hauling and our, and our bicycle infrastructure to kind of help that. But what are your thoughts? And, and, and again, how will the city make up for the need to process compost that is being collected when you clearly rely on these organizations? Absolutely. We, we actually, when we were working to figure out how to be most productive with the funding um, that was restored due to all of the advocacy work, um, we wanted to have a contingency plan in place because we knew with the suspension of curbside that we might have a good problem, which is that participation would grow at the food scrap drop-off sites. So we do have, um, we are set up to receive loads of material from the community organizations at our Staten Island Compost facility um, when um, the local sites are unable to handle the volume that is coming in through the drop-off sites. So we have a contingency plan operationally. Um, and what I would say is citywide, if we're talking about our large-scale organics management plan, we have to look at the macro and the micro. And in, in our opinion, they are both critical. The micro scale uh, efforts help to build an understanding of why we are doing this and help to show the benefits of doing this. And it also, Frank, I always talk about it being the best antidepressant is separating my food scraps and putting them in a bin or bringing them to a drop off site because you feel like you are actually taking a step every day to help be a part of the solution. Um, and so the micro scale is important, but the volume I'm overall citywide, the volume of organics is, is too high to rely and over pressure the community scale. So we need both, we, we need both. And that's fair. I just want to, I'm going to wrap up now. Um, yep. I really want to hear you commit to Lower East Side Ecology Center staying in the park until you have an alternative space. I know this is kind of a parks question. It is so important. We went through all of this to ensure that Lower East Side Ecology has a future. We do not have a location right now as an alternative. Can you please commit to Lower East Side Ecology Center staying in the park until we have an alternative space? I heard the construction. No one has heard more about construction of this park more than me, believe me. But you can't displace an organization after you committed to support them throughout the process. So what we can do is commit to allowing the compost yard to stay for as long as it's feasible. 
um, uh, and working with you know every city agency that we can to um, uh, realize an in interim space. Until it's feasible, it's a, it's those one of those relative words that the city likes to use. That is that is a hundred percent discretionary. I, I believe I think you owe Christine Dats Romero an apology. Um, I want to say that once we save these sites, and I think my colleagues and I have every intention of doing so, that we also need to dramatically expand access to composting. We can't do that without saving these sites. And so we need community organizations at the table playing a critical role. And just, you know, Seattle composts 20% of its food waste. New York, less than 1%. It's time for New York to be a compost leader. And it's time for us to respect the pioneers that put us on the path to doing that. And those are the organizations that are in question today. And I hope that you will find the organization, the collaboration and, and the cooperation to make it a reality today. Thank you, Mr. Chairs, both of you. Thank you, Council Member Rivera. We'll now move on to Council Member Powers and following him, we'll move back to the chairs for additional questions. Thank you. Time starts now. Thank you. Thank you to both chairs for having this hearing and certainly to Council Member Van Bramer and Council Member Rivera. I am in solidarity with you uh, to try to keep these sites here. I know how important it is to your communities and to folks around the city and for the Low East Side Ecology Center, they've been a great partner to me and my district. We set up a composting center in Stuyvesant Town to help fill in. I paid for myself to fill in um, uh, the gap here, and they, they're the ones that are helping us. So I, I really want to thank them for their um, for their work here. Um, I wanted to just do a broader picture of community composting here in the city um, because we're going to enter budget discussions again. Last year, we were really fighting to maintain some version of composting as the curbside was getting picked up. So I just want to start with just budget numbers here. Can you give us the total budget for composting in the city right now between curbside, which I believe is zero, um, community composting, and I think Grow NYC doing comp as, a, as a, like a third number? A anything else I might have missed? Can you give us the total budget broken down by category? So I have <clears throat> 2.88 million is the amount of money that we are using with our seven compost project affiliates. And that 2.88 million is also funding uh, Grow NYC. And I will say that again, due to the scrappy nature of these organizations, there has been a lot of efforts to seek additional supplementary private sector funding. It's not city budget. And you are case in point, uh, enabling us, you know, Stytown is such a a large and supportive community for uh, drop-offs um, that was very helpful as well. So I don't have the, the discretionary council member numbers in front of me, but I'm happy to share that. Um, we have, um, as um, was mentioned earlier, you know, we are supporting mulch fest. So if we're talking about non-food scraps, we're supporting mulch fest. We are um, supporting uh, processing of leaves within parks. We have not only are there the independent parks operations, but sanitation does a lot of work to, to partner with and, and maximize the ability to compost leaves within parks. Um, and we are also working to, to do some very limited uh, collections at um, some of the larger NYCHA facilities with lots of trees. But it is very, very limited at this point. Okay, and, and for the site in my, right outside my door, I can walk outside and drop it off in 30 seconds in Stives in town. It is, that is a drop off location for folks that's getting transported to Lower East Side Ecology Center. So the $2.88 million is funding those sites really, right? Those community composting sites where the materials are ending up. Like the discretionary buy I have is really paying for staff, I think to be there. Mm -hmm. help yeah, on the site. It's not yeah, absolutely. It's and I believe Grow is is doing the staffing and Lessic is doing the the processing. Um, so the the two point eight eight million is actually funding support for community hosted sites that choose to open up a drop off to the public and compost on site. Some of those are Green Thumb Gardens. Some of those are independent community compost sites. Um, we also have a category of of sites that host to drop off themselves and we support them with technical assistance with equipment and supplies and signage and things like that. And then um, those materials get hauled by these nonprofits to these uh, mid-scale high performing sites. Um, we then have some um, sites, largely the green market sites where um, we fund Grow NYC to staff, actually staff the sites. Like green markets, as you can imagine with social distancing, staffing is a critical component of making those sites effective. Yep. Okay. And if for the private sector folks or foundations or whoever has money 
and wants to help fill in the gaps here that they feel, you know, uh, sort of compelled to help these sites out. How, how do they go about doing that? Do they, is there a citywide mechanism for that? Or are they like, a, uh, is it the fund for New York or is it through, uh, is it through those individual organizations? At this point, it's been through the individual organizations um, and, you know, when needed, we obviously will supply support and, and letters of recommendation that these are incredibly effective tools, but it, it is directly between a private sector funder and the organization itself. Okay. And do you have a breakdown of the different sites in terms of the, that $2.8 million, million is where that's going? Yeah, you know, it, and it's, it's very dynamic. So we're constantly adding sites. We're at 99. Our goal is to get to 100 by end of the calendar year. Uh, a few of those are seasonal, um, uh, but we have a nyc.gov slash drop food scraps is the map where you can see all the sites where they're located. We are not in all community boards. And so our goal this year is to get to all community boards and make sure that there's a presence um, citywide. We are in all five boroughs, uh, but not yet in all community boards. Okay, um, and I want to know those details. Yep. Council Member Fair and uh, Council Member Reynoso rather and I have a piece of legislation that would mandate uh, that we call it the core act two bills that would mandate sites here you know every community board multiple sites we'd love to work and get that bill passed so that beyond this administration beyond all of us we sort of uphold our commitment to this um, which is such a great investment I think for the amount of money we're putting in um, how much money do you I, I'm just gonna ask a few more questions I'm sorry to the chair if this one I get a couple more. Um, uh, how, how much money do you think is necessary we had we had you know as we're fighting over dollars and we're going into our next, Around a budget, there were minor cuts, but I, I, I and others really fought hard to maintain the community composting as part of the budget. How much money do you think is needed for if you talk to the need, if you want to talk to the need right now to make sure that we can do community composting, even if curbside is not available for okay. a number of reasons? Like, like what In is that dollar amount that we think we, is needed? Yeah, and I just wanted to very quickly say nyc.gov/host a drop off is where anyone can go if they have an idea. We, we, we leverage ideas from the local communities of who might be willing to host a drop off that we can then connect the organizations to. So please leverage that. Um, in fiscal year 19, um, we spent about $4.7 million to operate the food scrap drop off and local process at composting program. So that included the New York City Compost Project affiliates and the funding to grow in YC to do food scrap drop off management. Um, we had increased that budget uh, to just over $5 million for 2020. We didn't obviously end up spending it all because of COVID. Um, but I would say, you know, we want to, at a minimum, maintain, stabilize what we have and then work to grow. But just to give you a frame of reference, um, fully loaded, the um, community scale program was about $4.7 in fiscal 19. Okay, so $4.7 might be a, a, a guiding post here. Yeah. Okay, got it. And my last questions here. Um, um, do you have any unstaffed sites right now? I mean, are, are there any sites that you, I, I think you guys had talked about at some point looking mm -hmm. at unstaffed sites uh, for drop off. Are those operating and how are they working? So we, we have, uh, we have unstaffed, what we say unstaffed, but managed sites. Uh, a lot of community hosts will have um, a bin. There's not somebody standing at the bin all the time but the bin is there and that community is you know, committed to sort of having adopted that bin and making sure that it's, it's managed appropriately. Um, and like I said, we provide technical assistance, supplies, signage, et cetera. So that we do have a number of those um, and they are working fairly well. The, the material continues to be pristine uh, for this program. I'm obviously we have people who want, are volunteering to do this and so they're doing it right. Um, there was a, an effort with the Downtown Alliance of New York, uh, Lower Manhattan, to experiment with a high-tech bin system whereby you would have on your smartphone the ability to unlock a bin and put in your food scraps, it would be managed. That project was put on hold. We are looking forward to and hopeful that maybe we, we will be able to revisit that at some point. Okay, got it. I have more questions, but I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. So thank you. And uh, I think it's such an important program. It's a really small investment to make sure that we can do our job here. I wanna talk with you guys about ways we can increase our levels of composting in the city across the board and make it easier and, and educate folks. But um, I'll let, uh, I know so many folks here to testify. So I wanna give them an opportunity to, to hear, hear their voices. Thank you and happy holidays to everyone. Thank you, Council Member. At this point, we'll return to uh, Chairperson Ku, who has some additional questions. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, 
after hearing so much about uh, composting, I want to like, go back a little bit. Can you guys provide uh, us some backgrounds on how the composting contract works? Uh, uh, like who is responsible for awarding the contract? And who is awarding, uh, responsible for like, providing space? So is sanitation the main agency that provides the funding? And, and, and all these uh, nonprofit groups, if they're interested in um, doing composting, they apply to who? For, for sanitation first? So, right. So we have uh, longstanding um, partnerships with uh, botanical gardens um, and also nonprofit organizations. So we have Earth Matter, Laurier Site Ecology Center, Big Reuse um, as the nonprofits. And then we have the four. Um, uh, uh, botanical garden institutions. Um, and uh, our, our relationship historically um, with the botanical gardens has been through the um, Department of Cultural Affairs, actually, in partnership, which has been fantastic. Um, with the nonprofits, we currently have contracts with these three nonprofit organizations. They are five-year contracts. We operate, we fund the programming. We do not we are not responsible for providing this site. The idea is that these are organizations that do more than just support the New York City Compost Project. So they have independent programming that they also operate. And so it made more sense and, and they already had existing relationships with the sites where they operate. I will tell you that um, we do host one of these mid-scale processing sites on a sanitation lot in Brooklyn um, at the Guana Salt Lot. Um, and that was also a grassroots effort originally um, an informal um, corner was carved out for some community composters who were master composters. Um, and then through participatory budgeting efforts, um, including additional sanitation funding, I said, are we were able to build out a site for one of these sites? Uh, but generally we are not responsible in the contracts to um, be the, the site license agreement holder. So, so you are responsible for awarding the contract in terms of funding? Correct, we fund, we, for the New York City Compost Project activities, we fund Santa Department of Sanitation funds those activities. These organizations do have independent programming that they also um, have other sources of funding for. So how does PARCS come along uh, to, I mean, how, how come the PARCS is the only one to provide the space? Uh, I would say that maybe Department of Transportation have a lot of space underneath the, all the bridges, you know? So, so, so in terms of providing space, uh, who do you assign? I mean, do sanitation assign or you talk to other agencies to provide them the space to do- So what we are uh, doing, right. What we are doing is working on identifying city owned lots. Uh, and ideally they are lots that are currently underutilized or unutilized um, to determine feasibility of those sites for this type of operation. Um, Obviously there are many agencies, um, we're all vying for space. Space, as we all know, is very, very tight, especially in Manhattan. Um, and so it inevitably, it involves conversations with their agencies about the ways that those sites are being utilized and if um, there's a feasible way to have these organizations operate on space. And so it's many, many organizations that we're speaking with um, are agencies. So Parks is not the only agency that provides space. Doesn't have to be. Yeah, well, yeah and, uh, I, and I would add, um, yeah. Sanitation actually hosts a community compost site at our salt lot in Brooklyn Community right. Board 6. So we do at one of our locations, and it's actually operated by um, Justin at Big Reuse. Um, so, you know, where we can, we would love to, to host these sites. But I think as, as many council members know, we're unbelievably space constrained ourselves, um, particularly in Manhattan, where we have, um, you know, trucks parking on the street in many locations. So you know, it's, I think it's, while we, we all definitely support community composting, it's also very difficult to find unused space um, in Manhattan or, or in any of the other boroughs. Doesn't mean it's not possible. And we are very committed to ensuring that, that this program advances and continues. And so um, this is our work and we are committed to it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm done, yeah.
Thank you, Chiku. Seeing no other members with questions, we will now move on to testimony from the public. Uh, we are going to hear testimony first from two uh, high school students that the chairs would like to give time to since they are on a pressing schedule. And I'll just go over the uh, quick uh, logistical issues. Um, unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling on men, individuals one by one to testify. And each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom hand raise function. And I will call on you after each panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the cue to begin upon setting the timer. So please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before, before delivering your testimony. Once, once you start your testimony, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any. So we'll hear first from uh, a high school student, Fariha Hader, if she's ready to begin. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Fariha Hyder, and I'm here representing the Brooklyn Latin Schools Eco Club, um, which I co-lead with Rebecca. Our Eco Club strongly urges the City Council to continue to fund composting programs, specifically for Lower East Side Ecology Center and Big Reuse. Big Reuse is especially dear to us because we ourselves have volunteered with them. Just last year, members of our Eco Club, in, including myself, attended a leaf raking event in support of DSNY's Make Compost Not Trash campaign at Grover Cleveland Park, and were able to divert 53 lawn and leaf bags from landfills to be composted at Queens Botanical Garden. They continued to reach out to us for our thoughts on how to make their curbside composting program a success. We learned how our personal actions also help our communities. Composting reduces pollution in environmental justice communities, reduces methane emissions, as well as food and yard waste. Composting strives to save resources. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio hopes to send zero waste to landfills by 2030, a goal that we are in support of. But how will that be feasible if numerous environmental programs are being cut back? It is for these reasons that I asked the city council to please reconsider the propo proposal to cut funding for Lower East Side Ecology Center and Big Reuse, as it will be a major step back for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now hear testimony from Rebecca Sabna. Time starts now. Um. Hi, um, my name is Rebecca Shabnam. I just finished the class on Zoom. Um, I'm a Lower East Side resident, a New York City DOE high schooler, youth advocate for cafeteria culture, and fingers crossed, hopefully, a New York City government official in the future. Um, and I am here to strongly urge City Council to continue funding composting for New York City. I'm testifying because evicting composting is not only a step back in the wrong direction, um, but also evicting composting means denying frontline communities the environmental justice they deserve. So essential composting sites run by my neighborhood, practically in my own backyard, are now on the verge of being shut down and I refuse to see that happen. So evicting composting means increased greenhouse gas and pollution from all compostable waste, foods and scraps and organics that make up a third of our trash that are just being dumped into landfills. And who is going to be affected by that the most? It's gonna be low income black and brown communities in the middle of a pandemic where people are already vulnerable to health issues, evicting composting is a dangerous thing to do. It's not only a waste of just public funds invested to make these sites and um, DSNY services designed to reduce sending waste to these landfills, it tells these frontline communities that the city does not care about them. If the city wants to protect black and brown and low income communities, if the city cares about its youth, they must continue funding composting and resume it in all schools citywide. And also, especially in public housing and black um, indigenous people of color communities that were previously excluded. So now is your chance to show us that you are on our side. Thank you for giving me the time to testify. Great job, thank you so much. Uh, it's good to have our, our youth and our young people um, front and center on a lot of these issues, and I really appreciate your time. I hope that the city can stay on while people are testifying and give them that courtesy so they can hear uh, the issues uh, uh, that, that folks that are on the front lines have related to this issue. 
Um, thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you, and thank you, Chair. Uh, we'll now move on to our next group. And as I stated earlier, um, the next group of four uh, individuals will have five minutes to testify due to their connections to the affected sites. Our first speaker will be Borough, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, followed by Justin Green, followed by Christine Dats Romero, followed by Ingo Morales, and Borough President uh, Brewer. You may begin when ready. Thank you. Thank you. Time thank starts you. now. Thank you very much. I am Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President. I want to thank the two chairs and uh, the committee members. And I'm obviously in support of Resolution 1510 that would encourage the Parks Department and the Sanitation Department to allow community composting operations on parkland. And I have listened to the wonderful back and forth. And I have to say, I don't understand why this is an issue. I am a strong supporter of composting. Chair Renosha is aware of the partnership along with council member Keith Powers on intro 1942 and intro 1943. That's the core act and that would have established recycling and organic drop off in every community district. It was because of the budget cut that we brought this up. I did oppose the FY21 budget cuts that suspended the sanitation department's residential organics collection program uh, through 2021. And I want to say that the Manhattan swab and I think the other swabs are trying to figure out how we can make sure that uh, picking up one's uh, composting organics that becomes composting in every neighborhood like my block, how it can make sense because it does make sense. While curbside organics collection is on hiatus, community composting serves as the only alternatives for us New Yorkers who want to compost our food waste. And these sites are located on parkland and in community gardens, and certainly the one that you've heard so much about today, East River Park, operated by the beloved Lower East Side Ecology Center, and 3,500 or more households rely on this program. On a policy level, community composting, as you heard from everyone, is integral to the New York City achieving zero waste by 2030. Food waste comprises one third of the overall waste generated by New Yorkers. And this ends up in the landfill, as we know, and it costs a fortune. The city should support the expansion, not the elimination of community composting sites. And I know that sanitation and parks said they're supportive, but you're not supportive if you don't support it at its completeness. We know in the committee, the committee members know that for over a year, council member Carlina Rivera, and she spoke so articulately about her support. We convened stakeholders, we engaged local residents, including NYSHA tenants. We had a community advisory group. We even got an independent expert to come from Holland to ensure a wide range of local voices would be incorporated into ESCRA. As you heard it, it's the East River Coastal Resiliency Process. And the community into input into these plans was especially important because there was so much city emphasis on disregarding all the community planning. So we ended up with a preferred alternative. But at every level, no matter what one believed about the process and about ESPRA, the same response, protect the compost, compact, support the compost. I support the goal of ESPRA and I believe it's important to move forward with the federal money before they expire for New Yorkers because we need to make sure this flood protection. Yet the city should also provide greater support to the Lower East Side's compost yard and ensure its existence during and after escrow construction. Coastal resiliency and zero waste strategies are not mutually exclusive. They need both. I also want to point out all of the big reuse discussion I am supportive of in keeping it. Roosevelt Island is in Manhattan, for those of you who don't know. And guess what? The Garden Club members at Roosevelt Island and Roosevelt Island residents support composting in their community. They'd love to have it on parkland. And they are advocating for more funding for those programs. But they're also hugely supportive of big reuse, hugely supportive. Composting does belong in parks and parkland. If you, It just seems to me it's normal and legal. Eric Goldstein thinks it's legal. Parks Department, Law Department may not, but I would go with Eric Goldstein, NRDC. Resolution 1510 proposed by Chair Reynoso calls on the agencies to continue to engage and collaborate 
with local communities to encourage and allow community compost to be carried out on parkland that is safe for residents. This is certainly the call of everyone who has been testifying so far, and I support it. I look forward uh, to working with members of the com committees to protect and preserve the city's community composting sites, all of them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Borough President. We'll now hear testimony from Justin Green, followed by Christine Detz Romero. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Justin Green. I'm the executive director of Big Reuse. I want to thank the thousands of community activists in Astoria and throughout the city who are fighting to save uh, community composting sites and compost with us. I want to thank the Save Our Compost Coalition, the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, NRDC, and New York Lawyers for Public Interest for all your work that's gotten us to this point. Um, thank you to Council Member Reynoso, Asher Freeman, Asher Freeman, Council Member Van Bramer, amazing questioning, and you've been a, an amazing advocate for the community um, and, you know, bringing parks to uh, improve Queensbridge has been a long fight for you, and I'm um, really thankful you've been here to make that effort. Um, thank you to Council Member Koo for your testimony and all the elected officials who have funded and fought for community composting and called for oversight hearings to save our sites. I want to thank the Department of Sanitation, um, Bridget and Greg, and everyone there who's we've worked with for you know, nearly a decade to uh, make composting happen in New York City, um, and all the nonprofit partners we work with to expand those community opportunities. We we really want to get to every community district, and this is a distraction, um, and you know I think a waste of time for everyone here and all the thousands of residents when something so clearly. Uh, that community composting should happen on parks because we're composting their leaves and wood chips and giving back to the compost to, the, uh, to parks, to green thrum, to street tree, tree care, uh, and community gardens to use. It's, it's within parks mission. Um, and I want to thank local Queens Park staff who we've worked with for decades to rake leaves and clean up parks and green parks. Uh, local Queens Park staff understand the importance of composting and understand the importance of working with us. Like we see that and they appreciate us. Um, I do wanna thank Park Leadership for finally reaching out to us this morning to offer the extension. I um, appreciate the chance to start talking about uh, our site and how to move forward. Um, and we're glad our efforts have uh, encouraged parks to begin work on the long delayed baby Queensbridge Park improvements. Glad to see that movement happen as well. Um, you know, community composting belongs in parks, plain and simple. It just makes sense. I think everyone, there's been so much activism around it because people are like, well, you're composting leaves and wood chips. You're giving the compost back to parks. Use what can the objection be? No one understands. I get, I've been talking to a New York Times reporter yesterday. They're like, well, why would parks want to kick up? I can't come up with a good solution. Um, it is not, you know, we all have a responsibility to fight for climate change. And if parks said we all need to do our part, our part to green parks. And uh, right now they're not doing it. You know, parks generates millions of, of pounds of leaf and yard waste every year that they currently landfill or incinerate, which contribute to climate change. Our community composting site provides parks with that solution to act sustainably and to compost that waste with community benefit. Um, for almost a decade, we've done this, uh, close to 1.5 million pounds under the Queensboro Bridge on parks managed land. Um, you know, we worked with thousands of volunteers with the Department of Sanitation um, and over two years to clean a lot that we now occupy. It was filled, a parks managed lot was filled with garbage, had been um, basically squatted by a private contractor for a decade. It, we cleared off 30, 50 yard containers of garbage, we graded, we paved the site. Our site is open to the public. It is a public resource and recreation. We have a thousand volunteers that came through in 2019. Um, we, and so it's open to the public. It's part of the community and we make every effort to improve the community. We fix the site that had been left abandoned. Now that we fixed it and paved it and graded it, Parks wants it back. And that was not clear in any of the negotiations. There's no written thing in the negotiations that says the site was temporary. You know, we don't have a renewal, that's true, but as Councilman Van Bramer stated, 
parks can renew. Um, the, we're there every day. So we understand the, the local operations needs. There are uh, six trailers in Queensbridge that could easily fit in the staff parking lot underneath Queensboro Bridge. They have, there's five blocks of land that parks controls. Um, some for green thumb, some for energy, and some for a 20,000 square foot staff parking lot, um, which is currently typically a quarter full, you know, that could easily fit 20 trailers, not just the six trailers that need to be moved and could fit the four trailers that are for district one, two, and three operations. So there's really no reason logistically, ethically, or legally to evict our site. And we are happy to keep working with local parks and local community, which we've done for a decade. And we're here to help green the city and fight climate change. And we want to be given that opportunity to remain and do that. Thank you. Please renew our license. Thank you. And Council Member Van Bramer does have a question. Well, first of all, thank you, Justin, for uh, talking so powerfully about the great work that you've done, about the abandoned uh, lot, uh, those city owned that you uh, uh, found and uh, restored to public use. And, and thank you also for, because you are on the ground as I am talking about uh, just how much uh, parking space there is available uh, how much of it is currently being used. And I just have to say, when you said that, it uh, reminded me of the uh, beautiful uh, bike lane uh, that was recently uh, rebuilt that adjoins this. And uh, as a city, we should be encouraging everyone uh, to bike and to use mass transit and not be driving and not be parking their vehicles in Queensbridge, uh, which is a community that has long been abused uh, and uh, long been susceptible to asthma and other uh, illnesses uh, because of the environmental racism that has been uh, witnessed upon that community. So um, we have this giant parking lot um, for staff uh, and yet uh, the seven and other trains are uh, a couple of blocks away and we have a beautifully uh, uh, repaved protected bike lane uh, right, right adjoining the site. Um, so Justin, I just wanna say once again, uh, thank you um, for everything that you've done, everything you can continue to do. And, and the fact that you also don't accept this extension uh, of six months, you know, as a, as a, as a victory, right? Uh, we, we need to continue to push and fight uh, for uh, a permanent home, which could very easily be right where you are. And also continue to fight, as you mentioned, for justice for uh, Queensbridge Park and therefore the people of Queensbridge and Ravenswood. Uh, uh, just to the north, which is incredibly important to me uh, and to you. So um, thank you for uh, laying it out the way you did in terms of how all of that space is being used under the bridge, uh, right across the street from the Queensbridge houses and how easy a fix this is if parks would just recommit to community composting uh, and say that this is consistent with their values and how they're actually going to achieve what they say they want to achieve. Um, and uh, that is saving yeah. this planet. Thank you, Jimmy. I think that's, I mean, uh, it's you've really well spoken. And I, you know, I think that is clear that local parks operations agrees with us, you know, and, and works with us. And they feel that connection to the soil and they understand the benefit that compost brings to their parks and their communities. Um, and the issue, I think, really um, is just not being in the community. Like, folks are making decisions that are not in the community for the community. Um, and, and that's, you know, we've been there for a decade. And that what's happening now is just more of that. 
Absolutely. Well, you know, I will continue to stand with you in solidarity and fight with uh, this incredible community in solidarity every step of the way. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for your work. Thank you, Councilmember Van Bramer. I believe Chair Ku does have a question as well. Uh, hi. Um, I have a question. Um, thank you, Justin, for your uh, contributions uh, in composting. So you said you have been there for 10 years, but you only signed the current license agreement with Park in 2018. How come you took uh, you so long to sign the agreement with the Parks Department? Well, it took a, a very long time to negotiate that agreement. It took us, uh, I mean, we were, we were uh, originally moved on to the site or found unused space under the bridge. And we worked with uh, uh, Dottie Lewandowski, who was the Queens Parks Commissioner at the time under an MOU to operate there starting in 2011. Um, we operated successfully on a site that, that then Green Thumb wanted to move to. So we took on the massive project of cleaning up this gar garbage strewn site um, on Vernon. And it was, like I said, full of 50, 30 art containers of garbage. We worked with Department of Sanitation who did a lot of the lot clearing. Um, and we worked with engineers and contractors to build out the site, to pave the site. Con Ed has massive uh, utilities running through the site. So we had to work around their repairs. They did, we're doing a year's worth of repairs. So it took us two years of work to actually prepare the site to move into. So, so that um, took a long time and lots of volunteer work and lots of staff work to get, that, so get to that point. So that's why we've been under the bridge for so long is because we've been working to repair and improve the sites under the bridge for that long. And so when we finally had been fully repaired uh, in 2018 is when we signed the license agreement to, to start operations. But, but then how come you sign the agreement for only two, two years? No, if I spend so much time and energy in building up a place, I wouldn't sign the agreement for two years only. You, you know, I mean, absolutely, that's a good point. I mean, we're, we'd been there for so long prior to that and without any issues. And, and we, we assumed since we were taking over a lot that had been filled with garbage, um, the parks really didn't need that space. So we sort of assumed we, our, our case is such a common sense case for sustainability. And our integration with parks operation was so clear. Um, we had assumed we would just continue the way we, we continued for you know seven years prior. Um, so that was, I guess, naive on our part uh, that to, to, to agree to that. So what were your expectations? When you signed the agreement, did, did you have a lawyer to advise you or what? Yeah, we did. I mean, we, you know, it's, it's true um, that when we went to the negotiations, it, it was a, a limit. It was, we were given three years, you know, and, um, and it wasn't a, there wasn't an extension in there, but we assumed we would get to that point. Um, were, were you under the instruction that you will get an extension when you signed that? Uh, well, you, at, the, at the point we signed it, that was not on the table. It wasn't on the table at that point. So, I mean, we assumed that uh, that would happen, but it, it wasn't specifically named in, in the license agreement. I mean, it's up to parks and the city to decide what to do with the space. Our agreement, as it stands, parks could kick off almost anyone as, as part of any license agreement. The city can almost kick off anyone at any time. So, you know, the license agreements are really solely based on the goodwill of the city and the public sentiment around that space. Um, so as you know, from looking at, you've probably seen license agreements, the city has that legal ability. We don't own the property, you know, the city owns it. The city can kick off anyone at any time if they need to. Um, and so this, it's up to the city to decide, even in license agreements with extensions, like Lower East Side has a license agreement that extends into perpetuity. That's not saving their site, right? So the same thing is happening with us um, mm -hmm. is that it's up to the city to decide whether to do it, whether there's a, a, a renewal in there or not. You know, whether it, it, it the city decides whether it makes sense sustainably, you know, ethically, and, and whether it's a, uh, the decision makes sense for the community. And it makes it that decision with every site. So what is your status of your agreement with sanitation department now? Do they have a timeline there or how many years? 
uh, you can do. We have a four, yeah, we have um, four years left in our five year license agreement. I mean, not license, we have a contract with the city for community composting program. Okay, so uh, sanitation, yeah, four more years. Yeah. Hmm. So the, the parks ever offer you any uh, 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 renewal if you change your practice? Did they say, hey, you have to do this in order for, for us to renew your license? Did they ever offer you anything? No. So past never identify any place for you to move? No. And we were, we, you know, and we talked with local, like I said, local okay, parks officials. Okay, so I and, mentioned, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, you know, local, local um, parks and operations well, folks have, have even offered some of their sites and been like, why don't you move to our park? We'd love to have you. But parks has decided that community composting doesn't belong in parks. So that's why, you know, that's really what it comes down to is that's the rationale. Um, so it's not, you know, I think there, we've seen uh, so many different reasons given why we have to move. But I think as, as council member Van Bramer pointed out, it's really, you know, uh, a stance at parks, what, you know, what, um, if they believe in community composting or not. Okay, thank you, Justin. Yeah, yeah thank you. I mean, we're, yeah. Justin, I just wanted to just ask a couple, not even ask questions, just make a statement. Um, it, it's very unfortunate. It, it just composting makes so much sense with the parks department. And it's unfortunate that they're taking the stand that uh, there's not a, a good marriage between the two. And we obviously know that it makes a lot of sense. I'm sorry that you're having to go through this. Um, you know, and this, and just to be clear, the parks department had no problem putting in trailers and parking vehicles uh, on parkland for decades in Queensbridge, uh, but it's so fervently against uh, keeping composting on one of its sites. It, it's remarkable um, how strong they're willing to take a stand on this, and how 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 quickly they are to overlook the long-term parking. Um, and, and, and alienation of space in Queensbridge. So again, I'm sorry you're having to go through this, just know we're gonna be fighting uh, tooth and nail to overturn um, this unfortunate decision uh, during this time. So thank you so much for all the work that you do at Big Reuse. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Christine Datramero, followed by Domingo Morales. Time starts now. Uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity to uh, testify and I would like to thank uh, Chair Reynoso and Chair Ku for um, holding this meeting and also like to thank everybody who's tuning in and for our local council people to, um, to advocate for us together with the uh, borough president's office. Um, my name is Christina Datsomero and I'm the executive director of the Lower East Side Ecology Center. We are an organization that started community-based composting 30 years ago in the Lower East Side on some city-owned vacant lot that we cleaned up and we turned into a vibrant green space. Uh, by 1998, we entered into a long-term partnership with parks and moved to East River Park. And in exchange for this space in the park uh, to grow our programs, we agreed to handle leaf and yard waste generated by parks and to donate finished compost back to parks, community gardens, and community groups taking care of street trees. This is a win-win situation. Parks is provided with sustainability services that comes at no cost to them while gaining program space that engages community residents, delivers hand-on educational opportunities to local schools, provides job training, and creates green jobs. And I want to just uh, also mention that um, this long term relationship that we really entered into uh, with the parks department was um, memorialized in a, in a license agreement that we had with parks and uh, that's a five year license agreement that we uh, signed in 2010. And uh, one of the paragraphs of this license agreement says that um, 
this agreement should uh, be viewed as an agreement or a partnership that should run in perpetuity. And um, the other thing I want to mention is that when we entered or when we came to East River Park in 1998, we didn't even have a relationship with the Department of Sanitation. Uh, we are the pioneer of community-based composting in New York City. Uh, we are committed to it. Uh, it's our core program that I think really sets us apart. And uh, we really have seen, uh, with, uh, we're very proud of where the city came to in terms of really creating a community and, an uh, and a lot of advocates for, uh, for composting here in the city. Otherwise we wouldn't have an organic curbside program that's unfortunately suspended now. So we wouldn't have made all of these, uh, all of this pro uh, progress without really having this amazing um, community that really supports uh, composting and sees a lot of um, benefit in it. And um, so when we entered this park, um, we, you know, we ended it without having even a relationship with sanitation, but I think the parks department, at least at that point in the late 90s and through 2000s, uh, really saw that benefit of uh, partnering with a partner who really brought sustainability, uh, who brought a program that fights climate change every day, uh, every day of the of the year, and they really wanted to partner with us. And I really don't understand what happened in the meantime uh, with this relationship because we did everything right by the parks department. We worked really hard here in this park. Uh, we did stewardship. We used the compost that we created to really revitalize this park after Esker. Uh, we planted native plants, you name it. But uh, composting is the cornerstone of the programs that we did here and it makes a lot of sense. We also work uh, to educate other um, entities that are interested and just like Justin spoke about it, in parks, uh, Riverside Park, um, the whole horticultural staff came down here to do workshops with us. There are so many people in parks that believe that composting belongs into park, in, in the park system and want to see a more sustainable and closed loop systems in their neighborhoods. And we were really there to, um, to educate and give technical assistance. And we're still very much interested in doing that. Just look at Hudson River Park. It's a state run park, but however, they have a composting program and uh, they handle their yard waste. And now they have 10 drop off locations sprinkled throughout their parks. They use their resources and their staff to service these drop off uh, locations for food scraps because they know food scraps and yard waste makes magic and that's compost. In an urban space, that's what we should be doing. It's hyper-local, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, again, we can probably advocate and talk that to death, but um, just wanna bring the point home again. It makes absolutely no sense from a policy standpoint for parks to, um, to deny that and um, to evict such uh, stalwarts of community-based organizations. The other thing I also want to point out is that the ESCO construction, which is um, starting uh, sometime next year, is really supposed to build a resilient park. And uh, at the same time, it seems to be dooming a climate-friendly composting program. We all know that the escalating climate crisis is the root cause of why we will have to build flood protection. But the answer can't be to build ever higher walls to, to keep the water out. To tackle our climate crisis, we need to change our habits and lifestyles. And composting, again, is one stop into that direction. So for Parks Department to say we're building a world-class resilient park and at the same time throwing the composting program to the wayside into the garbage pile is just unconscionable and we say to create a resilient East River Park, the compost yard needs to return to this park. It has been absolutely frustrating to be uh, involved with an agency who has had such a commitment to our program to now just stonewall us forever and um, 
and not really engage with us in finding solutions. Uh, we don't want to slow down the S-care program. We all know we need to protect ourselves. However, uh, the last time there was construction scheduled here in East River Park, which was from 2001 to 2012, when there was a major rebuild of the promenade, the ecology center was in this park already. And um, we uh, moved out of the way of construction. We stayed here as long as feasible. And then we were relocated uh, into another park in Coleman Park down in, uh, in, in lower Manhattan. And at that point, parks didn't even question that they needed to provide an alternative space to us. Uh, what has changed now? I don't understand it. Uh, when we started to look for a space to move to because of escrow, Parks has never proactively offered us any space. And uh, that is, again, um, very disappointing and just not right. Uh, again, preserving community-based composting is essential for New York City. And um, we need to just really fight. And I'd like to thank everybody for their tremendous support. And I'm hoping that we will get the Parks Department to acknowledge that uh, they have to be an agency that just like everybody else is, is coming together to really fight climate change. And um, it's a day-to-day -day thing that we need to engage in and community composting needs to remain uh, in a, on public uh, land. Thank you. Thank you very much, I believe. Chair Ku does have a question. Thank you, Christine, for your passion and your dedication uh, in composting and helping New York City. So my question to you is, uh, has the administration or the past department uh, tell you or told you uh, what time to move out the East River Park? Uh, have they give you a timeline? They have not given us a timeline. The last time, uh, the last I heard was uh, when Sam came, Biederman, who's here today, came to a, a CB3 community board meeting and said that there is no drop dead deadline for us. However, um, he's also said today that um, we could stay there as long as feasible. So th these are all. Um, sort of statements that are very, um, you know, it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't feel like that's, a, that's an answer that we can build, uh, that we can confidently say, oh yeah, we're going to stay here. So they have not given us a timeline. Uh, Parks Department has tried to uh, eliminate the um, compost yard as a part of an early package for Esker. So we were supposed to move out la, uh, this September. However, that just never happened, obviously. Um, and I just really want to hear from the Parks Department that they are committed to uh, finding us a space uh, so we can move to during the construction if that's needed and also really want to hear from the Parks Department that we are coming back to East River Park, saying that they will make a good faith effort is basically telling us that there is a problem with us returning to this park. And there shouldn't be a problem. Uh, throughout the ESCO, uh, you know, um, I have attended so many meetings. I've spent years of my time um, you know, following this, this process and everybody in our community has always just come out and supported our organization and for us to be in this park. The only agency who is hesitant in that support is the parks department. So are there any, any sites um, near the community uh, where you can do composting temporarily? Have you identified some places? And if you identify those, how come um, has past department helped you or to relocate? Well, as I said, Parks Department has not been uh, proactive in helping us uh, identifying new sites. And um, I would argue that Parks Department, who has thousands of acres of land in the city, 
could uh, come to us and say, here are some sites that we could that uh, you could move to. Uh, they obviously has uh, there are certain specifications that have to be met. We cannot just you know move into any site. Uh, smaller sites are really not appropriate for us to move to. Um, but uh, Parks Department has so far not offered us any sites to relocate to. So I, I thought Parks Department already offered the civil part for your educational and administration, right? So our organization has really made East River Park its home uh, for two decades. We offer educational programs. So, um, and that, that aspect of our organization will be uh, will be able to serve our community by being relocated to Seward Park. However, our compost yard, which is a one acre site in East River Park, which is a 58 acre waterfront park, that uh, aspect of our organization and our programs has not uh, been offered any space to move to. Uh, but in the meantime, Parks Department said they are trying their best, right, to help you to relocate. Uh, because right now they don't have a construction time, so they don't know when you guys are moving out yet. Well, as I said, uh, Parks Department has very proactively always tried to really make sure that we leave East River Park as soon as possible. Uh, just to give you an example, um, during uh, ESCR, they announced a whole bunch of mitigation uh, pro uh, sites that they wanted to develop. And they um, said to us very casually in one of our meetings that um, they are thinking about turning the compost yard into a passive recreational lawn as a mitigation for uh, the ESCA construction, which will close down at least 40% of this park uh, at a time to the community. And we right away raised really concerns about it. And Parks Department never came, uh, made this, uh, this, this um, um, mitigation um, public until it was a done deal until they had uh, the okay from the public design commission uh, to go forward with that construction that's when they announced it at community board meetings so for the last couple of years what we've really seen is a department that is doing anything it can to really make sure that we are leaving this park uh, at an escalated timetable. At that point, um, the ESCA construction wasn't even supposed to start, but they made sure to come up with some scheme to have us out before even the construction started. So I would say that they have not engaged in any good faith effort to really treat us as the partner that they should treat us as because we've been here for 20 years. And quite frankly, we worked very hard to make this park uh, the success it is. Um, let me, excuse me, is Mr. Biderman still there? Commissioner B Biderman, are you still there? Yes, I'm present. I'm, uh... Yeah, so can you like, tell us whether you can give assurance to Christine uh, that uh, Lower East Side uh, can return to Lower East Side Park once the construction is done? So, as I stated earlier, um, uh, we this, have, the, um, second question. The first question: Can you help? Can you help them? Can you help them to find a uh, temporary place during construction? All right. So, um, thank you, Council Member. As I stated earlier, um, the Parks Department has uh, taken great efforts to make sure that the sewer, uh, that the Lower East Side Ecology Center has an interim. Uh, interim location uh, to do their uh, programming in Seward Park. This comes free of charge. We renovated a new space for them um, and worked with them very closely to renovate this space. Um, so uh, we, and in response to your question, uh, council member, uh, the effort to find a temporary location for uh, the Laurier Site Ecology Center um, is actually being led. It's a citywide effort, right? So it's not being led by the Parks Department. Um, it is being um, 
led in partnership with um, many city agencies, but uh, DSNY and uh, DCAS are leading this effort along with um, partners from the mayor's office. Okay. I finished my questions. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I think Councilmember Rivera has some questions. Yes, Councilmember Rivera is next. Please go ahead. Starting time. Christine, I really just wanted to come out here to to thank you for kind of reiterating and and reinforcing everything that we've mentioned as to your contribution to the entire movement. I just want to recognize that. Um, can you can you just tell and forgive me if I'm missing this in your testimony a little bit about what your programs provide really to the LES in terms of resources and education, but how that directly correlates to the type of alternative facility or lot that you will need in order to be your most successful during that temporary relocation. Sure, yeah. So, um, of course, here in East River Park, uh, the, you know, there's really three things that come together. It's educational, uh, it is stewardship of the park, and it is uh, doing composting. And for us, they all are inter intertwined. Um, I want to also really say that uh, at one point, Commissioner um, um, Biederman talked about parks really uh, having this mandate to reliably or um, offer open space for recreational use. And I would say that um, during COVID, uh, the minute it was safe for us to, um, to offer volunteer opportunities again, which is a form of recreational use of parkland, uh, we had no problems filling slots uh, from people who really wanted to help and be engaged in our composting yard. So uh, we have had hundreds of volunteers come to the compost yard since uh, about May, June to help us with that. So, you know, we really also engage the community in this process of being part of this program that we know um, benefits uh, the city so greatly. And uh, in terms of a, um, a space that we that we really need to um, temporarily relocate. Of course, we would like to stay as close to our community as we can. Uh, all of our programs run within 2.5 mile radius. So our drop off locations and where we uh, turn kitchen scraps into finished compost are very tight. We also have 50 community gardens in our neighborhood, as you know, and uh, we deliver a lot of finished compost to these uh, community gardens. So, you know, we have really um, over the three decades of offering this program built a, uh, a lot of relationships that, you know, if we are uprooted, you know, we, we are not going to expect to have the same kind of opportunities. Um, and relationships in a new neighborhood, but um, having a space where we can operate out of uh, reliably will at least allow us to uh, pass this time during construction of ESCO so we can really return and be still a strong organization once uh, we are able to return to East River Park. Thank you so much for that. I, I know that the, this is exactly the type of location that we're fighting for to make sure that we can accommodate all of these important components of your program, which I think we all know is for the well being of our city, the well being of our families. So I, I just want to ask I mean, I know the Parks Department is still here. I want to thank you for, for listening to people. Um, I guess I'm asking Christine this question, but it really is also a question for the Parks Department, which is, you don't think that we can find a suitable location that could accommodate the components of Lower East Side Ecology Center's uh, programs and services in a park like Central Park or Riverside Park or even Battery Park or any other large parks in the area? And I guess, Christine, if you wanna address whether you think that's a good idea, um, I'm happy to hear your honest critique I'm just trying to figure out, you know, why we were 
relying so heavily on this one site that suddenly is no longer an option. Um, so I, I don't know if that's something that is. Council member, you're on mute. Let's try to unmute the council member. So I want to go, Christine, I wanted to ask, and the parks department is still here. Did y'all hear that part? Yeah, uh, well, I, I didn't hear, I'm afraid I, when you cut out, I don't think I heard the end of the question, That's but okay. I think about the gist. It was like Battery Park, Central Park, Riverside Park. These are large parks that I think could potentially be a solution. And I'm, I guess I'm asking Christine, considering all the components of the program, whether honestly that's a good idea and whether that has been explored by the Parks Department, considering the size and the fact that it could potentially accommodate the programs, uh, uh, the services that Christine uh, described. Yeah, I would definitely say we very I'm much for, um, for the Parks Department to work with us to identify space in a public park to move to temporarily. Uh, we are all for that. Yeah, and so, uh, Council Member, I, I certainly appreciate the sentiment and I, I, you know, it's not something that we've really talked about in depth, but what I'm, I will say that our concern remains um, making sure that, you know, we're getting the most out, most sort of public recreational space out of our parks, especially, you know, as we've all seen during this uh, past 10 months, keeping as much parkland online as possible is really the name of the game here for the mental, emotional, and physical health of New Yorkers. And as we've worked with your office too, and uh, other members of the council to meet commitments, other commitments around, um, uh, around ESCR construction, right? So we've already done a, a quite a game of dominoes, just um, shifting things into place to make sure that recreational amenities are available um, when, as the park um, in stages goes offline and online. So um, I, 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 that's about all I can say on it, that um, it's uh, finding another location within parks. I mean, it, we're, our focus right now, I think the city's focus right now is finding another location um, that is not on parkland. And that is, that is really where the focus lies. I know what you're saying, I, I heard the dominoes thing, but I, I think the entire community has been reorganizing and doing all, making all sorts of sacrifices to allow the flood protection to come in. So I would say that if you can let big reuse move back in, then you can certainly find another spot and another park for the Lower East Side Ecology Center. And I just wanna thank the chairs for their time. Thank you, council member. Uh, our next speaker is Domingo Morales. Starting time. Hello. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Domingo Morales, and I'm here today to talk about the partnership with Parks and Department of Sanitation and Compost Project. Um, I've been hearing during this call all day today that the reason why these two sites are being removed is because they have to do construction and they need this space and they want to improve access. But the site that I represent, the Red Hook compost site, which was the largest compost site in the United States that didn't use fossil fuels, has been shut down by parks because they just don't want composting on that site. So um, just getting that out the way, um, a little bit of background. My name is Domingo Morales, the founder of Compost Power alum of Green City Forest and a former site manager at the Red Hook Compost Site. My mission at Compost Power is to build grassroots compost sites throughout New York City, providing all residents with access to waste equity, sustainable education and job training. I'm here to advocate for the Red Hook Compost Site, which is already shut down and also more broadly for diversity and inclusion in the citywide composting program. I managed the Red Compost Site before it was defunded, which is the largest compost site in the US that didn't use any machines. We engaged with over 2000 volunteers a year, trained hundreds of underserved youth, empowering them to get life skills that would ensure their success in any career they chose. We built the infrastructure and culture around inclusiveness, where children, wheelchair brown people, um, people of color and all other New Yorkers felt comfortable in our space. The compost site was human powered and it served over 100 community spaces, gardens, farms, all over New York City. 
I took over the site two years ago after the site founder, David Buckman, passed. It was one of the only city-funded sites in New York City that provided consistent training all year round for marginalized residents and all other New Yorkers alike. The program was halted because we don't have permission from parks to process any new food scraps on site. So any funding that was meant for the Reha compost site has been diverted elsewhere and not used to collect or process organic waste. This is a devastating regression and an enormous waste after so much was invested in building the infrastructure and culture in Red Hook over the last 12 years. When I started working at the Red Hook compost site, there weren't a lot of people like me working in the compost field. Fast forward to 2020, there were several people of color, just like myself, that were managing compost sites in New York City, and then the budget cuts happened. I had a feeling that my job wouldn't be coming back. During financial hardships, people of color are usually affected the most because it's easier for organizations to hire people within their own circles, rather than making the extra effort to reach out to people outside to increase diversity or invest in communities that these organizations reside in. The compost project went from having several color people, several people of color running compost sites in New York City to most of us being gone. Red Hook compost site, on the other hand, was unique because staff, volunteers, visitors were diverse and inclusive by design instead of being machine operated or run by a homogenous crew. Our goal should be to build sustainable and equitable city. In order to do that, any city funded composting efforts have to be more diverse and inclusive to all residents of New York City. We need to ensure that organizations that are receiving funding commit to two things. One, diversify their staff to represent the communities they reside in. The only way to tackle these issues and provide waste equity across New York City is to have a diverse representation of teachers, trainers, employees, and volunteers. We need everyone in on this. Two, provide education and outreach which will help increase support and participation from these communities. To the Parks Department, for the past three decades, we have worked together to beautify New York City parks with the rich compost that we made. We co-hosted volunteer events together. We've cultivated shared spaces for the community. Reha composting site was a safe green space where people could walk through freely, just like any other New York City park. We need more sites like Reha compost site, not less. I ask that the city council encourage the parks department to allow us to continue this work at Reha and all other compost project sites. This is the time to invest. Otherwise, the 2.8 million is only serving the most privileged New York City residents and keeping thousands of citizens in the dark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move on to our next uh, panelists. And from here on out, there, there are many people left to testify. So we'll be moving to a two minute time frame. We'll hear first from Marissa de Duminisis, followed by Melissa Aishan. Starting time. Good day. Thank you, Council Member Chu, for calling this critical New York City Parks Oversight Hearing. My name is Marissa D. Dominicus, and I'm the co-founder of the Earth Matter New York. We're a nonprofit dedicated to the art and science of composting, and we are located on Governor's Island. I'm here today to shout out Earth Matter support for our sister organizations, the Lower East Side Ecology Center and the Big Reuse to be able to continue their crucial work of composting neighbor food scraps located on New York City parkland. And we would shout out that they need a permanent status and they need it now. Elected officials, you act, you, um, will you act on the voice of your constituents, the voice of the thousands of people who have chosen to change their behaviors by composting their food scraps. This is the one basic way that people can directly contribute to sustaining New York City. Will you listen to the cry of our Mother Earth who is in need of healing? New York City landfill and incinerates 99% of New York City organic resources in someone else's backyards. Composting is the answer to many of the environmental problems everyone in this room, Mr. Biederman, is tasked to solve. City Council members, Mayor Bill, and political candidates who seek to lead our city, are you willing to advocate for compost legislation on New York City parkland? Will you support expanding compost on other New York City lands as well, which I haven't heard, as a key way back 
from the environmental degradation practices that have caused the sickness of our public lands. Composting is a step in the right direction for managing our resources and a way to nurture and heal our land. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Humbly yours, Mother Earth's Compost Handmaiden. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now hear from Melissa Aishan and she'll be followed by Lisa Bloodgood. Starting time. Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Yashan and I'm a senior staff attorney in the environmental justice program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Unlike uh, many of the people we have heard today who were referring to some legal opinions, I am in fact a lawyer. And um, that is what, what has brought me here today. I have extensive written testimony, which I have submitted and Please, I urge the members of the committee as well as the members of the administration to please read over my testimony as well as the testimony of my partner in legal crime, Erica Goldstein. But I'm just going to take this quick moment today to just say, one, I am so grateful that we have this hearing today. I have been working alongside the amazing efforts of Christina and Justin for months now trying to advocate to save these incredibly important compost processing sites, community gems. And we have been very frustrated. We have been begging for some sort of oversight and accountability on the varied answers and excuses that we were getting from the varied agencies for months now. So I am so grateful to Chairman Ku, Chairman Reynoso, to all of the council members who worked together with us in our advocacy, and it culminated in today's hearing. Why did we want this hearing? We had been getting the runaround. Just during this hearing, we've heard how many different excuses given to how many different people as to why these valuable community organizations are being evicted off their sites. And as we just heard, one already has been shuttered by the Parks Department. Among all of these excuses, we keep hearing, well, I'm not a lawyer, but there are legal issues, which I'll get to in a moment. The reason we really wanted this hearing was to get some accountability and some direct answers on the record under oath which this hearing presumably has done. However, we still don't have any straight answers. And as many of the council members have said, this is the most idiotic reason to be sitting here and- Time expire. All this time. That was two minutes? Okay, well, please read my um, written testimony because I address all of the presumable legal issues, none of which are applicable, and there is no actual valid legal reason why either of these organizations need to be moved. And I'm happy to answer any questions about that if council members should have them. Right, and I, and I do have a, a, a question. Uh, Melissa, can you clarify one point that's being made is that uh, by law, a, uh, a composting site doesn't serve a park's purpose um, so that it, it must, it, so it, it in turn speaks to like some alienation of land. And I, and I want to ask as well, um, I believe Parks Department um, also has like golf courses in, in that, it, that exists. Uh, and I can't just walk into a golf course, uh, you know? Uh, so I just want to ask, what, what's the difference? Is, is a golf course an appropriate, and a private, I'm guessing, a private golf course uh, a, a reasonable use of park space as opposed to, let's say, a compost site. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to ask those questions. Is it alienation? Um, is it an unfit or, or by law uh, on a use that can't be used? And just a golf course, I don't know if you've done any research on it, um, if you can answer those two questions. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Chair Reynoso, for the opportunity to clarify. So there is no actual law that says parkland can and cannot be used for certain specific uses. There is a doctrine of law known as the public trust doctrine. And under the public trust doctrine, parkland cannot be alienated for any purpose that is inconsistent with the public use and enjoyment of that parkland. Okay, so that is the doctrine that has been applied. And the assumption that has been going on is that the parks department is referring to one specific case which is the only case that has ever really been used um, to evaluate this sort of, sort of dilemma here in New York City and that is the Spring Creek case from 2013 or 2014 and in that situation there was a 20 acre industrial facility that had a contract to process sludge 
from sewage treatment plants as well as food waste. And it was a huge nuisance. It had high fences. And again, it took 20 acres of parks land. And based on that case, which found that that, that use of those 20 acres of parks land was an alienation uh, and a violation of the public trust doctrine and therefore could not continue to be used in that way, based on that one case, that is what these non-lawyers keep saying, well, my lawyers are telling me that this is, you know, certain, certain compost uses are, are inconsistent. Sure, a 20 acre sewage sludge processing facility that is owned and run by a private for-profit company probably is inconsistent with Parkland. But a community-based organization that uses one acre or less, that provides education, that provides rehabilitation to the land, beautification, that processes parks own own waste is absolutely not inconsistent. Is I, I can't think of many more consistent uses for parks land. So that's the first piece. In terms of the golf course example, I because golf is recreational, I think it's probably like the Trump ice rink in Central Park, for example, or some of the private restaurants that operate in parks. Sure, parks does give private entities licenses and concessions to operate private commercial enterprises on parks land that it has the discretion to deem are consistent with recreation and enjoyment of parks land. Are they open to all the public? Does it jive with this claim of equity, which uh, Assistant Commissioner Biederman was throwing around despite the fact that this very hearing was being called because of the complete offense to environmental justice that their decision making is? No. Do I think private golf courses and private restaurants and private ice skating rinks no, if it's the parks department that are operating it and they're charging a nominal fee to be able to pay their staffers to operate it, that's a separate question. But in terms of the legality of it, because it is a recreation use, I actually think a judge would uphold that. But I have 100% faith and no doubts in saying that the use for composting of the way that the Lower East Side Ecology Center has done for three decades on parks lands with no legal challenges, no complaints from communities is an absolute consistent use of parkland and there is no concern under the alienation of parkland or the violation of public trust. Thank you for that clarification, Melissa. Thank, thank you very much. We'll now hear from Lisa Bloodgood, and she'll be followed by David Hurd. Starting time. Good morning, and thank you all for the opportunity to share testimony in support of community composting in New York City. My name is Lisa Bloodgood, and I'm the Director of Advocacy and Education with Newtown Creek Alliance. Uh, we're a community-based nonprofit founded in 2002 whose mission is to restore, reveal, and revitalize Newtown Creek, one of the most polluted waterways in the country and the geographic border between North Brooklyn and Western Queens. For nearly a century, it was common practice for both the city of New York and the industries that operated in and around the waterway to dump waste products into the water, land, and air, polluting our valuable natural resources. Our neighborhoods are still struggling to overcome these disastrous practices. Sadly, our communities are well known to be overwrought by environmental injustices that are left human and ecological health fighting to recover. We have long been overburdened by the legacy of, of an unregulated industrial past and the continuous marginalization of these areas brought on by the siting of much of the city's waste infrastructure. For many decades now, the communities surrounding Newtown Creek have been home to the largest number of waste transfer stations in the city, the largest wastewater treatment facility. We have innumerable brownfields, contaminated land, and is home to one of the city's three federally designated Superfund sites many other state Superfund sites. In short, the soil that our communities surrounding the creek are built upon is often considered too polluted to come into contact with. And this brings me to compost and the value and promise this resource holds for our community. Collecting food scraps, processing them locally into compost that can be used as a soil amendment or cover, using the locally generated resource as a mitigation tool to assist our neighborhoods in protecting themselves and their families against coming into contact with some of the aforementioned contamination. It is well documented that the addition of compost to contaminated soil, as well as the act of composting itself can assist in the reduction or immobilization of soil-based pollutants. Time expired. Well, I will just skip to say 
uh, that it is for these reasons that our organizations have sought to bring small scale community composting to sites that could best serve these communities. And I'll just point out that there are two sites that are on the banks of the Newtown Creek. One is a Greenpoint Marine Transfer Station on, uh, operated by DSNY. And then there's a state owned, um, sorry, state DOT managed property under the Kosciuszko Bridge in Long Island City. Both of these locations would facilitate community composting now and in the future. And our organization is here and available to work with whomever to make those things a reality. And I will share the rest of my written testimony with you all. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is David Hurd, followed by Tuck Michelle Oiwole. Starting time. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Ku and Chairman Reynoso and members of the committees, and thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of community composting today and to encourage the City Council to maintain processing capacity for the Lower East Side Ecology Center and big reuse at their East River Park in Queensboro in Queensbridge locations. My name is David Hurd and I am the Director of Zero Waste Programs at Grow NYC since 2006. Grow NYC has played a pivotal role in helping improve the environmental quality of life in New York City for 50 years. And we have been an active player in community composting since 2011. We've also been proud to have DSNY and the Parks Department as our partners throughout this time. Simply stated, community composting works. City Council fought hard in June to restore funding for community composting and we cannot thank them enough. They fought for this because their constituents rely on this vital service so they can do their part to help combat climate change. This is more important now than ever with the suspension of curbside composting. Now the system that the city council helped restore is in jeopardy with the potential loss of these two sites. The Lower East Side Ecology Center has been the pioneer in community composting for three decades. It is their work that helped institutionalize composting with the introduction of curbside organics collection. They represent the history of composting in New York City. Together with Big Reuse, Earth Matter, and the other members of the New York City Compost Project, they represent the cornerstones of community composting processing in New York City. But these facilities are not just processing centers. They also serve a vital role in educating New York City residents on the importance of composting and its compatibility in the public landscape. Grow NYC was fortunate to be the recipient of some of the restored funds and has been able to reestablish 15 of its 76 former food scrap drop-off sites. We depend on these two composting sites to deliver the material we collect from the public. I stated earlier that community composting works. Let me put that in perspective. In November of 2020, with just 18% of our sites open compared to November of 2019, we still collected 43% of the tonnage we did in November 2019, which was the second highest month of diversion in the program's nine year history. For the three months the restored sites have been open, we have already collected a quarter of a million pounds of food scraps from 31,000 participants. The loss of the processing sites for the Lower East Side Ecology Center and Big Reuse represents a potential loss of approximately 2 million pounds of capacity a year. Given the way the program is performed, we need that capacity to fulfill the goals of the City Council restoration of funds. While the loss of these sites may not result in a screeching halt to our activities, it will add cost to the program to deliver to alternative facilities and may limit our ability to keep all these sites operating. In closing, I respectfully encourage the City Council to work with the Mayor's Office, the Parks Department, and our elected officials to temporarily expend the operating permits for these two organizations at their current locations as we all work together to find permanent sites for them to continue to play their pivotal role in community compost. Posting. They are models for the rest of the nation and represent a legacy of environmental improvement for New York City. The loss of these two sites would be nothing less than tragic. Thank you for your time and allowing me to speak today. Thank you. Next up is Tuck Michelle Oyewole, followed by Eric Goldstein. Starting time. Thank you to the committee chairs and members and all who've worked in earnest toward increasing organics processing this year. My name is Dr. Tok Michelle Oyewole and I'm testifying on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. For decades, our organization has led efforts to address the disproportionate burden of New York's solid waste system on a handful of environmental justice communities. Today, we're testifying as co-organizers of the Save Our Compost Coalition in support of preserving the sites of big reuse and the Lower East Side Ecology Center. Local diversion of organic materials is important for numerous reasons, including the fact that the impacts of our solid waste system are already greatest in a few low income communities and communities of color in New York City, causing higher rates of health consequences such as asthma and various cancers. Closing these sites would worsen health disparities within the city and outside of it. 
would result in higher emissions of air pollutants that are exacerbating impacts of COVID-19 and higher greenhouse gas emissions from transportation, incineration, and landfilling. These sites are the backbone of the city's food scrap drop-off program, which was just partially restored to the amount of 2.88 million as a result of the advocacy of thousands this year. This small win will be wasted if the administration and New York City Parks, who manages 14% of our city's land, do not provide the space to compost the materials. Closing these two successful sites when city composting is nearly at capacity does not make sense while the city is professing its commitment to pursuing waste equity, zero waste, climate justice, and other environmental goals. There are other locations where parks, numerous and complexly stated needs for parking lot storage construction, et cetera, can take place if actually needed. Some of the cuts to organics diversion initiatives this year have been described as austerity measures related to COVID, but these failures were apparent before the pandemic and are a result of the administration consistently choosing not to commit funding and support for these vital programs. Today, we are asking for more than talk about the city's goals, the public and these organizations have stated loudly and clearly that these lands should be maintained for composting sites and parks evicting them because of various quote unquote needs for the space is an unacceptable diversion and abuse of decision making Unexpired. power. This just really quickly, um, there, the city administration and limited school composting, partial residential organics, it's lagged between, behind cities like Seattle and implementing universal organic collection, hasn't provided sufficient space, has supported uh, needless pollution of, uh, uh, with heavy duty truck driving and ultimately this fight we're in today is a distraction from broader waste equity goals the city needs to accomplish. So lastly, the Lower East Side Ecology Center site should be preserved and incorporated into the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, move to temporary space that they agree to in the interim. Big Reuse should be allowed to continue composting. Today we learned about possible six month license extension which is not long enough and if they are to be forced out of a site where they have support and existing infrastructure to complete their work, this extension should last at least until the city has worked with them to find another site. But the preference is that they are allowed to stay. This is the exact type of climate and environmental justice solution we should be supporting. And the idea that we would close them now is frankly ridiculous. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Eric Goldstein followed by Karina Stores. Starting time. Good afternoon. I'm Eric Goldstein, senior attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Thanks to uh, Council Member Reynoso, Van Bramer, and Rivera for their sensible and forceful advocacy on behalf of these community composting organizations. I've been fortunate enough to work on New York City environmental issues for 40 years. And I can say that this Parks Department decision with respect to these two nonprofit community based organizations is among the most illogical and unreasonable city agency actions in memory. It's inconsistent with the city council's recently enacted landmark climate legislation and the mayor's 2015 one NYC sustainability plan, which set ambitious targets for reducing the city's global warming emissions. It's inconsistent with the mayor's often stated sustainability goal of sending zero waste to landfills by 2030. And it's inconsistent with the parks department very own 2011 sustainability plan, which committed the department to quote, increase the efficiency of its leaf composting operations and quote, increase capacity for small scale composting. What the parks department is really saying is that for big reuse, the parks just has other priorities, including parking and storage. And for the Lower East Side Ecology Center, we just don't wanna to commit to welcome you back after the resiliency work is completed at East River Park. The underlying message from parks is that community composting is not compatible with park use and should not be a department priority. That conclusion is wrong. Community composting brings people into parks. Community composting teaches people ab about nature, including kids. And community composting can help the parks department more comprehensively address their own yard and food waste that they produce across the system. For months, the parks department officials have pointed to an eight-year-old lower court ruling to use as a legal defense as to why they had to evict these two organizations from their parks. But the differences between the facts of the Spring Creek case and the current situation is the difference between day and I'm night. Fired. The Spring Creek operation was more than 20 times larger than either Lower East Side Ecology Center or Big Reuse, both of which are an acre or less. And the court in the Spring Creek case found that the operation there was an unsightly industrial operation and that generated noise and odors in the surrounding community. In contrast, the size, oh, the size and scope and operation of Spring Creek created a nuisance.
and closed off the park from its community. And the facts here are precisely the opposite. That these two neighborhood sized operations, low reside ecology and big reuse are consistent with park purposes and indeed enhance public use and enjoyment of parkland. Finally, the parks department last minute offers for a six month extension or to provide uh, you know, good faith negotiations is not the answer. We don't need a temporary papering over of this crisis. What we need is for the city and the mayor to provide ironclad assurances that these two sites will remain where they belong until suitable replacement sites are found in their neighborhoods and a continuing commitment to expand community composting and city parks. People around the city who love our parks and who want the parks department to help address our climate crisis and to enhance community composting are not going to rest until a complete and permanent resolution of this crisis is achieved. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next is Karina Stores, followed by Carlos Castel Croak. Starting time. Hi, my name is Karina Stores. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm actually not here representing an organization. I'm a private citizen. I'm a, a freelance uh, science uh, journalist and writer, but uh, this is not related to a story. I'm, I, I'm a citizen and I live on the Upper West Side. Um, and that's how I got involved. I'm pretty far from the Lower East Side Ecology Center, but my building and my block have come to really appreciate the work that the center does because they operate a compost pickup site on the Upper West Side. Our building, as I wrote when I signed the petition, uh, I really got hooked on composting when we got compost curbside pickup at Department of Sanitation. DSNY started the program, which of course got suspended during the pandemic, but most of the building really liked composting and I personally and others got informed, we educated ourselves about the benefit of composting both, of course, globally and for the local environment and economically for New York City. Um, so we don't want to just go back to tossing our scraps that just seemed back going going backwards. Uh, so we've been bringing our compost to the Upper West Side pickup site every week. Um, and it's kind of created a community up here on West 108th Street. People are coming by more and more each week and learning about the Lower East Side Ecology Center and learning about the value of composting. So it's kind of nice that we are kind of this like offshoot up here. I feel like a community has is growing and hopefully it stays at this site, it gets protected and I appreciate the work everyone here has been doing. <laughs> um, thank you for that. And I hope I can visit the Ecology Center um, when the pandemic is over. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Carlos Castel Croak, uh, followed by Emily Bachman. Starting time. Good afternoon. My name is Carlos Castel Croak, and I am the associate for New York City programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City, and we are committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people our neighborhoods and our economy healthier and more resilient. I would like to thank Chairs Ku and Reynoso and Council Members Rivera and Van Bramer for holding this important hearing today and for the opportunity to testify. The, unrepresent uh, the unprecedented recession caused by the COVID-19 pandemic has forced drastic cuts to many environmental initiatives and city agencies that are essential to effectively combating climate change, including the parks and sanitation departments. We are staunch advocates for the mission of these agencies as they provide critical environmental services that keep New Yorkers and the environment healthy. The organic waste recycling program faced particularly devastating cuts in the fiscal year 2021 budget with the curbside collection suspended entirely and many drop-off sites eliminated. These cuts mean that New York City have fallen even further behind our peer cities in sustainability, sustainably handling our solid waste. Reducing waste is a crucial aspect of combating climate change that cannot wait for opportunity or convenience. I'm here today to voice NYLCV's support for the community compost sites at, that we are all um, we all care so much about at this hearing. These sites provide a critical of service to New York City residents as some of the remaining organic waste drop-off sites. We must find a permanent solution for these sites. We urge the mayor to direct agencies to work with the Lower East Side Ecology Center, Big Reuse, and other composting organizations, and climate and community advocates to find permanent sites that effectively suit the needs of these projects. 
the city must be a partner in the fight to solve climate change. I implore the council to help us protect composting in our city so that we can uphold our commitments to, to the environment and waste reduction. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is uh, Emily Bachman, followed by Claire Mifflin. Starting time. Thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of community composting in parks. My name is Emily Bachman, and I'm the compost program manager at Grow NYC, where we've been running food scrap drop off sites like the one behind me since 2011. Our work is made possible through partnerships with local processing sites like Lower East Side Ecology Center and Big Reuse, which make compost by mixing the food scraps we collect with leave and yard waste from the parks department and return the finished compost back to parks. These successful longstanding public, private and interagency partnerships benefit all parties at a time when budgets are tight and collaboration is key. While the majority of funding for composting in New York City was cut from this year's budget, the city council was able to save a small amount for community composting. At Grow NYC, we've been able to reopen 15 of the city's largest food scrap drop-off sites and on average, collections at those sites are 25% higher today than they were before COVID. In November, we diverted 149,000 pounds of food scraps from industrial landfills to community composting, the emissions equivalent of conserving 7,000 gallons of gasoline. 43% of the food scraps we collected in November were composted at the Big Reuse Queensbridge composting site alone. We can't collect food scraps unless we have a place to bring them. And the closer the drop-off site is to the processing site, the more efficient we are and the more we can do. What's at stake right now with a potential loss of two major composting sites is over half of our current processing capacity. Meanwhile, participation at our food scrap drop-off sites continues to grow by 20% in the South Bronx, 30% in Bed-Stuy, 50% in the Upper West Side, 70% in Fort Greene, and 155% in Carroll Gardens. This growth means that we need more processing capacity, not less. We are so thankful to the city council, the mayor, the parks department, and the department of sanitation. With your support, we've built the nation's largest network of food scrap drop-off sites. Um, we're, eager, we're eager to continue expanding this work, but we can't do so without our compost processing partners. And we hope that immediate long-term homes for Lower East Side Ecology Center and big reuse composting facilities can be secured. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next up is Claire Mifflin, followed by Frank Franciosi. Starting time. Hi, I'm Claire Mifflin from the Center for Zero Waste Design. I led the development of the Zero Waste Design Guidelines, which show how design of the city is crucial to achieving zero waste. This was a collaborative process and many city agencies were involved, but unfortunately not parks. Yet parks is the most important agency for making sure composting is designed into the city's urban realm. Other parks, not city owned, like Governor's Island, Battery Park City, Hudson River Park and Domino Park, know that composting food waste and yard waste makes sense and they've designed facilities into their parks. Previously, I was a project architect for Bushwick Inlet Park facility, which houses Parks North Brooklyn Maintenance Operations. So I understand space constraints and how these projects work. There, Parks vehicles are in a garage with the park sloping up over the top. Good design solves problems. Before Parks Department can say they need the big reuse site, they'd need to do some sort of conceptual plan laying out their space requirements. Where is that plan? I also know the architects of East River Park were given a design brief by parks, which either included a compost yard or it didn't. Saying that the city is committed to negotiating a return to the park doesn't answer the question, is there a compost yard in the new design or not? If it isn't, their return will waste a lot of money in retrofitting a brand new park to accommodate it. Collecting and composting of New York City's organic waste has to be designed into the urban realm. That will make it affordable and ensure the benefits contribute to a green and just recovery for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Frank Franciosi, followed by Elizabeth Acetuno. Starting time. 
Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Frank Franciosi. I'm the Executive Director of the United States Composting Council. Um, the U.S. Composting Council was established in 1990. We are a 501c6 trade organization. Um, I echo uh, the, the uh, comments and uh, recommendations of uh, Council Member Rivera and also um, Bridget Anderson of uh, DSNY. Um, I, I'm not going to go into all the benefits of compost. I think we all know that um, it's tremendously impact both from an environmental standpoint, but also from a community standpoint. And we're changing a paradigm here. We're making a paradigm shift. And it's really important that we maintain community composting and composting really at all levels from the micro haulers um, to the community composters to the large industrial compost sites. Um, that's a big impact. It's more, it's making New York City more resilient. Um, and our parks are, should be part of that. The parks of, N, of New York City are important. Let's, let's look at green infrastructure and resiliency, stormwater management, um, having that, uh, the ability for infiltration. Compost can be used on those parks to increase infiltration and take care of that stormwater event that you have. So I also wanted to take this time to let everyone know that uh, this year, Big Reuse um, has been uh, awarded the Small Compost Manufacturer Year Award from the U.S. Composting Council for their efforts. Um, and I also want to also mention that in the past, um, Jody Cologne has won the, uh, uh, was awarded the um, H. Clark Gregory Award for grassroots work um, by the U.S. Composting Council. So I hope that you can all come to an agreement that composting is important for the city. The whole world is watching. The U.S. is watching. What you do in New York City is important to us on a national level. So continue to do that and continue to increase the funding because your return on investment will be worth it in the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Elizabeth Acetuno, followed by Brees Peralta Grant. Starting time. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Elizabeth Acetuno. I'm a resident of Long Island City, Queens. And I thank you very much for the opportunity that's given to members of the community to be heard on this important matter. As a New Yorker, and in fact, as a human being, I'm acutely aware of the climate crisis we're all facing. And I'm also aware that there's very little individuals like me can do without a systemic change. Composting organic waste is one of those few things that we can all do and actually helps reducing greenhouse gas emissions. With good infrastructure, composting in New York has been scaled and can have an even bigger impact. Faced with the need to make budget cuts due to the, due to the economic crisis brought by the COVID-19 pandemic, New York City greatly reduced funding for composting operations earlier this year. All the work that has been done in educating and convincing New Yorkers that their individual actions count will soon be undone as people go back to old convenient habits. But many New Yorkers have also refused to stop composting and have relied on nonprofits and a number of smaller neighborhood community gardens, gardens have stepped up to the plate. Now, as we have heard, one of these nonprofit organizations, Big Reuse, is facing evictions from its site under the Queensboro Bridge, which to me seems like a final blow to the possibility of letting engaged citizens continue to do the right thing and, continue, and contribute to the fight against climate change. In addition, these organizations provide jobs which are sorely needed at this time. I, I sincerely hope that through this hearing, our public officials, especially the New York City Parks Commissioner, will agree that maintaining the lifeline of an activity that is helping fight climate change, create jobs, and keep our communities together is more important than finding a convenient parking spot for some trucks. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Brees Peralta Grant, followed by Brittany Kataruza. Starting time. Good afternoon. My name is Brie Peralta Grant, and I'm a biker composter at BK Rot and also a New York City High School student. I collect food scraps across the bed site area and bike by bike and compost it at one of our partner gardens as part of BK Rot. And today I'm testifying on our behalf in support of New York of our New York City compost ecosystem 
and urge parks to continue supporting composting in New York City. Lo local large scale composting sites on parks land like Big Reuse and the Lower East Side Ecology Center are critical in our New York City composting ecosystem. They support local community gardens, compost projects, and organizations like ours that get overwhelmed by our neighbors who seek composting options, yet face a shortage of city support. In 2020, our public food scrap drop-off drop rates doubled. And if it weren't for big reuse processing some of, our, some of our scraps at their Queensbridge site, we would not have been able to honor all of our drop-off hours or meet our neighbors' composting demands. Composting and parks go hand in hand. And what better way to honor parks mission, parks mission than by integrating resiliency and sustainability through housing composting sites that compost parks organic waste and create recreational opportunities for New Yorkers. From firsthand experience, I know composting can be used as a recreational activity as it creates meaningful jobs as well as healthy outdoor and land connecting opportunities for volunteers. As one of the largest land stewards in New York City, Parks must listen to the growing public interest and calls for climate action and support and expand local composting operations. We urge the Parks Department to consider all New Yorkers and the global crises that we are in and hope they will join us in finding ways to continue to support and expand the resilience of our New York City composting ecosystem, including renewing Big Reuse's license and including the Lower East Side Ecology Center's composting site in the new site plan. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Brittany Kataruza, followed by Charlie Reynoso. Starting time. Hi, my name is Brittany Kataruza, and I'm a resident of Astoria, Queens. I volunteer weekly with Astoria Pug. Um, I began the weekly tour of bringing my food scraps to a local drop off point about four years ago and haven't looked back. Ironically, that chore quickly became a high point of my week and an important staple in my ever evolving habits to lead a more sustainable life for myself, our community, and the planet as a whole. I spent three and a half of those years passively dumping my food scraps at various drop off points around the city, not truly appreciating the efforts and immense importance of facilities like Big Reuse and the Lower East Side Ecology Center. Facilities that have worked hard to pick up the slack as the city continues to roll back their composting efforts, effectively ignoring the promises leaders like you have made to send zero waste to landfill by 2030. When the pandemic hit and our regular food scrap drop off point closed, my husband and I squirreled away as many food scraps as we could in our small apartment. In August, we found out about Astoria Pug and all that they were doing to support sustainability efforts in our community. I was so impressed with just how many people were involved and how efficiently they worked to help their neighbors divert excuse me, food waste from landfill. In the five months since I began volunteering with them, they've grown from, an op from operating out of a U-Haul and before that a small red sedan to collecting over 3,000 food scraps every week, all of which are processed at Big Reuse, an incredibly efficient facility that I was lucky enough to visit at that time, the narrative parks was pushing was that they needed the space as a parking lot, but walking home, I passed multiple parks designated lots that were half full and severely underutilized. Composting locally is too important to give up over poor planning and inefficient vehicle organization. If composting locally wasn't important to New Yorkers, you wouldn't see micro haulers in small neighborhoods collecting three to 4,000 pounds of food scraps a week. If composting wasn't important, you wouldn't see families coming out with their young children, rain or shine during a pandemic, just to divert their food scraps. If composting wasn't important, you wouldn't see other big cities like San Francisco, Portland, Oregon, Boulder, Colorado, and Seattle prioritizing composting in their waste infrastructure. If composting wasn't important, parks themselves wouldn't need to utilize it to dump a massive amount of yard waste. I moved to New York City 10 years ago, expecting it to be a leader, but if we allow these composting facilities to fall by the wayside, we will quickly fall behind and not only be disappointment to the country, but more importantly, the residents of this beautiful city. Please, City Council, save our compost. Thank you. Thank you. And next up is Charlie Reynoso, followed by Jane Selden. Starting time. Good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso. Committee on Sanitation members, Chairman Ku, and Committee on Parks and Recreation members. My name is Charlie Reynoso. I'm here today on behalf of the New York Restoration Project. Thank you for your leadership in advancing New York City, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, NYRP operates 52 community gardens and stewards 80 acres of city parkland throughout the five boroughs. In this extraordinary time since COVID-19 took hold, looming emergencies like climate mitigation and bolstering community resilience have become more critical. 
For years, NYRP, like so many of our partners, has been composting gardens and offering composting sites to neighbors. We know the greatest burden of our waste system is shouldered by our lower income and black and brown communities. Gardeners and composters citywide are helping to alleviate some of the concentrated burden by collecting millions of pounds of organic waste each year. It's unfortunate that the city composting services were cut when New Yorkers are most, uh, most concerned with the strength and adaptability of our community. We applaud the city council's efforts to advocate for a future of New York City that includes composting. It's crucial that we restore the levels of service which existed pre-pandemic and work to expand and connect more New Yorkers to the programs, um, to the program, excuse me, that has capacity to address some of the, our dirtiest uh, environmental and social equity issues. While DSNY slowly reintroduces sites, we should be encouraging community-based programs, small, small ones like community gardens and our more prolific partners keeping millions of pounds of trash from our polluting waste system. We all know investment in community composting mitigates a process that produces unnecessary levels of greenhouse gas emissions and further produces a product that helps to sequester carbon and enrich our local soil. Uh, closer to home, it just makes sense to protect, the, to protect and expand local organic processing that improves the quality of life in neighborhoods that host a high concentration of transfer facilities, especially now in the wake of COVID-19. Thank you, Chairman Reynoso, Chairman Ku, and the members of City Council who have supported our community composting partners in their urgent work and fighting to maintain and expand citywide services. Thanks. Thank you. Next up is Jane Selden, followed by Rosamund Giannotsos. Starting time. Jane Selden, are you there? It, does, it appears that you may not be on right now. Okay, we'll move on to here. Rose. I'm sorry, oh. I'm, I'm here. Um, I okay. was just speaking. Can I, should I start again or? Sure. Um, yes, if Sergeant, if you could just wait for the Sergeant to give you the cue, please, and oh, then you can start. Thank, thank you. you. Starting time. My name is Jane Selden and I'm speaking on behalf of 350 NYC, a grassroots climate activist group that advocates for a radical reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and a just transition to a renewable economy. I'm here today to express 350 NYC's opposition to the Parks Department's plan to evict big reuse in the Lower East Side Ecology Center from city parkland. Organics recycling plays a vital role in combating the climate crisis. One third of the city's waste stream is composed of organic material. If composted, it has the environmental benefit of sequestering carbon. If not, most will end up in landfill where it produces methane, a greenhouse gas 30 times more potent than CO2. Since curbside recycling was suspended in May, Big Reuse and LES Ecology Center have assumed an even greater role, not only in diverting waste from landfill, but also from waste transfer stations concentrated in low-income communities of color in Southeast Queens, North Brooklyn, and the South Bronx. Shutting down these two composting sites will mean even more waste will be trucked through these communities that already suffer from high asthma rates and higher rate death rates from COVID. The Parks Commissioner's decision is especially baffling because Big Reuse and LES Ecology Center have enjoyed a mutually beneficial relationship with the Parks Department for many years. In exchange for using small parcels of land, these organizations combine leaves and yard waste from the parks with food scraps to create soil enriching compost, which is then given to the parks for free. At Tuesday's press conference, Council Member Konstantinidis rightly called community composters, quote, the unsung heroes of the City Council's sustainability and environmental justice agenda, unquote. We should be thanking them, not thwarting them. And instead of trying to shut down their facilities, the mayor and the Parks Department should be advocating for replicating their success by expanding small scale community composting sites to other parkland. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Next is Rosamond uh, Giannetsos, fo and uh, followed by uh, Elizabeth Roisman. Starting time. Hello. Um, are you hearing me now? I'm unmuted, right? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, I, I'm not going to repeat all of the very compelling arguments that have been presented here, except to endorse the idea that uh, the composting is, is a totally legitimate uh, uh, activity to occur in uh, our New York City parkland. Um, and the, uh, it is frustrating to see all the uh, obfuscation and the appeals to uh, legalities that stand in the way of uh, people uh, who need to use the parkland and should use the parkland. Um, of course, I very much support Big Reuse and the Lower East Side Ecology Center and their efforts. I am a resident of Sunnyside, Queens. We have a, a group called the Woodside Sunnyside Composters who have been uh, attempting to use a vacant parkland uh, at 50th Street and um, 39th Avenue here in Queens. Uh, this land just had, they just had a scoping hearing and they've told us that it will be basically two years before any um, you know, shovels go down and any actual work is done in this park. Meanwhile, it stands um, uh, fenced off um, and it is the composters could very much use this land um, and um, uh, they want to and attempted to create a pantry garden there. We have um, food pantries with lines going around the block. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, if we could open our streets to restaurants and to uh, the open street program, which of course I very much in support of, um, why can't we I'm have fire. open parks? Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, next up is Elizabeth Roisman, followed by Brendan Hannon. Starting time. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Roisman, and I am secretary of the Brooklyn Solid Waste Advisory Board. This comment is presented on behalf of the Brooklyn and Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Boards and the Queen Solid Waste Advisory Board Organizing Committee. We are grateful for the opportunity to present testimony for this oversight hearing. The swabs commend the city for the partial restoration of funding for community composting in FY21 that occurred in the months since the in initial budget cuts in the spring. This has enabled the reopening of food waste drop-off sites and the continuation of the New York City compost project, providing a vital avenue for New York residents to divert their organic waste from landfill and incineration. A failure to renew the leases of big reuse and lower East Side Ecology Center would represent a major setback in this process. Collectively, the two organizations divert approximately 2.5 million pounds of organic waste from landfill and incineration annually. Given the absence of curbside collection, community composting is the only avenue for citizens to recycle their food and yard scraps. Hence, it plays an even more important role than it did prior to COVID-19. The pandemic has been notable for hitting disadvantaged communities the hardest. Reducing the local processing capacity for organic waste will exacerbate existing environmental injustices. More organic waste will be sent to landfill and incineration via truck corridors and to facilities that predominantly impact low income neighborhoods and communities of color. In addition to the fact that composting has been shown to generate significantly more jobs than disposal of waste to the general waste stream, the two organizations strong track record of providing volunteering and training opportunities, suspension of their operations will be a significant step I'm backward. Fire. These two organizations share the parks department vision of creating and sustaining thriving parks. They process leaves from city parks, give finished compost back, and educate New Yorkers about ecology and how they can play a role in helping the environment. The swabs therefore urge the parks department to work with Big Reuse, Lower East Side Ecology Center, and Department of Sanitation to find a solution that will enable them to continue their fine work serving New York City. Thank you for your consideration. 
Thank you. Next up is Brendan Hannon, followed by Gil. Starting time. Thank you to the council for providing this avenue for this testimony. Um, I'm a member of Smiling Hogshead Ranch, a community garden in Eastern Queens, um, excuse me, Western Queens. Today, our members are processing hundreds of pounds of food scraps a week. Uh, what we saw is that when the city shut down the organics collection during the COVID crisis, the demand for our services of community composting skyrocketed. Where before we were pr uh, processing approximately 200 pounds a week, we are now seeing that volume every two to three days. Limiting organics collection and the resources to take care of those organics does not stop the freight train that is this city's organics pr production. It simply redirects it and the methane emissions and the tip fees that this city has charged remain. We've talked about that we're in a climate emergency and that diverting food scraps from the landfills avoids um, methane. And we know well the benefits that are provided from compost. The city should be striving towards 100% collection of all its organics. And there are adequate facilities through the city using the DEP infrastructure, but that is a long-term plan. And in the short term, we need these small scale ability to process organics locally. We do not want trucks moving back and forth um, throughout our neighborhoods or moving organics and the ability to have these sites that exist is critical to the city's composting efforts. One lesson that I would close with is that we are a community garden. And what we know is that you do not throw out good equipment. You do not get rid of the infrastructure you have that you use. Since COVID started, we accepted an aerated static pile from the Queens Botanical Garden that we've been using to increase our own capacity. Getting rid of these facilities that the city relies on is mismanagement and we ask that the city not displace existing sites but expand new composting facilities. Time expired. Thank you. Next up is Gil, followed by Danica Lamb. Starting time. Hi, my name is Gil Lopez. I live, work, and play in Long Island City, Queens, which is the traditional territory of the Mount Bay peoples. I call upon the spirit of these peoples and the land defenders, including my own an ancestors. Be with me now. It is not okay that our community has spent our holiday season stressed out and fighting for our basic right to do the responsible thing with our organics. I've been a community composter in Western Queens for over a decade now, and I've watched my friends build the Western Queens Compost Initiative, which turned into Big, Big Compost, which was then incorporated into the Department of Sanitation's New York City Compost Project hosted by Big Reuse. We thought that the city taking the stu stewardship of our project would ensure its inclusion in our community for the long term. But here we are defending the presence in its place. Master composters know the work that we do is important, yet over the years, the city has used our work as a political football to greenwash its various policies and goals. While not walking your talk is shameful unto itself, in this case, it's a crime against humanity. After witnessing so many actions that work directly against your words, I'm now convinced that a systematic dismantling of our compost infrastructure is taking place. Creating more space inside of one of the largest parks in Long Island City is not a mandate and should not be a priority right now. What are you thinking? What is happening here is called eco-gentrification. This is when improved green spaces like the recent multi-million dollar renovation of the Queensbridge Fieldhouse or the proposed BQX is shoved down the throats of the community in order to redevelop and bring others into the neighborhood. Intentionally withholding information, then releasing a press release after advocates have already prepared testimony is a common tactic of developers. And it's shameful that Parks is now deploying these techniques against its own constituents. What's that all about? This tactic is clearly meant to confuse, demoralize, and gaslight us. Parks' attempt to weaponize open space against community composting is a clear attempt to divide us. But my community will not be divided. We will stand against your insidious plan. We'll make, we may even expose whatever nefarious ulterior motive you, have, you may have. In the I'm meantime. excited. So in closing, I just want to say the answer is simple. Mandate compost now. Mandate compost for parks. Do not displace community organizations from neighborhoods we are rooted in. If you can afford to move us, you can afford to start a new composting site. I'm happy to help teach those folks in that new community how to reach those goals. If parks cannot steward their net land responsibly, then, then they need to be 
have their lands taken away from them. These lands need to be put in the hands of an agency will, that will do the good work that will ensure the future of our generations. I see you, Silver. I see you, Biederman. And I see you, Docket. Mayor de Blasio, this will not go unanswered. Me and my guerrilla team of gardeners in Western Queens will not let this go unchecked. You have my rage. Thank you. Next, we have Danica Lamb, followed by Clay Birch. Starting time. Thanks, Gil. I think we're all very thankful for your rage. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danica Lamb, and I am a founding member of Hockey Compost Collective on Roosevelt Island. I am also a former compost coordinator with Grow NYC, for whom I managed the Roosevelt Island food scrap drop-off site until all sites were shut down at the end of March. In the devastation of the coronavirus pandemic and the city's earlier decision to slash the budget for city-funded compost programs, Hockey Compost Collective was born of a group of humble Roosevelt Island residents determined to bring back what we knew to be an essential service to our community. It is only thanks to our partnership with Big Reuse that we've been able since September to resume food scrap collection on Roosevelt Island at scale, though now our operations are entirely different. Our site is wholly volunteer run and recognizing the unifying potential of composting is now paired with community building programming. At our renewed food scrap drop off site, we have not only diverted more than 10,000 pounds of food scraps in just the past few months, but also registered new voters leading up to this year's pivotal presidential election and hosted an Indigenous Peoples Day community reflection to assess our responsibility to the people from whom this land was stolen. That is the power of community composting. And this is exactly the kind of program a city government should build up rather than tear down. What kind of government is this? To whom are you accountable if you cannot support programs by and for your constituents? The city now has a choice. It can partner with the community and make good on its commitments to send zero waste to landfill by 2030 and reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050, or it can follow in, the, follow in the footsteps of the current administration, repealing environmental protection laws and disgracefully forcing a pipeline through native land. I think I need not specify upon which side of the line evicting community comp composting sites would fall. Thank you. Sorry, uh, next is Clay Birch followed by Gregory Todd. Starting time. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share my perspective. My name is Clay Birch. I live in East Williamsburg and I'm the creator and organizer of Brooklyn Scrap Shuttle. I'm here speaking on behalf of my organization as well as the other North Brooklyn community compost organizations that were created in response to this year's budget cuts. Brooklyn Scrap Shuttle started as one guy with his bicycle, a mini cargo trailer and a 27 gallon bin collecting approximately 200 pounds of food scraps per week from my neighbors in Cooper Park. It has since grown into an organization with dozens of volunteers collecting 700 plus pounds of organic waste every week. <clears throat> to date, we have diverted over 10,000 pounds of waste from landfills. The North Brooklyn Compost Project, an initiative of North Brooklyn Mutual Aid launched on June 6th and primarily operates out of McGulrick Park. On average, North Brooklyn Compost collects approximately 2,800 pounds of food scraps and yard waste per week. The initiative has diverted 55,000 pounds of organic waste from landfills since June and relies exclusively on the work of the Big Reuse. After closing in late, late March due to city budget cuts, the Grow NYC food scrap collection at the McCarran Park Green Market reopened on October 3rd. On average, more than 400 neighbors drop off 3,000 pounds of food scraps per week. Since then, the site has diverted more than 27,000 pounds of organic waste from landfills. All of these scraps are process, processed locally by the Big Reuse at the Queensbridge location. To date, these organizations have diverted over 100,000 pounds of waste. The compost work taking place in North Brooklyn is being done in large part by volunteers. The infrastructure that has been created by passionate residents over the last six to seven months is a testament to the power and potential of conscious community collaboration when unbridled by the limits of bureaucracy. As we move into an uncertain future, we must remain focused on creating systems that benefit all New York City residents, not just government agencies. Through conscious collaboration without competition, we can and we will create a and sustainable city. 
on behalf of all of the community compost organizations in North Brooklyn and the taxpayers of New York City, I urge you to reconsider your, ev your eviction of the, low, of the Big Reuse and the Lower East Side Ecology Center. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Gregory Todd, followed by Alice Duggan. Starting time. Gregory Todd, are you present? Okay, uh, we'll move on to Alice Duggan, uh, followed by Mary Ann Bennett. Starting time. Hello, I'm trying to unmute. Did someone unmute me? Oh, go, go ahead, Gregory. Okay. Uh, Thank Sorry. you. Thank you. I was trying to speak while you were unmuting me. Okay. Um, thought, uh, just hold on for one second. Um, this uh, the sergeant will restart the timer, and when he gives you the cue, you can begin. All right. Alice, will, you can go after him. Thank you. Starting time. So, good afternoon. My name is Greg Todd. I'm a gardener at the Amani Green Thumb Garden in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Thank you, Chair Reynoso and Chair Ku, for hosting this important hearing. In June 2019, the city. Council passed Re resolution 864 stating the city council declares a climate emergency and calls for an immediate emergency mobilization to restore a safe climate. Simpler and more clear words have rarely been written, but what has the city done to back them up? By canceling curbside pickup of organics and now allowing parks to unilaterally not renew licenses for composting sites under the Queensboro Bridge and on the East River, the current administration has made a mockery of this noble resolution by the city council. Despite the Paris Climate Accord and urgent alarms by climate scientists around the world about the catastrophic effects of climate on the climate, global greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise. As a city surrounded by bodies of water, Sea level rise caused by climate change will have devastating effects on our population. Yet despite all these bold declarations and clear science, the current administration continues on with business as usual. Nothing shows this pattern more clearly than the recent decision by Parks Department and its commissioner, Mitchell Silver, to evict composting operation from parks sites. City counts, citywide composting cuts 4 billion pounds of CO2 per year, the equivalent of taking 385,000 cars off the road. Yet despite this fact, Parks chooses to reduce composting opportunities, not to expand them. The CORE, the Community Organics Recycling Empowerment Act, CORE, introduced by the City Council last year by Powers and Reynoso, demands that composting sites be created in every community board in the city by making compost I'm accessible. Excited. It's beyond time for Mayor de Blasio to get involved in the struggle and overrule the imprudent and detrimental environmental stewardship parks department at its administered by its current commissioner, Mitchell Silver. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Alice Duggan followed by Marianne Bennett. Starting time. Good afternoon, Chairs Antonio Reynoso and Peter Ku, Council members, members of the committees uh, on Parks and Recreation and Sanitation. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Alice Dugan. I am a Brooklyn resident and I am a manager for a film production company based in uh, Brooklyn, also called Public Record. Uh, as part of our, com our company's efforts to reduce our carbon footprint, we began composting our organic waste about three years ago by dropping it off at Big Reuse, which had its drop-off site a few blocks from our office. Um, we are a small business with only four to five people in the office, so we did not generate enough organic waste to warrant paying our carding company to take the waste for us. Rather, myself or an intern would drop it off every other week. We felt that not only uh, did this divert our waste um, 
uh, we felt that not only did this waste diversion lower our carbon footprint, it also connected us to the neighborhood and, and the city as a whole because the compost it produced would be distributed to community gardens, parks, and residents in the summer. Big Reuse is no longer accepting um, food scraps in their Gowanus facility, so it hasn't been easy for our company to divert our organic waste. Currently, operational drop-off sites in our area are not amenable to our office hours. We have a typical Monday to Friday, nine to five schedule, and while the salt lot in Gowanus does accept drop-offs for a few midday hours on Mondays, those hours are just about the highest peak operation times for our business. So we, are, we were hopeful that Big Reuse would accept drop-offs again so our company could continue practicing comp composting with ease. Uh, but now that Big Reuse is in jeopardy of losing their current location in Queens, we are concerned about the prospect of no longer being able to be part of the city's sustainability goals. We would prefer not to throw our organic waste in with inorganic waste because that reverts us back to contributing to greenhouse gases. I'm Furthermore, sorry. Politicians in the city have time and again stressed the importance of becoming more sustainable and to move towards being carbon neutral. So to lose the important facility would be disappointing, especially for the sake of operational uses that add to carbon in our environment. I thank you for your time today and we hope that the committees on parks and recreation and sanitation work to retain the composting sites of Big Reuse and Lower East Side Ecology Center, or at least guarantee their new, like, new location so that small businesses like ours can, can still continue to compost. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Marianne Bennett, followed by Melisan Argeson. Starting time. Hi everyone, my name is Marianne and I am a resident in Flatbush, Brooklyn. I volunteer with Nurture BK Compost, which organizes a weekly food scrap drop-off in my neighborhood. Composting is important to me because climate change is real and affects all of our communities. I made a commitment to live a more sustainable life and reducing waste is an important part of that. A lot can be done to reduce waste, but composting has been the easiest sustainable lifestyle change I've made in New York. Taking action against climate change means not only reducing waste, but also reversing our effect. Compost offers an opportunity to give back to the environment. Big Reuse, which is where my food scraps go to, gives their compost to community gardens and parks across the city. Every week at Nurture BK, we've seen our community grow as more people make the decision to start composting or restart after they realize they have a place where their scraps can go again. This gives me hope that we are expanding a community and building future generations committed to reducing and reversing climate change. Taking away community composting sites, like Big Reuse, is a step backwards. It prevents other organizations like ours from being able to start up or intake more scraps. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today about an organization and process that is important to my community. Thank you. Next is Melisan. Arkeson, followed by Julie Wan. Starting time. Hi, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to speak today to defend community composting. My name is Melison Argeson. I currently live in East Harlem, and I've been composting with Grow NYC for two years now. Since many compost sites, including the one that's closest to my apartment, have shut down due to the pandemic, composting has not been convenient for me whatsoever. I wake up every Friday morning at 7 a.m. to walk across Central Park to the west side to drop off my compost pile at the 97th Street Green Market so that I can be back at my apartment where I have to be online for work at 9 a.m. I now have to take a whole trip just to compost. But one of the ongoing benefits of composting is that it motivated me to adopt a vegetarian diet. Since Grow NYC primarily accepts vegetable and food scraps, no meat or fish, I decided to drastically cut down on meat so that I can divert as much food waste as possible. My current diet is the healthiest it's ever been. Now that's only one example of how composting has improved my personal life, but I want to drive home ways that composting helps our communities and our planet. When we compost, our food scraps just turn right back into nutrient-rich soil that can help grow more healthy food. Otherwise, if we toss our food right into the trash, it'll be sent straight to the landfill where it will turn into methane gas, which harms the planet. It's pretty clear that composting is a more sustainable and useful option. 
My second point is that NYC's composting programs help preserve city green jobs that focus on collection, outreach, and education. During the COVID-19 pandemic, when so many people have lost their jobs, com composting jobs matter more than ever. And lastly, the United Nations set out 17 sustainable development goals that we must achieve by 2030 to ensure a healthy, just, and livable planet. And one of the goals is to take climate action, and we can help do this by achieving zero waste within the next decade. But because of the pandemic, I fear that we are falling behind on reaching this goal. And so we must continue our composting efforts in New York City by saving LES Ecology Center and Big Reuse because they are critical to keeping not only the city, but the whole world on track to achieving zero waste. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Julie Wan, followed by Kim Howell. Starting time. Hi, everybody. My name is Julie Wan, and I currently live in Sunnyside, New York. I also used to live in Long Island City, and I also serve on the community board, too, as well as on the board of 696 Build Queensbridge. As you've heard from so many other uh, public hearing testifiers, as well as council members, this is a huge part of our communities, especially here in Western Queens. A lot of our community composting sites are the lifeblood, literally feeding us. The food insecurity that we've seen in the last few months due to COVID-19 has been alleviated by allowing us to not only compost our own food waste, but also using that fresh compost to grow more fresh produce for a sustainable way for us to make sure that we're meeting food insecurity needs for our mutual aid as well. So I really hope that you will reconsider. And when we talk about making sure that we have equity in parks, access for Queensbridge. I currently work at 696 Build Queensbridge and we take walks all the time. There is plenty of storage space. And there's plenty of parking under the bridge, not only to mention right along the bike path, there is always illegal parking on the park path as well, where I see that people who work for city agencies like waste management and parks are always parking on the parts of greenery that should be used for the community. So I think it's very hypocritical and I really hope that you will reconsider not just extending Queens, um, Queensbridge's reuse site, but also making sure that you, you make this permanent because composting is a sustainable, environmentally just way of living as well as you're stealing away from the actual community that is, that is starting their community gardens using that very compost in Queensbridge. These people in Ravenswood and Queensbridge are active composters and they really care about this community as well. And I really hope that you will reconsider because it also comes to access accessibility the way, same way that people are testifying even just now how she has to travel for composting. It's supposed to be accessible. And if you're not gonna come pick it up at the way that the city used to, then you need to allow us to have community access. Thank you, especially for low-income communities. Thank you. Next up is Kim Howell, followed by Leslie Gersing. Starting time. Hi, my name is Kim Howell, and I'm a resident of Lefferts Gardens in Brooklyn. Um, and I'm calling because I, as many people on this call, am very, very dedicated to getting this city that I love in sustainable shape for hopefully many centuries to come. And composting is essential to that. I started several years ago and deeply feel that it's one of the best ways that I can take, you know, one of those actions that I can take to keep my myself and my city sustainable. And Big Reese's work in that is essential. Um, I really, I am kind of devastated to see that the Parks Department and sustainability are now pitted against each other because these are two of the things that I love the most about my city. Um, and they don't have to be against each other. I appreciate that running the parks is an extremely complicated endeavor that takes a lot of maintenance. It takes vehicles, it takes lots of work, but we cannot have this happen at the cost of our long-term sustainability. That's just not a trade-off that we should ever be making at this point. Um, one of the speakers pointed out that we've declared a climate emergency. That means it's top priority. So we need to be creative and find other trade-offs that don't come at the cost of methane gases from an extreme, a program that is not just hypothetical, but existing, functioning. It has been shown to work. This is working. We cannot dismantle it um, even more than we already have. 
Um, and then I also wanted to point out, a couple people have alluded to this, uh, but I am an avid gardener, and I had the soil next to my building tested for lead, and it was off the charts, as is most of New York, due to decades and decades of leaded gas cars and lead paint. One of the best ways to remediate this and to stop this from going into the bloodstreams of children and other residents of New York City is to put compost into the soil, to grow plants I'm in the sorry. soil, to bind up those terrible compounds. And so we can't afford to cut off a program that's running, that's working, that protects our people and our environment. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Leslie Gersing, followed by Dana Lobel. Starting time. Hi, my name is Leslie Gersing. I've lived on the Upper West Side for more than 30 years, and I oppose the Parks Department's plan to evict big reuse and the Lower East Side Ecology Center composting operations. For many years, anyone in my building who wanted to recycle had to walk eight to 10 blocks to our weekend green markets. Starting in April 2018, a fellow tenant and I urged our 80 unit building to sign up for DSNY's curbside collection. After nearly a year of pressure, my neighbors eagerly be became uh, converts and diverted food scraps from the waste stream just by dropping it off in our carts. Under the pandemic budget cuts, DSNY shut down that program. The city shuttered most of the drop-off sites. Some reopened in the fall and despite obstacles, Grow NYC just testified that Upper West Side donations are up 50% from pre-COVID levels. Some of my waste goes to the Lower East Side Ecology Center. The Parks Department says that site is needed to build the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, ironically, to battle the flood risk we've created by refusing to tackle man-made global warming. Big Reuse says it processes nearly 1.4 million pounds of food scraps and yard waste a year. With apologies to Joni Mitchell, the Parks Department is planning to pave a half acre site dedicated to saving our paradise to put up a parking lot. The fiscal year, this fiscal year, New York City expects to pay more than $420 million to export its garbage to landfills and incinerators as far away as South Carolina. Most of it ends up in low income neighborhoods and communities of color where toxic ash, leachate and greenhouse gas sicken people who have little power to protect themselves. A middle school teacher told me the climate crisis is her students number one concern. What lesson are they learning? That there's nothing we can do to stop the destruction of their future? That other people's health is an unavoidable casualty of selfish garbage policies? We need to emulate smart governments elsewhere to composting of organics and sustain the organizations that do it well here now. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Dana Lobel, followed by Dr. Sarah Pearl Engendorf. Starting time. Is Dana Lobel here? Okay, uh, she apparently has logged off. Uh, we'll move on to Dr. Sarah Pearl Eggendorf, uh, followed by Leah Rutherford. Starting time. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Chairman Reynoso, Chairman Ku, all of the dedicated, incredible community composters for all of the vital work you do. My name is Dr. Sarah Pearl Egendorf, and I'm here speaking on behalf of a number of research collaborators from Cornell University, where I'm currently employed as a postdoctoral researcher, and the City University of New York, where I received a PhD studying urban soil. We are all extremely concerned with regard to the budget cuts that have already cut so much of this incredible community composting program, as well as this potential remover, removal without secured relocation of the New York City Compost Project hosted by the Lower East Side Ecology Center and Big Reuse. We can assure you that community composting is absolutely essential as everyone here has said today for a just and sustainable future. We must invest even more in these green jobs that reduce waste, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and turn this so-called waste into a vital resource for building new soils. 
Supporting New York City's community composting efforts is one of the most important and effective ways to promote local environmental justice, food justice, and climate change mitigation. And the Parks Department, you have an opportunity to change your position and provide permanent support for these sites. The majority of my research has focused on limiting exposure to lead in soil. People of color and people from low-income communities are most frequently exposed to environmental toxicants, including lead in soil, making this an urgent and widespread environmental justice issue. I've worked closely with researchers from Cornell University and the State Department of Health, who've conducted research on New York City soils for over 10 years and on their widely used What Gardeners Can Do 10 Best Practices for Healthy Gardening, the number one recommendation for limiting exposure to contaminants is to use clean soil and compost. So all of the community composting efforts that the Parks Department claims they are in, service, in support of, they need to I'm support. Um, I encourage you to read my testimony. There's many different citations and discussion of various programs. And I wanna say, to echo uh, all of the sentiments today that the research communities I'm speaking on behalf of highly support these efforts. It's absolutely essential. We need to guarantee space and more and more funding for these efforts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next up is Leah Rutherford, followed by Edward Streeter. Starting time. Leah Rutherford, are you available? Okay, she may have logged off. We will uh, move on or check back. Uh, next up is Edward Streeter, followed by Miniri Palajevic. Hello. Oh. Please hold on, Alea Rutherford. Please, please, uh, you're up next. Uh, please start when the sergeant gives you the cue to begin. Thank you. Thank you. Starting time. My name is Leah Rutherford, and I'm a Queens resident. I want to thank park staff for their service in taking care of our parks. I spent many hours in Forest Park this summer, and can attest to parks being lifelines in this difficult year. I was formerly the project manager for the New York City Compost Project, hosted by Big Reuse. I spent a lot of my time there along with the team I led bringing the new Queensbridge site into being. It was very challenging and it was also a significant investment of time and money for a third of an acre site and it's also something I'm very proud of. Our team gave countless tours of the site to New Yorkers, people from across the United States, along with visitors from Japan, Nigeria, and Brazil. I also presented on this project at two national conferences. People are blown away by this partnership and project. The question people ask is how did this happen? How did two sprawling city agencies with very different mandates come together to work with small idealistic nonprofits to make mid-scale community composting a reality? The longer I worked at Bigger Use, the more I appreciated what a feat this was and how unique it is to New York City. It's a testament to the people who worked at Bigger Use and the Lower East Side Ecology Center who built relationships and asked what was possible of their city agencies, as well as the staff and leaders at Parks and Sanitation who were willing to say yes to community composting. Community composting has a ripple effect through our city. Doing this one thing has ramifications for soil and plant health, waste management, climate change, environmental justice, education, and more. We need to be replicating these projects, not moving or evicting them, just like Gil said previously. I'm asking parks in the city to please recommit to these community composting sites in their current locations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, next up is Mineri Palajevic. Starting time. Okay, she appears to be logged off. Um, I did skip over Mr. Edward Streeter, so please begin, sir. Starting time. 
thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, uh, I would uh, was going to say uh, some words in support of absolutely everything that Christine Dats Romero and Justin Green have said before. So uh, instead of doing that, I'm going to focus uh, my testimony on one thing that Christine said, and that was the point that she made that volunteer programs for members of the community that uh, the Lower East Side Ecology Center and, and Big Reuse provide is a vital form of recreation and are therefore a part and parcel of the City Parks Department's mission. Uh, and I, I, I think uh, in terms of recreation, I think that aspect of the mission is uh, quite a bit more vital than uh, the, the recreation provided by golf, uh, for instance. Uh, um, and um, uh, although um, I love golf as much as the next person, but uh, the point is there, the, our, uh, the Parks Department is uh, claiming uh, something about the, the lack of uh, the recreational aspect of uh, the volunteer aspect of composting uh, programs as being some sort of an excuse. And I just would like to point out that what Christine said uh, needs to be uh, uh, taken close, paid close attention to. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I got a little bit more time, so I just want to mention uh, that I uh, am a longtime resident of the Lower East Side, and on a more personal basis, my daughter uh, went to school at the Shengwen uh, School and took advantage of the community outreach program. Uh, for uh, elementary school kids that uh, the Lower East Side Ecology Center provided. So thank you very much. I'm inspired. Thank you. Uh, next up is- All right, good. Sandy, that was pretty good, wasn't it? Sandy Renz, followed by Barbara Hertel. Burning times. Oh, yeah, no. Hi. <clears throat> My name is Sandy Renz, I'm all turn on my lead. And I'm a scared, frustrated, but yet hopeful citizen. Composting is critical for a sustainable planet. When I'm asked what I do, I frequently say I compost. I'm lucky to have a backyard where I can compost, but I can't compost all of my food and garden waste. So when the city suspended curbside pickup, I was heartbroken. Most people don't understand that food and garden waste does not turn into compost when it's put in landfills or incinerators. Food and garden waste is a huge polluter when put in landfills or incinerators, but it is a valuable resource when it is properly composted. Community composting sites are perfect places to educate the public about this environmental issue. I eventually found a place where I could drop off food and garden waste that was somewhat nearby. It was hard to carry all my waste to this site, but this heroic weekly collection was very helpful. Since some of the food and garden waste drop-off sites have reopened, I have been volunteering at Big Reuse. I have seen the quality of the work that Big Reuse does is outstanding. The interest and dedication of the community is incredible. People walk and ride bikes in the pouring rain, as well as bring cars full of blocks worth of contributions to drop off at these sites once a week. This support is, evi is evidence that the need for the services of Big Reuse and the Lower East Side Ecology Center are vital. New York City should be serious about the their zero waste goal. All existing compost should continue, however that needs to be arranged with no breaks in service and it, all the programs need to be restored and expanded. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Barbara Hertel, followed by Wendy Brewer. Brawler. Starting time. Hi, um, my name is Barbara Hertel. I'm a um, longtime composter. I live in North Brooklyn and I'm a member of a lot of different committees about, you know, the environment anyways, but I believe that composting is a great asset to parks. I believe it provides 
um, jobs for young people. It teaches people where your food goes, what happens to your food. And I think in terms of the parks, I think it's a perfect place to have composting. And I think it's a, just awful that they want to get rid of the, um, the Queensboro and the, 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 long, the Lower East Side um, composting sites. It's just, it's just stupid and dumb. And I just can't believe that Parks is saying that it's not really a Parks activity when it is. And I think they're just kind of bowing a little bit to developers and to the um, people who don't compost that come to the Parks. Um, I realized that I go to, um, to, I have, when they didn't have composting, I went to Hogshead, which was a, just a lifeblood for me. I went, I dropped off my composting there. I'm part of their increase of composting stuff. And then when the parks department started up again, I was really grateful that I could bring that, even though I had to throw away my, um, my meat and other things like that. Um, so the other part of this is that when you have the, um, the composting in the parks, it brings people to the parks. And I feel like um, I enjoyed going to different parks to drop off my stuff. I'm, and I would go to McGorlick Park, which uses the Queensboro site to drop off their composting. And now they're afraid that they won't be able to do composting in McGorlick Park, which is another park in, in uh, North Brooklyn. It's farther away from McCarran Park where you can go on Saturdays. And now what are, we, what are the people gonna do there? They, they collect a lot of food. And you know, with the city not doing anything, I think that the parks department should allow these places to stay until they can find a new place. So that's my testimony. Thank you. Thank you for having this hearing. Thank you. Next up is Wendy Brower, followed by Mary Ellen Sullivan. Starting time. I'm Wendy Brower, longtime Lower East Side resident and sustainability professional. Last December, I was shocked when it was suddenly revealed that the mayor and parks commissioner were planning to destroy the Lower East Side Compost Center, uh, Center's compost yard and replace it with a passive yard lawn. Not having composting when you're fighting climate change is like not wearing a mask in a pandemic. I could not understand who would approve this. Knowing Park's mission is to plan resilient and sustainable parks, I asked Commissioner Silver about eco-gentrification and who it benefits, and it alienates me that he did not deign to show up today. I met with our Congresswoman and Carolyn Maloney urged me to file a FOIL for answers. I filed on January 3rd, 2020 with DDC. Despite requests on my behalf from the Congresswoman and Assemblymember Epstein's office, this foil is still being withheld. Who would destroy their topsoil making machine when dozens of acres of parkland will need it very soon? Unfortunately, Esker prioritizes the 84 daily ferry riders over the 500 a day who drop off their food scraps. Note that these two spots are just a few feet apart. The new park will have three parking lots and a massively expanded tennis center, yet no room for composting. Composting needs to be visible in a public place. Moreover, this is a form of recreation, as it was just said, especially if you pitch in to help make the compost or use it on gardens, parks, or in street trees. Lower East Side Ecology Center, as well as big reuse and other community compost problems, have engaged thousands of residents citywide in these healthy stewardship activities. Eviction is no way to say thank you. With NYC's ever-growing garbage crisis, please cancel this illogical climate folly. Otherwise, my building is looking into getting a pig to keep in the basement, just like in the olden days, to manage our ever-growing pile of food scraps and organic waste. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Mary Ellen Sullivan, followed by Valerie Zandoli. Starting time. Hi, my name is Mary Ellen Sullivan, and I'm a concerned citizen from Brooklyn and also um, a client of Big Reuse and Lower East Side Ecology. Um, with the onset of the pandemic, I was very disturbed to find out about the cancellation of the composting program, as well as the cancellation of funding from the city um, for Lower East Side Ecology's e-waste site in the Gowanus. Uh, I am upset that uh, that 
the environment is not a priority. I think that people, and I've been very inspired by the city council members that have spoken by Lower East Side Ecology and Big Reuse, and I would urge um, the parks to not evict these people. I would ask them to restate red hook composting and to also rebut the comment that I can go and recycle my food scraps at my farmer's market. My borough hall um, farmer's market no longer accepts uh, food scraps. So that is not an option that I have. I would have to go to organizations such as the one that have spoken or work with Ground Cycle, which is an extremely innovative um, startup that um, takes the food scraps and then sells them to farmers in upstate New York. I would urge the city to explore innovative approaches such as these so we can combat um, the terrible waste problem that we have in the city where we um, have 1.2 million tons of waste per year at the cost of about $80 per ton. And I would urge the city to become a leader in this much like San Francisco, Seattle, Austin, that are taking climate seriously and are um, rapidly exploring how to put forward the circular economy within their city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next is Va uh, Valerie Zandoli, followed by Aleph Tadesi. Tadesi. Starting time. Hi. Hi. Sorry about that. Hi. Uh, oh, no. Good afternoon. I'm Valerie Zandoli of Tottenville, Staten Island, resident with remarkably little access to any composting, despite being highly motivated to do it. I came to testify today on the behalf of Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC, and equally on my own behalf as a multi-generational lifetime resident of New York City. As the Parks Department presented to me today, the Parks Department's argument does not justify evicting community composting. Composting, explicitly community composting and its adjunct public education are fundamental, undeniable positive works in helping the city's people to act meaningfully against climate change and to the benefit of all of us. Unmitigated disruption of community composting and of its constructive impact is foolhardy, misguided and maximally unwise, especially as a majority of motivated citizens now suffer greater obstacles to and fewer sites at which to drop compostable material of any type. I plead with all the individuals who involve themselves in these incipient evictions to do their best to reconsider their actions and decisions. I speak for many of my community members. We stand forcibly and in full solidarity with everyone, including NRDC, who opposes any interruption to the work of the two exemplary composters and educators, Big Reuse and Lesek, and any other such organization now or later. If the Parks Department can only cite Spring Creek as precedent, then I find their argument even more woefully weak, as almost none of the facts are comparable. The two different reasons that Parks Department cites for interrupting- I'm fired. Thanks. Thank you. Next is Aleph, Aleph Tadisi. I'm sorry, Anna von Mullen and, pardon me, um, Aleph Tadisi, please. Starting time. Hi, uh, my name is Aleph Tadessa. I have been a resident of Long Island City for the past three and a half years. Once I found a composting site in my community, I started composting my food very regularly, almost every other week now. What usually would fill up half my garbage, I now put in my freezer to store, then fill up a container, and then walk about 25 minutes with my heavy bag to the nearest composting bin. The process is difficult, but I'm willing to do my part as a, 
uh, I'm going to do my part as a community member because I understand how important composting is for our environment, our health, and our economy. I'm asking that the parks department to do their part as well. So I'm here testifying that we need to strengthen and expand composting sites and services, not push them out of our community, which would make composting impractical to incorporate, at least for, I know for me, into my life. Um, and with recent cuts to curbside compost collection and community composting drop-off services in the city's budget, composting has already become an even more limited resource in the LIC and Astoria community. So I urge you to keep the existing composting services run by Big Resus and Lower East Side Ecology Center. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Anna von Mullen, uh, followed by Daniel Wendell. Starting time. Hi, I'm Anna Von Neulen and I am a, the sustainability coordinator and a teacher at Compass Charter School in Fort Greene in Brooklyn. And I'm here to represent the kids all over the city who know that composting is important. They understand the value of composting and they are devastated to think that grown-ups in positions of power don't understand this. Um, I'm going to read some of their comments to you. One of my first graders this week said, I wonder why the parks department and the mayor think it's more important to park trucks than to compost. A group of first graders talked about the earth. If we compost, the earth is healthy, said one of them. Compost is important because it helps the earth. And if there's garbage everywhere, we can't live on the earth, said another. They understand there's no such place as a way. And when we truck things to landfills, it's an act of environmental racism as this a way is actually someone else's backyard and usually people of color. One of them said, this is not right, Mayor. Throwing things in the garbage is not okay with me. It's very important to compost and we should make compost. You can throw them away, but if you put the food scraps and leaves in the compost, it can make soil and it can help people, said another. When we have food left on the ground in a landfill, it isn't helpful to the earth. You cannot do that. That's not helpful and you're not taking care of our city. They understand the amount of methane gases released by landfills and how composting does the opposite. Compost means less trash, said Clara. If we don't compost, the bad air will come. It's bad for humans and bad for the earth. We want the earth to not to become dirty. We want it to be clean. They see the financial flaws. Since compost is very good for the environment and the trucks are probably getting 10 miles to the gallon, that's really bad for the environment. Why turn something good into something bad? Now, this is my words. I think as we know, children know what's right and they know that there are grownups who get to make the decisions and decisions can be hard, but we know that this isn't actually a hard decision. Um, big reuse in the Lower East Side Ecology Center, the sanitation department and the parks and work for them, know what they're doing. They take pride in their work and they are role models to my students. Just let them do their jobs. All you get for making this decision is rewards in the form of less pollution, less trucking, continuing to reach towards the goals that you actually set and a whole bunch of kids who will forever be grateful. So leave the compost, it's better for the planet. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Daniel Wendell followed by Emily Kitchler. Starting time. Good afternoon, Council. I'd like to begin by summoning the spirit and legacy of David Buckle who is a lawyer and fierce advocate for civil rights. He was also a master composter, a prolific compost educator, and a relentless advocate for community composting. I was a student of his. David took his own life in the spring of 2018 using resources that are destroying this earth to destroy himself. His last action was an environmental protest against indifference and apathy, against benign neglect and alienation. So I summon the spirit of David Buckle in an act of remembrance. Mm -hmm. Compost exists at a complex crossroads in the effort to achieve environmental and social justice amidst the climate crisis. Reduce, reuse, recycle is what we've been taught, yet composting embodies all three simultaneously. By composting, we substantially reduce the, what lands in landfills. Uh, we reuse organic matter that has been scrapped or discarded. We recycle organic matter into nutrient dense, into a nutrient dense substance that is particularly beneficial to soils, plants, and people. Compost is not waste, it is a resource. Historically, it has been a wasted resource. Organics are not currently handled by any single agency, rather a hodgepodge where no agency or organization is left holding the proverbial bag. My testimony today urges the council, if the mayor will not take a leadership role, 
to mandate compost now citywide. Composting, whether residential collection or community efforts, should never be on the chopping block again. Never more should composting be towed away because the Parks Department needs, ironically, more parking. Council, what mandating compost now looks like. A revision to the city's charter, making compost a critical resource and requiring the creation of the Department of Compost or Composting Council. Two, legislation requiring all city agencies, commercial entities, organizations, businesses, residences to participate in a citywide compost program. Three, further legislation permitting organic micro haulers equal access to the carting industry and for tipping at decentralized processing centers. And four, the adoption and expansion of the Core Act of 2020 and the Commercial Waste Zones Plan of 2018. Currently, private carting is a 20th century backwater, public and, and environmental menace. Thank you, Council, and everyone working to save our compost. Rest in power, David Buckle. Mandate compost now. Thank you. Next is Emily Kitchler, followed by Dana Affleck. Starting time. Hi, um, thank you chair people and council members for this opportunity to speak today. My name is Emily. During the pandemic, I was fortunate to be able to compost with an NYRP community garden and have experienced the numerous ways that NYC has composted over the years living in different boroughs. Big reuse processes food scraps from numerous micro haulers, which could shut down without the help of big reuse. My biggest concern is that by disrupting the stability of such major, such major sites as Big Reuse, Lower East Side Ecology Center, and Red Hook, the organics collection program will not be able to abide by commercial waste zoning laws, which were put in place to prevent waste from being transferred unequitably and unsustainably. This waste transfer has caused years of pollution in the South Bronx, and it's caused regular 10 to 20 hour work days for haulers that could otherwise go a shorter distance and emit less transfer waste within their own boroughs. Uh, without sites like Big Reuse, Lower East Side Ecology Center and Red Hook, NYC will run into the same problems with composting given that composting is a priority at all and bigger composting sites are, are being focused on in the long term. Um, I also appreciate the Parks Department's acknowledgement of their composting uh, support through sites like Green Thumb. And I also want to acknowledge that micro operations like this are entirely voluntary. And while all of community composting currently relies on volunteers, the sites that really create and process significant compost have staff and support green jobs. And I'd like to see the financial support of composting education and operations at this scale in order to stick with the words of commitment um, that were made for this level of community composting. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Dana Affleck, followed by Billy Freeland. Starting time. Hi everybody, my name is Dana Affleck and I speak today as a Brooklyn resident. Before the pandemic hit, I was composting at a local New York City, a grown New York City drop-off location every Saturday. This was my weekend ritual because composting is very important to me for many reasons. Composting food waste reduces the amount of general waste I am personally responsible for sending to landfills and incinerators. This is not just about cutting greenhouse gas emissions generated by food waste as it rots and decomposes in landfills. This is an environmental justice issue too. Food waste is often sent to incinerators located primarily in low-income communities and communities of color and burned with trash and fossil fuels. This releases particulates and toxic chemicals into local communities and can cause serious health issues and worsen air pollution in the area, something that's particularly uh, dangerous during the COVID pandemic. But since the pandemic shut down the city and changed our day-to-day -day lives, I haven't been able to compost in my local Brooklyn community. New York City Council budget cuts have meant curbside compost collection programs and community drop-off sites have been drastically reduced. Local community gardens close to me don't have the resources to run a composting service to the general public during a pandemic either. Composting programs like those run by Lower East Side Ecology Center and Big Reuse are critical for New York City residents like me who still want to sustainably dispose of food waste. 
Allow allowing the parks department to evict them and thereby shutter their composting services would not only take away some of the last composting programs left in the city, but would result in an increase in New York City's greenhouse gas emissions and cause local communities to suffer the health impacts of air pollution associated with increasing incineration of our city's trash. Please ensure the Lower East Side Ecology Center and Big Reuse can continue to operate on parks land and provide critical composting services to the city. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Billy Fre Freeland, followed by Kristen Mizek. Starting time. Thank you, Chair Ku, Chair Reynoso, members of the committees. My name is Billy Freeland. I'm a candidate for city council in District 5. I'm a member of Community Board 8 Manhattan, and I'm speaking in my personal capacity today. I want to first uh, thank Syra uh, Panu and Justin Greenberg, two high schoolers in my community, who helped me uh, prepare for my testimony today. Uh, Roosevelt Island uh, is in my district, is in my community, and it's home to the Hockey uh, Compost Collective. You've already heard from Danica Lamb about that. At Hockey, residents drop off food scraps, uh, which are then picked up by Big Reuse and processed at their Queensbridge uh, composting site. If Big Reuse is evicted, finding a new partner will pose significant challenges in light of July's budget cuts to composting. Uh, evicting B Big Reuse would be devastating for the entire composting community on Roosevelt Island and threatens to uh, force Hockey to halt its food uh, scrap collection. We must also consider, and this is really important for the Parks Department and the committee to weigh, that Roosevelt Island is relatively isolated from Manhattan and from Queens. It has a large population of elderly and disabled people for whom traveling over a bridge or across the East River to a far off composting site is simply not feasible. And hauling the scraps a greater distance may offset and even completely reverse and outweigh the emissions saved from composting. So that's the local impacts. I wanna briefly talk about the climate and food security issues that I think we're all pretty familiar with. You don't need me to tell you we're in a climate emergency. But did you know that municipal solid waste is the third largest source of methane emissions in the United States? 15% of those emissions in 2018 alone uh, factored in to global warming, second biggest source of global warming. Uh, organic waste uh, make up 25 to 50% of what people throw away. In New York City, we produce more than 14 million tons of trash every year, and our recycling rate is only 18%. Consider Seattle, which has a 57% recycling rate. We must do better. And then finally, composting impacts food insecurity. Nearly 1.1 million New Yorkers are food insecure, and research shows a positive correlation between composting and food security. Let's do the right thing. This is a local issue, a climate issue, a food security issue. Our planet is at stake. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, next is Kristen Mizek, followed by Laura Piccolo. Starting time. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank everyone that worked so hard to put this hearing together. I know that it has run long, but I think that that really goes to show how important this issue is to us. Um, I know that it's very long, but I hope that our representatives from parks and sanitation are still listening, uh, although their cameras are off. Um, it does send a bit of a message that they are not, so I hope that they are still listening. Um, I think that our struggle is really embodied by uh, actions such as Commissioner Biederman uh, not paying attention while our high school students were testifying about how this issue impacts their future. Um, we are here because we're not just worried about us right now, but we're worried about future generations. And we had high school students who took time out of their school day to be here to testify. And um, I think paying attention to them is the least that we can do. Um, I am a volunteer with a community-based composting organization called Astoria Pub. Uh, and we work with the Big Reuse to process the food scraps and organic waste that we collect. Um, crippling the, uh, the, the budget cuts that crippled our ability to compost in Queens uh, led to the formation of Astoria Pug and uh, removing big reuse from the space that they have right now under the Queensboro Bridge would only further serve to negatively impact organizations like Astoria Pug that are working really hard to keep composting alive in our community. Um, we have seen uh, the mayor and other city officials use composting and uh, language such as mandatory composting by 2030 uh, to uh, be politically advantageous to them and their campaigns, but we actually don't really see that uh, in action. So 
We are asking for the city to show the same commitment back to these local organizations that are doing the work uh, and the same amount of commitment that they are showing to their communities by doing it. Um, so I hope that uh, this um, has bye. really shown uh, how important this is to our community and how much we need that commitment from the city. Uh, and I hope that the big reuse can get extended for more than six months on that space because uh, I do live in Long Island City and I know that there is more space for those vehicles to go that uh, Parks does not need to evict the big reuse and that uh, hopefully they can get a longer contract. Thank you. Next is Laura Piccolo followed by Alexa Jacob. Starting time. Uh, good afternoon, city council members, uh, the Parks Department and your community members. And um, as Kristen said before me, I really do hope the Parks Department uh, are still with us on this uh, meeting, uh, even though they uh, did kind of fall off a little bit earlier. Uh, my name is Laura Piccolo and I'm a resident of Astoria. I'm also a composter. And I'm testifying today regarding the potential eviction of uh, big reuse under the Queensboro Bridge. So community composting is an essential program and it's being threatened by the Parks Department. I would truly appreciate it if we could work with the Parks Department to find an alternative space for the proposed parking lot, not for the big reuse location. Why create extra work and incur extra costs when there is no need? I can guarantee you, you'd be hard pressed to find passionate individuals rallying in support of a parking lot. Yet so many people in Queens and other boroughs are rallying here today to save this composting space. We not only see the good it produces, but we've experienced it as well as residents of Northwest Queens. During the pandemic, when composting was virtually paused throughout the entire city, local community members took it upon themselves to keep it going. I volunteered with a local Astoria group, Astoria Pug, to ensure that the community's needs continue to be met and that our city's commitment to zero waste remained a possibility. Several compost sites were created throughout Astoria to collect food scraps, and Big Reuse has supported these efforts by taking the food scraps we have collected. Meeting people in the community, speaking with our neighbors, and working in the field, the magnitude of local composting's importance and having a composting site was truly realized. Local, easy access composting sites that create jobs for the community are of infinite more value than parking lots or storage facilities. According to the Department of Sanitation's website, there is no way when we throw garbage into a can or litter basket. A majority of our waste can be composted or recycled. New Yorkers can fight climate change, support green jobs, and reduce our environmental footprint by sending zero I'm waste. Fire. We have a mere 10 years from now in order to have this happen. The decisions that we make today can have decade-long repercussions on achieving this goal. Let us align our actions and have all New York City agencies work towards a common goal of a more sustainable city. Together, we can make that happen. I encourage you all to please have the same vision. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Next up is Alexa Jacob, followed by Laura Hecklinger. Hecklinger. Starting time. Great. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexa Jacob and I use community compost programs, particularly the one run by Astoria Pug where I live. I've composted for nearly three years now and even when I lived in my tiny East Village apartment, I always saved my food scraps drop off at the community garden down the way. I multiplied my impact by convincing about five people to com compost along with me and having lived in both of the neighborhoods where B Build It Green reuses Queensbridge site and the Lower East Side Ecology Center site have been, let me say they are both excellent neighbors and we love having them in the community. To end their lease to create parking lots would be a waste of an investment in both money and in community ties. I compost because this is a small and easy thing that I can do to reduce my carbon footprint. And getting to occasionally hang out with Rocky the Pug is definitely a plus, but the most important thing to contribute is to reducing New York City's waste. As a member of the Sunrise Movement's New York City hub, we are pushing for a Green New Deal that will stop climate change and adapt our society to our new climate change reality by creating green union jobs. I am concerned about this city's response to climate change. Although I am not here today representing Sunrise, I know that our members value the investment of the City Council in sustainability programs, and we will be watching the City Council's actions on this in the coming months. New York City has a zero waste goal for 2030, and we're already not on track, but cutting the composting program makes it even more difficult to reach that goal. And as you've probably heard from the Lower East Side Ecology Center and Build 
uh, the IG reuse. Composting creates local green jobs, gives back to the community by providing compost to our community gardens and reduces our collective carbon footprint. Community-led operations are filling the gap the city left when it defunded the composting program in July, but unpaid advocates across the five boroughs can't do it alone. We need the city to step up in the long term and fund composting citywide. I see a bright future for composting and sustainability in New York City when we invest in these kinds of programs. And we need sites like Build Big Reuse and the L uh, LES Ecology Center to remain so that we have the infrastructure we need. In short, if you evict these sites, we are going to have to pay more for them down the line, both in money and in climate disasters. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Laura Hetlinger followed by Maria Friedman. Starting time. Hi, my name is Laura Hecklinger. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The processing centers at Big Reuse and the Lower East Side Ecology Center are essential for an equitable and sustainable waste management system in New York City. Without these centers, more food scraps will end up in landfills, which directly contribute to pollution and climate warming emissions. This is in direct conflict with the city's stated climate and zero waste goals. The New York City composting program has already been decimated in the wake of COVID-19. In the absence of a city-run program, local groups stepped up to fill the gap where the city left off. I'm a resident of Greenpoint, Brooklyn. When the curbside collection program was shut down, I was concerned about what would happen to the program long-term and began looking for other options for recycling my food scraps. Fortunately, I soon learned about a new drop-off site that was being organized by one of my neighbors called the North Brooklyn Compost Project. This drop-off is volunteer-run and donation-based. Scraps collected here get processed by Big Reuse in Queens. I've had the opportunity to volunteer with the North Brooklyn Compost Project and have seen firsthand how important community composting is to residents of my neighborhood. The support for community composting has, over, has been overwhelming. The drop-off was essentially doubling in size each week to accommodate all the scraps that were being brought in. The drop-off site has also been a great tool to educate members of the community about the benefits of composting and its impact on the local environment. I initially began composting my food scraps for environmental reasons. However, through this experience, I've learned how composting also supports green jobs, saves taxpayer resources, and helps build community. The Parks Department must recognize how important these sites are and how much the local community benefits from the work these organizations do. The decision to evict these sites is short-sighted and in direct conflict with the will and well-being of the communities they serve. I urge you to protect, preserve, and also expand these community composting sites. As a resident of North Brooklyn, um, I'm also counting on council members in North Brooklyn, Stephen Levin and Antonio Reynoso to fight this with all of their might. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Maria Friedman, followed by Carolina Diaz-Chen. Starting time. Hello, my name is Maria Friedman and I am a resident of Brooklyn. Um, and I wanna start off by thanking both chairs, the dedicated council members, the department officials, moderators, and community organizers who have spoken today. Um, and I want to start with a statistic, which is that according to the EPA, uh, in their most recent municipal solid waste report, 20% of municipal solid waste generated each year in the United States is food waste. So composting then has the power to become the magical reversal of one-fifth of our waste stream. It's our direct community-based solution to churn trash into the treasure of a fertile future. Um, as with many of the others in attendance today, I used to rely on Brooklyn's residential composting pickup bins to drop off my compost every week. Um, I've been composting for years. Uh, I started in college uh, because I was going to our college farm and helping to churn every Sunday morning, which is actually how I made some of my closest friendships. Uh, so I continued to do that when I came back home to the city. Um, and my parents also started composting first at the drop-off on 23rd Street near where they live and then with the residential program. So now with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, both the residential pickup has been cut and also the uh, pickup site at the Grand Army Plaza Green Market that I go to on Saturdays. So I've been having to either bike my compost into Manhattan if I want to drop it off at night after work um, or rely on one of the weekend drop-off hours. Um, thankfully, there are community-based organizations like BK Rot, in addition to Big Reuse and the Lower East Side Ecology Center that have thought of solutions to this. BK Rot now has a residential pickup service. They wouldn't be able to make this possible uh, without 
big reuse supporting their operations and allowing them to use uh, their sites to process compost. I want to share a statistic I'm from BK Rot, which is that 30% of the city's compost is being processed by both big reuse and the Lower East Side Ecology Center. It's imperative that we save both of these organizations and the land that they use because that's 30% of what could be 20% of our city's waste stream. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next is Carolina Diaz-Chan followed by Renee Pepus. Starting time. Hi, my name is Carolina Diaz-Chan and I'm a resident of Canarsie, Brooklyn. Um, at the beginning of 2020, I finally made the decision to start composting at home. I had previously applied to get a compost bin from the compost collection program, but found that we were outside the pickup zone in Canarsie. The closest drop-off location was at the Wyckoff House Museum, which is only a 15 minute drive from my house. And that's where we started dropping off our compost. When the pandemic hit, the farm operations at the museum were forced to close their composting operations for a couple months. And worried where we would take our compost, my husband and I talked to our landlord and they were gracious enough to allow us to buy our own compost bin to do composting in front of our building. I then reached out to LES Ecology Center for resources and they very graciously provided us with wood chips and wood shavings for the bottom of our compost bin that we needed to place over concrete. LES Ecology Center gave us these materials for free and they were so helpful with sharing additional compost tips. As you know, LES Ecology Center and Big Reuse are currently facing eviction by the New York Parks Department. We need these organizations desperately in New York City because they are some of the last composting programs whose budget was cut by 90% this year. Additionally, as an environmental justice issue, most New Yorkers are not as lucky as I am to have a landlord willing to allow me to compost on their property. And without public, public compost drop-offs near their home, most New Yorkers will not be able to compost at all. I am furious, to say the least, that New York City has allowed their compost collection program to fall apart when at its peak it was the largest compost program in the country. New York City enjoys to promote their zero waste to landfills by 2030 program, and yet if we do not continue to save what is left of our composting program, that will absolutely never happen. Our planet does not have time for us to waste. What we do in the next 10 years will have a huge impact on saving our environment. Recycling is certainly not our only solution to zero waste and composting is just as important, if not more so. We need to make comp public composting easy and accessible for all New Yorkers. I'm asking the city council today to save the LES Ecology Center and big reuse of sites from being evicted by the New York Parks Department. These programs should be our proudest and we should make fully funding composting in New York City as one of our highest priorities. To the New York Parks Department, please step up because community composting does belong inside New York City Parks. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Renee Papoos followed by Debbie Lee. Starting time. Hello. My name is Renee Pappas and I'm an Astoria resident in District 22. I am testifying as a community composter, a volunteer for the microhauler Astoria Pug and a concerned citizen of the city of New York. My first roommates in Astoria were, were responsible for sorting and preparing our building's trash for collection. Watching my roommates spend hours wading through the building's refuse was frustrating and troubling. The task was unpleasant to say the least, and it highlighted to me all the hours and resources we spend just to send our discarded items to rot outside of the city. Luckily, I learned about big reuse and their drop-off sites in Astoria. The sites were convenient and accessible. Moreover, big reuse and the New York City Compost Project taught me how and why composting is a necessary alternative to sending scraps to landfills. I learned that composting promotes a circular economy, creates green jobs, safeguards frontline communities, and mitigates climate change. How could I not drop off scraps every week when the stakes are so high and big reuse makes it so easy for an average citizen like me to participate? For these reasons and many others, I was devastated when Mayor de Blasio slashed the community composting budget earlier this year. I'm further devastated to learn that the Commissioner of the Parks Department does not support big reuse's efforts, especially knowing that the Parks Department benefits from big reuse's finished compost. Please let us work together to find a way to allow big reuse to continue its operations on its Queen Bridge site. Our current and future neighbors depend on it. 
Thank you. Thank you. And Council Member Levin has a question. Starting time. <laughs> I just wanted to thank, um, <clears throat> I want to thank this panel and all the panels. Um, I've been listening um, intermittently through other meetings um, uh, this afternoon. And I just want to indicate to you all my um, unconditional support um, for these efforts to save big reuse. I, I represent North Brooklyn. So while the site is um, uh, um, about a mile from my district, um, uh, I do have a number of sites that bring uh, composting um, to the, the Queensboro Bridge site um, uh, from Goldwork Park, from uh, McCarran Park, uh, Transmitter Park now as well. So um, uh, I am uh, eager to work with you all and my colleagues to implore uh, the Parks Department to reconsider this, obviously, um, terribly misguided um, uh, policy. And um, it's just, you know, this is um, kind of a perfect example of um, um, uh, government, um, you know, acting in a, in a way that is um, you know, clearly not in the interest of, of the well-being of the, of the city and, and um, uh, just, uh, its unwillingness to, to, to change ways is uh, very frustrating. And so I, I just wanna let you all know how, how committed I am to uh, this cause as well. And, and I'll be with you 100% of the way, thanks. Thank you, council member. Next up is Debbie Lee, followed by Anna Sachs, followed by Greg Jenko, who will be our last registered speaker. Well, good afternoon. Starting time. Good afternoon, almost good evening to everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Chairs Reynoso and Ku, uh, for making this possible. Council Member Levin for being here. Matt Drury, I hope you're still here from Parks and that you're listening, that somebody from Parks is represented. I'm grateful uh, that our youth from Cafeteria Cultures programs had the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman uh, Carlina Reynoso, also for not only supporting community composting, but composting education. I am the executive director and founder of Cafeteria Culture. We're an environmental education organization with a home base on the Lower East Side. And we work creatively with youth to achieve equitable zero waste, climate smart, school communities and solutions and a plastic free biosphere. And I'm obviously here to advocate for permanent status, long-term leases for Lower East Side Ecology Center and big reuse for the benefit of all communities and for future generations. This kind of interagency inertia is just unacceptable. And now I'm gonna take off my hat as executive director and I'm gonna speak as a taxpayer, a mother and a cancer patient, a stage four cancer patient who regularly uses the East Side River. And the, the joy of my day is to run to the Lower East Side Ecology Center's uh, location in East River Park because when I see that in the East River Park, for me, that is one of the most beautiful examples of what a climate smart city should look like. It's all there in one piece. And I look at the other members of the community using that space, enjoying that space, the true definition of what a public space and a park space should be. There's no time for interagency inertia right now. This is the time for demonstrating how city agencies, organizations, and communities can work to net together to enact the most innovative and collaborative climate smart solutions. At Cafeteria Culture, we like to use that word in I'm our inspired. climate smart. I just want to say this is really climate stupid. And I have plenty of energy to continue educating youth on composting, I'm exhausted by advocating for this kind of climate smart, low cost community composting uh, solutions. And Mayor de Blasio, where are you? Parks Commissioner, where are you? Hear what the community is saying. Thank you everybody for your time today. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Holden does have a question. Starting time.
Councilmember Holden, you may. Okay, I'm on mute now. Thank you. Um, I, this is so inspiring of all the advocates coming out, and you have my total support. I just want to echo Councilmember Levin's comments that we will fight to um, reinstate the curbside um, pickup, certainly on composting. Um, my neighborhood, my community board, as a member of the community board, we were the, one of the first community boards to have uh, in Queens to have uh, the composting curbside. It worked. It was difficult, you know, convincing some of the residents and it took some time. We were able to do that. And I felt, you know, when we eliminated it um, during this pandemic, we're slipping backwards and it, it's we're going to have to start all over again. But I, I believe we have a lot of volunteers. I think we could do a program, a test program by community board uh, or council district to reinstate it with the help of volunteers. Um, and I just want to echo some of the advocates that spoke and said, why didn't the Parks Department uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Biederman stay on and listen? And the, the least they can do, he's done that at, at a number of hearings we've had, and it's a shame. Shame on them, shame on parks. Um, let's reinstate the composting sites in, in uh, throughout the city. Let's create more. So I wanna thank everyone who, who uh, stayed on this and, um, and listened and, and um, fought and, and is fighting for the greater good. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, council member. Next up, we have Anna Sachs followed by Greg Jenko, who will be our last panelist. Hi everyone, thank Party you for speaking. Okay, I'm speaking on behalf of myself right now. I'm part of the Save Our Compost Coalition and I wanna address my testimony to the mayor. I am very frustrated at your inaction. We have been working on this issue since August. We've had countless meetings, not, not just not me, but NRDC, New York Lawyers for Public Interest, Earth Matter, Grow NYC, Big Reuse, Lower East Side Ecology Center. This has consumed a huge amount of our time. What we wanted to be working on was thinking about composting for the future, gearing up for the next budget fight, and making sure that our community compost sites are equally distributed in New York City so that every single council district has a site. We were sidetracked by this, and it is ex extremely frustrating to have this non-issue that your administration has made into an issue and has consumed a huge amount of our time. And so I want to say shame on you, Mayor, I, where have you been and why has it gotten to this point where they're about to be evicted and it's taken a huge rallying of community to even get this hearing. I think that your administrator just doesn't want composting in parks and he needs to admit, realize he was wrong and say, you know what, I rethought this and composting is important to parks. It makes sense. It belongs in parks. I also want to say that Evicting Lower East Side Ecology Center and big reuse with no intermittent plan means less composting and are on a already stretched budget. It means fewer new drop off sites, fewer hours that they're going to be open, less composting, more waste to landfills and incinerators. That is not the future that we want. That's not the future that we fought for. Um, and I just, I'm just so disappointed also that. Um, the Commissioner of Parks wasn't here today because we're really addressing his problem with composting in parks that he needs to fix. Um, composting is essential and it makes a lot of sense to be in parks and Mr. Mayor, please stop wasting our time. Oh, last point, sorry. But we cannot kick this down the line I'm six sorry. months from now. We're going to be dealing with another, bu another budget crisis and we don't have the capacity, we don't have the bandwidth to be dealing with both the budget crisis and advocating for that and having to, feel, to deal with not having permanent solutions for big reuse in the Reside Ecology Center. So it cannot be kicked down the line. We need to solve this now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Next uh, is Greg Jenko. Starting time. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, thank you to the council members, big reuse activists who are fighting for a just and equitable community. Uh, and no thank you to the Parks Department for wasting our time today, forcing us to fight a common sense policy. My name is Greg Jenko. I live in Vinegar Hill, but I'm a lifelong New Yorker. Uh, with that said, you know, I consider myself an American first and a New Yorker second. Evicting big reuse composting processing facilities without a replacement in favor of a parking lot and other 
operational measures as truck repairs and maintenance is a policy failure of epic proportions. And hearing Sam earlier call it not a true closed loop like Central Park is rich and embarrassing to the intellect of this passionate community who's trying to save our city. Hearing Sam describe big reuse composting as degrading of city lands is a joke and a piece of theater when you suggest it should be replaced by maintenance of trucks? Let's get it straight. Nearly all of our city's waste gets shipped to landfills in low income communities across New York, Kentucky, New Jersey, Connecticut, Chester, Pennsylvania. This is our opportunity to do what's right and be environmental stewards of our waste here in the city and not send it to another poor American community. But if empathy is not your thing, maybe fiscal policy is. Last year, we spent $420 million to export our waste. And in the year 2020, organics recycling like composting is common sense, environmental and fiscal policy that should be prioritized tenfold over the space for maintenance of vehicles for the city. We are on the brink of the greatest human-induced disaster, climate change. City policy to evict composting processing facilities without a replacement will accelerate climate change and increase the city's expenses year over year. It's just irresponsible. I beg you, if you don't care about climate change, make the right decision, make the fiscally conservative decision, save our climate, save this city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if we, uh, Mr. Jenka was our last panelist. If we have inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify and has yet to have been called to speak, please use the Zoom hand raise function and you'll be called on in the order that you have, that your hand has been raised. Seeing none, I will invite the chairs to make any closing remarks and adjourn the hearing. I believe Chair Ku has a quick statement and Chair Reynoso. I guess, yeah, I guess I'll speak first. I just wanna say thank you to everyone. Uh, I don't wanna ruin Greg's closing statement because it really summed everything up. Um, and the frustration, the logical behavior by the Parks Department just across the board. Um, I hope this served. Uh, I know uh, other parks reps were still on the call. I hope they take this back. It's uh, almost seven hours worth of testimony, uh, all unanimously supporting the maintenance of the maintaining of uh, both uh, Big Reuse and the Lori Psychology Center in their current spaces. Um, thank you all for your advocacy. This is only the beginning, um, and this is a waste of time. This should be very easy for the city to do. And, and the fact that we had to spend seven hours doing this truly speaks to how horrific and, and just out of touch the Parks Department is with what we need to be doing to save our city um, in the year 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Ku. Are you there to close out the hearing? We're not hearing you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I forgot to unbud, unmute myself. Yeah. So I do this over. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who took the time to testify today, especially our students, and to my co chair, Council Member Minoso, for hosting this joint hearing with me today. This hearing shed light on the challenges. Com, uh, composting faces in our city today. And we hope that the city has listened and will be able to find a solution that works for all parties. Thank you again and have a good weekend. Uh, especially uh, our sergeants of arms and our staff for hosting this long, long meeting today. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, I just want to echo, thank you, uh, Chair Ku, for doing this uh, alongside the Department of Sanitation. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you, so I want to thank you. And I agree. Thank you to all the staff, um, all the all the people that waited to speak, uh, the sergeant in arms, um, everyone, just for for the great work and the great turnout. Thank you. Yeah.
So you I want me to, to close off? Yeah, close out, please, yeah. <laughs> Chair. Okay, this meeting is adjourned.